Hello everybody. Now this is something slightly different. I have collected up all of my old Gaunt's Ghost videos and combined them into one epic exploration of Gaunt's Ghost and the Sabbat World Crusade in general, the history of this campaign. Now I've done this because this was the first thing I did on YouTube. This was my first initial plan of what I was going to do and it stayed like that until about halfway through and then I got distracted and started doing other stuff. Uh, but I did finish it recently or at least I finished it as far as the, the current law goes, we're still waiting for some new books from Dan Abnett. But yeah, this was my initial idea for the channel to do this kind of thing. And I think I've kind of roughly kept to it. But uh, you'll see some of the first videos are not up to the quality that I would expect from myself now. But hopefully you enjoy them. And if you're a long time viewer, you'll see the evolution of my uh, content style. I don't know, whatever that means, you know, that sort of thing. And yeah, this was uh, one of my great sort of passions in the 40k lore, the Gaunt's Ghosts and everything. I thought it was a really good area to explore and I hopefully I've brought that to, to life somehow. And uh, if you've never seen these before, and that's one of the reasons as well, the last episode I put out of it did very well. I don't think a lot of people even knew I did Gaunt's Ghosts because there was such a break in between me doing the episodes because I was getting distracted. Hopefully combining them all together, some of you guys who might have missed it, because it's kind of disappeared at the, like the first video, one of them is the first video I ever did, you know what I mean? So, you know, so I'm just trying to make it available to everybody in a much easier to view format. And people like the long videos, you know, people tell me this, they like to put them on when they're gaming, painting, whatever, driving. And uh, yeah, thanks to everybody who's been watching the channel. I hope you do enjoy this. And if it's probably something a lot of you have missed. And like I say, apologies for the quality at the start. It starts to improve gradually as we go along. I don't mean so much the content itself, the quality, the presentation that uh, I gave it. I've, I've improved somewhat since then. So yeah, again, no more rambling. I just wanted to put that out there in case you're watching this going, oh, this is weird. This is kind of how I started out on the old YouTube. So yeah, thanks again. And I'll be doing more of this sort of stuff in the future, uh, writing sort of more of an big epic sort of series and things i've been working on stuff so anyway thanks very much for watching and uh if you hear your continued support and some of you guys have been supporting since these first couple of episodes and you guys you know who you are and uh i really appreciate it. it really means a lot and yeah it's great and yeah if you'd like to support the channel links in the description to different options anyway enjoy thank you and may the emperor protect episode one the Saint and the Sabbat Worlds. The Sabbat Worlds is located on the rimward portion of the Segmentum Pacificus in the galactic west of the Imperium. It consists of over 100 inhabited systems which are divided into several territories based on historical circumstance, physical proximity, administrative expedience and the position of reliable warp routes. The prominent territories are the newfound trailing, the Khan Group, the Cabal System and the Carcaradon Cluster and the Irenes group. The Sabbat worlds had long held human populations, with evidence to suggest migration could have begun in the Great Diaspora, or perhaps earlier in the Dark Age of Technology, and then later waves of colonisation into the region. In addition to human-occupied worlds, several Xenos breeds either originated in the region, or had themselves migrated there. It was not until M33 that Imperial authorities began any meaningful colonisation of the region, and these were small-scale efforts. As so often occurs in lawless frontier territories, some merchantile or rogue trader activity did occur, but these were also on a small scale. Vast swathes of these territories were held by forces of the arch enemy and other chaos worshipping forces. Aside from a scattered collection of feral and imperial worlds, the region was considered lawless and well outside the Civitas Imperialis up to M35 when Saint Sabbat began her crusade. Saint Sabbat's origins are something of a mystery despite the large amount of writing she left behind. She is known to have been a small but beautiful woman with green eyes and short black hair. Her teachings present a faith in the God Emperor that was simple and graceful in its wisdom. She achieved things that few but the greatest heroes of the Imperium have, and it is for these that she is known throughout the galaxy. But she was a peasant girl from a frontier agri-world. She is an enigma to historians and an inspiration to those who seek to emulate her achievements for the glory of the God Emperor. How she became the head of one of the most successful crusades since the Emperor walked amongst men is a mystery that may never be solved, but that she did is beyond doubt. Her cadre of officers and advisers included Chiodrus, Fultanus and the philosopher Demarches, 
The Crusade consisted of colonial regiments raised from loyal worlds, space marines from the brazen skulls and white scars chapters, as well as an army of zealous pilgrims willing to fight and die for the saint as the living embodiment of the God Emperor's will. The archives mention that Saint Sabbat commanded a contingent of sisters militant, which has troubled many imperial historians, as this crusade predates the reign of Gorg van der and the rise of the Adaptus Sororitas by 1,000 years. Some have suggested that Saint Sabbat travelled from San Loire in Ultima Segmentum to lead the crusade with a force of what would have been then daughters of the emperor. Although there is some evidence from relics and texts linking Saint Sabbat to the order of a martyred lady, and perhaps showing the origins of that order, this line of reasoning is considered by many to be at best seditious and at worst outright heresy. Speculation on this issue should be left to the ecclesiarchy and those historians and theologians sanctioned by the holy ordos. The saint's crusade lasted for 105 years when the saint was martyred on Hakalan, suffering the nine holy wounds. Her remains were escorted back to Hagia by brothers from the White Scars chapter and interned in the holy shrine hold. At the time of her martyrdom, the Sabbat worlds were already considered a functioning imperial territory. Those forces of the arch enemy that survived passed into the outer dark, and it is believed colonised or joined a population that already existed there. Hagia, the saint's homeworld, would become a popular place for pilgrimage, although it would continue to primarily be a low-tech agri-world. The saint's own priests, known as the Ayanti, based on the world and split into two sects, one with responsibility to care for the saint's shrines and the other which would travel the route of the crusade spreading the imperial creed, the fall of the Sabbat worlds. The Sabbat worlds had become a prosperous imperial territory by M37 boasting a population of 5 trillion with a thriving industrial and trade network. Unfortunately, it had gained a reputation as a troublesome province due to the frequent raids due to its large frontier along the outer dark. A brief explanation on the problems of the Imperial Frontier and the Outer Dark. The light of the Astronomicon only travels so far to the edges of the Milky Way galaxy. Put simply, the further from Terra you go, the weaker the light of the Astronomicon becomes. So the more closely packed worlds of the main spiral arms of the galaxy are not only physically closer, but the strong beacon of the Astronomicon makes astrotelepathic messages swifter and clearer and warp jumps safer. Whereas, on the galactic edge, or rim, and as you move away from the main spiral arms of the galaxy, systems are more widely spaced out, for the most part, meaning communication and travel takes longer, and is more dangerous because of the increased distances involved, and the weakness of the Astronomicon's guiding light. This means that ships can only make short journeys into the warp with certainty, meaning longer travel times or more dangerous journeys through the warp as well as astropathic messages being broken up and lost far easier without the beacon of the Astronomicon to help guide the minds of sanctioned psychers and navigators. The edge of Imperial space has many names. For the most part it is known as the Outer Dark or the Outer Rim and occasionally it is referred to as the Halo Stars. Worlds in the Outer Dark on the border with the Imperium are often used as bases, hideouts, refuges and homes by raiders both human and Xenos to attack Imperial space and to flee and hide from retribution because of the difficulty for Imperial forces to function so far from Terra. Additionally, Imperial forces can only stay in these isolated and distant locations for a short amount of time in any meaningful numbers because of the difficulty in supply as well as communication and navigation. Imperial society has a great fear of the outer dark, viewing it as a haunted and evil area because of the lack of the Emperor's light, meaning only the most disciplined and faithful forces can stay out for too long before sedition and terror begin to affect the rank and file who fear for their very souls in the haunted dark of the cold void. This of course means there is no way of garrisoning any newly pacified worlds, so the threat is only ever temporarily removed. Imperial strategy on the frontier relies on colony worlds maintaining adequate defences or having Imperial Guard garrisons and for regular naval patrols of troubled regions. This again means that assets are not being used against other threats and so when necessity demands, parts of the frontier are stripped of forces needed at an active war front, 
for potentially decades, which again tempts raiders and pirates to attack weak areas in a vicious cycle. Although these raiders are obviously of paramount importance to those being attacked, the Imperium as a whole rarely takes concerted action against forces beyond its natural borders, as in the cost-benefit analysis, it is not worth the effort of deploying forces to far-flung and isolated regions of space when they are better used against more immediate threats. Occasionally an expedition will be launched to pacify a particularly strong adversary on the frontier, but the worlds on the galaxy's edge are far more scattered than worlds on the main spiral arms, which means any force that can attack Imperial space is likely to be small in scale, as it cannot harness the resources of more than a few worlds, and perhaps only one, to build a force capable of anything more than raiding shipping, or perhaps overrunning a particularly lightly populated frontier colony. Allowing for this, there are some exceptions. On the outer rim, there are some densely clustered groups of worlds, which do allow for the build-up of resources or forces in high enough number to cause a threat to Imperial space. Sometimes the threat these regions pose requires a full Imperial military strike to pacify the region or the building up of defences to counter the threat which again is part of a vicious cycle mentioned earlier. As these forces may be redeployed to counter a different threat leaving these territories vulnerable to attack. The cause of the Sabbat world's woes is one such cluster called the Sanguinary Worlds. In M38 a series of brutal border wars against the arch enemy tribe armies who inhabit this region of space began. These were sporadic and usually contained by local PDF and naval forces, but they were a persistent and bloody menace up to M41. The origins of the tribes of the Sanguinary Worlds is a hotly contested topic. It is known for certain that the remnants of those forces which were defeated by Saint Sabbat fled to the Sanguinary Worlds, but whether they originally came from there and what happened next is a mystery. Some of the theories are, they are descendants or colonists from the Dark Age of Technology, or some later colonising effort before the Imperial Age, which entered the Outer Dark, colonised their worlds, and then for one reason or another devoted themselves to the ruinous powers, or they are remnants of forces loyal to the War Master Horus who fled from Imperial space after his defeat and the great scouring which followed, and were simply forgotten or managed to hide from Imperial detection and so survive to form their own societies. Or, the last option, they are simply the descendants of those arch enemy forces which fled before St. Sabbath's crusade and managed to harness the resources of the sanguinary worlds and multiply into a vast population. All options are possible, and potentially all true, but what we do know is that the tribal armies possessed a technological and industrial base sufficient to create large fleets and large armies to conduct a war of conquest. In addition, several contingents, or perhaps individual, traitor space marines have fought alongside them. In M41, a charismatic warlord, titled the Archon, arose and united the tribal armies, who began to launch far larger and more organised attacks into the Sabbat worlds. At first, Imperial High Command believed this was simply a more intense border war, but by 600 M41, it was clear that the forces of the Arch Enemy were intent on the complete conquest of the whole region. Although several Imperial worlds resisted for decades, the majority of the Sabbat worlds fell to the Arch Enemy swiftly. It should be noted that not all of the worlds were conquered or occupied by Arch Enemy forces, which is probably due to the tribal decentralised nature of their command structure, with individual warlords commanding their own forces with their own objectives, but owing overall loyalty to the Archon. The Imperial forces sent to confront this threat fought valiantly, but were outmatched in every way and swiftly defeated. Eventually, Pacificus High Command decided to give up on the defence of the Sabah worlds to spare forces for more defensible regions which were also under chaos assault, and in 741 declared the whole region unstable slash hazardous, and the Civitas Imperialis was suspended, and the regional Lord Governor fled to the neighbouring sector. Some Xeno-tribal analysts have suggested that this and the several other chaos invasions of the Pacificus Segmentum could be considered a remigration by the descendants of those worshippers of the ruinous powers who fled before Saint Sabbat and later the Macarian Crusade. This may explain why the chaos occupation of some worlds was so light and yet on others it was near total colonisation. By the year 741 the forces of the Arch Enemy had taken control of a vast area of Imperial space and the Imperium could not spare the forces needed to counterattack. attack 
The material actions and achievements of a man's lifetime will never match the ambitions of his dreams. But a man must still allow himself to dream of the most daring and audacious goals. If he sets modest limits to his dreams, he hobbles the prospects of what he will achieve in life before he has even begun to live. Warmaster Slado, M41 From Slado, stop. To all militant commanders, stop. The signal is given, stop. The signal is advance, stop. May the Emperor protect us. This was the order to begin the Sabbat World's Crusade, sent by Warmaster Slado in 755M41. It would be the largest crusade launched by the Imperium since the Macarian Crusade in 392. It was said that Slado's only fear was at the age of nearly 150 standard Terran years he would not live to see the final victory. But he had been preparing for this great effort for decades, and finally the Sabbat Worlds and the legacy of Saint Sabbat Beata of Hagia would be returned to the Imperium. In the year 732, Slado brought before the Segmentum Pacificus High Command a plan entitled A Reasoned and Modest Approach to the Reconquest of the Sabbat Worlds. The fact that he chose to coach the proposals in such terms reflects the reticence of Pacificus High Command to the commitment to the vast resources that would be required in blood and treasure to launch such a crusade. At this time, Segmentum Pacificus faced multiple and large-scale threats, including several chaos incursions in addition to conflicts within the borders of the Segmentum more widely in the Imperium, naval and astromilitarum resources were being rushed to eight other significant major war zones, most notably at the Cadian Gate and Abroxis. Along with the myriad threats faced by the Imperium on a regular basis, a range of new enemies had emerged, which demanded the attention of the Imperial War Machine and the High Lords of Terror, further draining resources from other fronts across the galaxy. In 742, in answer to the growing threat from the emergent Tau Empire, the Democles Gulf Crusade was launched with the aim of wiping out the upstart meddling Xenos from the galaxy. Unfortunately, the Tau proved a tougher opponent than originally thought, with the Crusade's advance grinding to a halt in the face of stiff resistance. A truce was arranged due to the lack of progress and the need to redeploy the might of the Crusade to counter the threat from Highfleet Bearmoth. It is believed by the Holy Ordos that the Tyranids have been active in our galaxy for potentially millennia, but it was not until 745 that the Imperium was awoken to the true scale of the threat from this intergalactic Xenos race. Highfleet Behemoth destroyed the world of Tyron, which marked the beginning of the Tyrannic Wars along the Eastern Fringe, and the start of attacks from splinter fleets striking deep into Imperial space, preying on isolated and poorly defended worlds. Additionally, rumours were beginning to spread amongst the highest ranks of the Imperial government that older and graver threats were stirring. There were rumours of great preparations for another Black Crusade within the Eye of Terror. The Inquisition also whispered of the awakening of the ancient Necrons across multiple sectors and what this may bode for the future of the Imperium. These events further drained Imperial strength as forces were redeployed to counter these threats leaving Pacificus commands stretched to provide for the defence of the Segmentum and to maintain its existing offensive operations as men and war materials were diverted to other fronts. Slado was committed to the cause, however. He continued to argue for the reconquest within the upper echelons of the Imperial government, along with the now-exiled Sabbat World's regional Lord Governor. Slado believed it was an insult to Imperial prestige as such a vast region of the Imperium should be taken and occupied by the forces of the arch enemy, and that the Civitas Imperialis should be suspended in a region with such a holy and sacred origin. Slado was a deeply spiritual man, and it was noted by his friends and allies that he possessed a deep commitment to the legacy of Saint Sabbat, believing it was his personal mission to reclaim her legacy and return the Sabbat worlds to the Imperial fold. This sense of purpose radiated from the man, and infected both officers and men with a sense of divine mission. Marshal Blackwood wrote, Just as the peasant girl was inflamed by the God Emperor 6,000 years ago to rise up and fight, so the old man is inflamed by her memory. Slado used his rising fame and political connections within Segmentum Pacificus and the wider Imperium to influence the case for a Sabbat World's Crusade. 
and following his victories in the Kulam Wars, he was able to secure from the High Lords of Terror the rank of War Master, charged by them and by extension the God Emperor himself with the liberation of the Sabbat Worlds. In the name of the Eternal God Emperor of Mankind, vigilant and protective, who watches over the estate of humanity, one majesty everlasting, let the following be ordained. On this 123rd day of the year 755M41, the High Lords of Terror, in all agreement, hereby proclaim Slado to be granted with the office of Imperial War Master. And therewith all the powers and special purviews as accompany such high office, for the benefit of all mankind. Sons of the Imperium, make salute. Further, let it be proclaimed the said War Master is charged with all expedition to undertake a crusade of liberation making his theatre of combat the Sabbat worlds of the Segmentum Pacificus, in that he, to the extent of his abilities, will render said region free of the corrupt grasp of the ruinous powers, whose nature mortally offends the Golden Throne, and furthermore re-establish the rule of the Civitas Imperialis over said region for all future times. Further, it is charged that all lords, militant, governors and persons of rank also commanders of his holy majesty's battle fleets and masters of the glorious chapters attend upon this ordination and provide without hesitation all assistance to the office of the war master as they would to the god emperor himself for so he is the instrument and proxy of the golden throne marked upon with our seal at this hour the Crusader Charter, issued by the High Lords of Terror to Slado in 755 M41. The now War Master Slado and his staff began to gather a vast military force from across Pacificus and further afield, along with the resources to sustain it. Using the powers vested in him as a proxy of the Golden Throne, he acquired the forces from the Kulam Wars, and the Minotaurum began a great recruitment drive across the sector to raise whole new armies of Imperial Guardsmen. Vast fleets of the Imperial Navy were gathered along with nearly a billion Guardsmen, along with their armour and artillery components. Slado sought and gained the support of six Space Marine chapters for the Crusade. The White Scars were of particular note, as not only would they prove crucial in securing the initial objectives of the Crusade, but were eager to join, as their brothers had fought with St. Sebert back in M35 during her original Crusade fighting alongside her when she fell on the world of Harkalon, and later returned her body to Hagia. In addition, the Iron Snakes of Ithaca deployed a considerable contingent to the Crusade, numbering in the hundreds. The Iron Snakes will be mentioned in this history again, but will also have their own lore series in the future. Slado entered into a cooperative pact with the Adaptus Mechanicus, who agreed to provide the Crusade with Titan Legions and additional material support, on the understanding that any and all reclaimed Mechanicum holdings are returned to Martian control, and that any technological artefacts uncovered during the advance are given over to the Mechanicum. As we shall see, Slado had to cajole by various means the Mechanicum into action, as they were reluctant to put their Titan legions in danger. With this vast Crusader host assembled, on the 266th day of 755, the order was given. Advance. Operation Red Drake the Crusade begins. Named after the Serian Red Drake, or Hypertus Rubicundus, a predator with multiple heads which will attack multiple targets at once with deadly effect, so basically the worst snake you've ever seen. For Slado, this beast was the perfect representation for the strategy the Crusade must adopt to secure the initial footholds within the Sabbat worlds. Red Drake would strike multiple targets simultaneously in the hope that the enemy response would be disrupted. Slado wrote, To begin a crusade in these terms is like taking a breaking hammer to a solid wall. Slado had since 732 believed that this was the only viable means to retake the Sabbat worlds, which the enemy had fortified, utilising the mobility of the crusader forces to take worlds with surprise, and continued to push, giving the enemy no opportunity to coordinate a strong response. It is clear, the Imperial tacticians believed that the enemy command chain was vulnerable to this kind of multi-pronged assault, as the Archon, 
would not be able to organise the multiple warlords under his command to launch a concerted counter-attack. Imperial forces would be disabused of this notion, as they encountered the enemy, and particularly the forces of the Magisters, who were directly appointed lieutenants of the Archon, dispatched to control particularly important sites, in his name and with his authority, allowing for a more fluid and capable defence than was originally anticipated. Red Drake had four strategic objectives. One, to secure a foothold within the Sabbat worlds, which would then be used as bases and springboards to further the advance. Two, to surprise the enemy, allowing for a rapid advance. Three, to force the enemy to counterattack along multiple fronts, not allowing them to concentrate their forces. And finally, four, to provide quick and, in Slado's words, showy victory to raise morale amongst the Crusader hosts and the wider Imperium. Slado was keenly aware of dissenting voices within Pacificus High Command, and so a series of short, sharp Imperial victories would give him breathing room with his political rivals and provide assurance to the High Lords of Terror. The Crusades simultaneously attacked multiple worlds along the newfound trailing group, concerting on four worlds, Formal Prime, Onsgard, Long Halant, and a fourth attack, far from these, on Indrad, far to Corwood, which can be envisaged as a flanking move. They were conducted as lightning assaults, with Imperial forces engaging the enemy directly from translation from the war, thus not allowing them time to gather their defence or prepare for the incoming attack. Long Halant fell immediately to Generals Arkansas and Drevere, Drevere, it should be noted, will be discussed at length in another episode, as he is a character which encounters the ghosts uh, quite early on, and things don't work out too well. The world fell so quickly because Imperial intelligence had grossly overestimated the strength of the enemy forces on the world. Lord Militants Hummel and Delaney struck at Onsgard three weeks later, which fell following a brief fleet engagement and then a major artillery battle lasting three days breaking the capital city open to Imperial Guard ground assaults. There would be resistance on the world, but the final pockets of resistance would be finally wiped out in 756. Lord Militant Kyborn and Marshal Blackwood's assault on Indrad, seen as the counterpunch of Operation Red Drag, stalled after an initial good start, as the enemy managed to catch the Imperial forces on two fronts. Kyborn managed to perform a fainted withdrawal which drew a large part of the enemy force into a kill box of long-range batteries. A long ground war continued into 756, with Kyborn utilising orbital bombardment at the expense of his own forces to break the enemy. Marshal Blackwood protested this callous use of friendly fire, but Kyborn replied simply, I am but Slado's man. Blackwood was transferred from Kyborn's command shortly afterwards. Slado himself led the attack on Formal Prime, a hive world of considerable size, which brought home to the War Master the scale of the task before the Crusade and the true capacity of the enemy. Planning for a conquest within six weeks, it rapidly became clear that resistance was fiercer than anticipated. This is not wholly surprising. To assault a single hive is a daunting task for any military force, let alone a whole world. Slado was a great general, but he clearly had underestimated the scale of the enemy resistance or the capabilities of his own troops. There will be an overview of the difficulties of invading a hive world in an upcoming video. The assault began well, with orbit to soil deployment being a record for the Imperial Guard. Magister Shebol Redhand commanded a force of zealots, called the Charismites, who held the lower hives, offering high resistance to the Imperial advance. 200 guardsmen were dying per metre taken. Slado was furious to be stalled already in the opening stages of the advance, and to have his own reputation on the line. In the 11th week, Slado deployed the White Scars, who immediately purged the Hive, and the Charismite bodies were crucified along the boulevard approaches of the formal Prime Hives. Operation Red Drake was completed, but with a higher cost than Slado had anticipated. The next phase of the Crusade would be known as Operation Newfound, and would be launched against a stronger opponent, as the Arch Enemy had now had time to prepare their defences. For Slado, the route of the Crusade was a glittering pathway, a pilgrimage, which followed in the footsteps of the saint herself. The second phase of the Crusade, Operation Newfound, was about to begin.
but for the fighting men and women of the crusade, it was just the bloody road to Balhus. Episode 3 The Bloody Path to Balhut Consolidation Operation Red Drake had now concluded and a new phase of the crusade, Operation Newfound, was about to begin. Although Slado's aims had been achieved, the level of resistance and experience of the troops and officers of the Guard, as well as the Imperial Navy from the initial crusade advance, caused great consternation to the Imperial High Command. Many of Slado's preconceptions of the arch enemy forces had been shattered, and the siege of Formal Prime had given the Crusade a bloody nose right out of the gate. Slado's objective was the central world of Balhut, with its control of most of the main, fastest, and most stable warp routes and shipping lanes, which he believed would break the back of the arch enemy in the Sabbat Cluster and would secure the newfound trailing group back under Imperial control. This was the bloody road to Balhut. The forces of the Arch Enemy had begun to rally, so Slado knew that fiercer fighting would be ahead. To this end, the Minotaurum recruitment campaign was continued to ensure that fresh replacement forces would be available to the Crusade in expectation of the losses ahead. A central theme of Slado's initial plan for the Sabbat Crusade was the belief that the forces of the Arch Enemy were too disorganised and that the Archon would not be able to gather adequate forces to resist a swift Imperial advance. He also underestimated the quality and strength of resistance the forces of the Arch Enemy could muster. The Archon of the Chaos Forces in the Sabbat Cluster was an individual known as Nadzibar. Little is known of the origins of this Champion of Chaos it is entirely possible that Nabzibar was the original leader of the invasion of the Sabbat Worlds back in 634. This would make him old, but would not be completely unreasonable given the resources at his disposal and his commitment to the Dark Gods, who often give their servants gifts of longevity, strength and other vile powers. The Archon selected powerful individual champions to act as his lieutenants and generals. These were known as Magistars. They were given vast power by Nadzibar and large portions of the arch enemy armies to command. This was what surprised the Imperial Command as the Crusade advanced. As far from being a disorganised rabble of throttling heretics, although there were plenty of them as well, they were opposed by large, well-organised and well-trained armies and fleets commanded with skill by Magistars and Lesser Chaos Commanders. The strength of the arch enemy would become more apparent as the crusade advanced. To the extent that Slado was forced to revise his timetables for the reconquest of Balhut 37 times from 756 to 761. Now having secured the bridgehead worlds in the Sabbat cluster, these worlds would be fortified and used as supply and reinforcement routes for the advance. Imperial Command had a newfound respect for the capabilities of the Arch Enemy, which would alter planning for future assaults. The process of converting or securing worlds that had been conquered had also begun. It is important to appreciate what this involved, due to the fact that similar activities would be carried out throughout the conquered worlds of the Sabbat Crusade, but are not generally mentioned in the record with any great detail. So we will cover this crucial aspect of the Imperial Conquest now, so that it's readily in people's minds going forward. Occupation and Resistance in the Sabbat Cluster As mentioned previously, when the Sabbat Worlds were originally invaded by the Chaos-aligned tribes from the Sanguinary Worlds, their conquest and occupation of Imperial space was not uniform. Nor was it true that all worlds within the Sabbat Cluster had been wholly corrupted by the ruinous powers, to the extent that the population of these occupied worlds were turned to worship of the powers of the war. In many cases, perhaps due to the finite numbers of arch enemy invaders, the footprint they left on worlds that they occupied was relatively small. Many of the worlds in the Sabbat Cluster were relatively unpopulated, and would be considered civilised or agri-worlds as defined by the Administratum. 
Tanith itself would fall in this category with a reasonably large population with a reasonable level of technology, but not on the scale of a hive world nor anywhere near in terms of sheer vastness. Some worlds within the Sabbath cluster were not in fact invaded, which you can imagine was a surprise when the Imperium found them and discovered a loyal world. But this was by no means the norm. On the majority of less important worlds taken by the armies of the Archon, basically a garrison force was deposited and the commander or warlord of some description was left to rule the world in the name of the Archon or one of his magistral lieutenants on the agreement that they would hold the world and possibly fulfill some function such as resource gathering or recruitment. What they did on this world would be fundamentally up to them and no doubt those who were not performing well would be replaced. It was to the whims of this figure how they would control the local population. Obviously the local ecclesiarchy and any shrines to Saint Sabbath as well as to the God Emperor himself would be destroyed. But whether attempts would be made to convert the whole population to the worship of the ruinous powers was optional depending on who was in charge. Often, although harsh measures of occupation and attempts to co-opt local elites or groups did occur, the general population would not be fully corrupted and simply continue with their lives or potentially becoming some kind of slave or serf workforce, labouring in some industry such as resource production or full-on manufacturing of arms depending upon the situation on the world and the orders received by the arch enemy warlord. So, when one of these worlds was retaken by the Imperium, efforts would be made to root out what heresy had taken hold amongst the population, and usually a complete purge of the world's elites would take place. As was only right, as these individuals had often been co-opted into the service of the Arch Enemy. These purges would be directed by representatives from the Inquisition and followed by the priests of the Ecclesiarchy Vigilance would be maintained, however, amongst this newly conquered population to ensure that heretical beliefs had been expunged. And any cells of holdouts would be hunted down and eradicated, gifting them the Emperor's peace. This process would continue for decades after the initial conquest. Many worlds did, of course, become fully corrupted, and when the Crusade found worlds in this situation, the fighting was all the harder because of the vast legions of devout heretics willing to fight imperial forces to the death in the name of their vile gods. As is the way with the ruinous powers, mutation, mental and physical corruption would run rampant amongst many of the converted worlds. This made the job of the imperial forces harder at the outset of the conquest, but also later when garrisons would be routinely used to hunt heretic cells within the population, assuming of course that the local population still existed and the Imperial Crusade had not purged the world entirely to ensure that those loyal to the Dark Gods had been eliminated. Which is standard Imperial policy. Some worlds within the Sabbat Cluster, to their great credit, did continue to resist chaos occupation. Active resistant movements would fight insurgencies against the Arch Enemy attacking their supplies, their garrisons, and conducting assassinations on their dignitaries. Efforts would be made by Imperial Command to utilize these forces to aid any invasion attempt, but also to gain intelligence. Once the conquest of the world was complete, these resistance forces would by necessity have to be eliminated due to the potential damage they could do to the new administration. In response to what some may consider harsh measures, the Imperium must take to purify the population and return them to the fold. If they are not eliminated outright, they may be given the honour of forming new regiments and allowed to join the Crusade and fight the enemy on a different world. Either way, an armed and experienced insurgency force must be removed from a world, as it is simply too dangerous to allow these destabilising forces to remain past the initial conquest, purge and consolidation. Operation Newfound 
Operation Newfound began as soon as Operation Red Drake was complete. With Imperial forces launching multiple assaults across enemy worlds, these worlds were more heavily defended and had their populations mobilised to resist the Imperial advance. In addition, the Archon had dispatched reinforcements under the command of his favoured Magistars to supplement the defences of these worlds, while he himself mobilised his main armies deeper in the newfound trailing group. This consisted of forces being landed on Chaos worlds, but also large and powerful raider fleets attacking vulnerable worlds in the Imperium's rear, as well as attempting to isolate and destroy Imperial forces. Additionally, the Imperium was suffering attacks in its rear from remnant forces which had fled before the Imperial advance during Operation Red Drake. These forces had now rallied and began to launch opportunistic attacks on the Crusaders' rear lines, causing disruptions to supplies as well as communications. This became such a problem that Slater was forced to dispatch Lord Militant Delaney with a force to destroy these threats to the rear. This of course was the intention of the attacks in the first place as it would bleed Imperial forces away from the front line in order to tackle these raiders. Thankfully for the Crusade, Delaney was exceptionally skilled and was able to annihilate the majority of these raiders relatively quickly and also managed to kill the raider pirate leader Pater Bathol at Urus, thus freeing the Crusade from this continued attack. Some of the most notable battles of the Crusade would be fought in this period, and some of the most disgusting and vile leaders of the Arch Enemy would come to the attention of the Imperium for the first time. Notable Engagements During Operation Newfound Ashek II Ashek II was a heavily populated and industrialised hive world with dozens of large hive cities with a population fully turned and loyal to the Arch Enemy. Its forces were commanded by one of the Archon's most gifted Magistars. Heritor Asphodel became a figure of terror for the Crusaders and was one of the most skilled and effective enemy commanders that was encountered at the start of the Crusade. Each of the Archon's warlords had a unique approach to war and this made their armies varied in makeup and action. Heritor had a penchant for creating war machines which were grotesque bladed monstrosities known as woe machines. These wreaked havoc amongst the Imperial forces, carving through Imperial infantry formations and could generally only be held off by intervention from large Imperial armoured formations, which weren't as vulnerable to the kinds of anti-infantry weapons these woe machines possessed nor the understandable terror which these approaching monstrosities caused on the Imperial Guardsmen. The Imperial commander for the invasion of Asek II, Marshal Blackwood, said, The scale of the enemy woe machines is almost unimaginable. The sheer cruelty of them, extraordinary. Great flywheels, live with blades, scissoring jaws, vast wheels designed purely for crushing, Insectoid crawlers breathing flame from draconian snouts. They are mechanisms of an insane torturer made real and magnified to giant proportions. The Imperial Guard is many things, but in the end it is only flesh and blood and bone. And these machines are fashioned simply to strip and rend and break these mortal substances quite utterly. The battle cannons of Blackwood's armoured contingents held the line against these abominations, but the tide only turned when the Mechanicum finally unleashed a squadron of Titans in their first full-scale deployment of the Crusade. This was no easy thing to arrange. The Mechanicum had shown great reluctance in deploying its forces, arguing that the God Machines should remain in a support role pending serious misadventure. This attitude infuriated Slado. I have titans to use, so let me damn well use them. A sword is of no value until it is drawn, he said. The Mechanicum, although nominally under Slado's command as Warmaster, was under no obligation to follow direct orders if its controlling Magi did not want to, due to their unique position within the Imperial hierarchy. In order to force the Mechanicum into the fight, 
Slado slightly included them in intelligence reports from Ashek 2, which included multiple reports from Imperial forces of the horror and technical skill of the Herator and his war machines, along with many theories regarding his origins and possible links to the Adaptus Mechanicus as a rogue or former member. The Mechanicum was forced to deploy with vigour to end this rumour as well as any talk of links between the Chaos Warlord and the Machine Cult. It would take three months, even with these mighty war engines, to win the war for Ashek II. In the aftermath, thousands of guardsmen would require psychiatric support to cope with the stress trauma from the horrors they had seen and fought against. Blackwood coined the term Burning Ladders to Hell to describe the terrible scenes of destruction the Imperium had to unleash upon Ashek's resisting hive cities. This saying would be used again and again as the crusade progressed. Herator Apsodol himself flared Ashek to before the Imperial victory and would be a further menace to Imperial forces later in the crusade. Ambold 11 Ambold 11 was nearly a disaster. It was an important world populated with hive cities which, unlike most such worlds, had been planned to include vast defensive walls turning them into fortresses known as citadels. In addition, it had a defence fleet, orbital fortresses and a large orbital anchorage for shipping and trade. The assault began well with Imperial Navy forces smashing the enemy fleet, destroying the orbital defence forts and wiping out all of the shipping at anchor. Imperial forces landed but were unable to secure a quick victory due to the large defensive works surrounding the primary hives where the enemy had dug in. Losses were heavy and three full-scale assaults were fought off by the enemy forces. The Imperial commander himself was killed during a mortar attack and his second in command, a Colonel Bagulin of the Serpoi Regiment, managed to trap his forces within a portion of one of the main hives where they were faced with utter annihilation. Thankfully for the Crusaders, their frantic astropathic cries for help and assistance were answered by the Iron Snakes of Ithaca en route to Severin, who diverted and immediately launched a drop pod assault on Ambald Eleven's hives. The Imperial forces were rescued, and the Iron Snakes went about their work with gusto, slaughtering the heathens. In two of the three target cities, the Iron Snakes slaughtered 29,000 heretics for the loss of just eight Astartes, a mighty feat which is celebrated still. A week after their intervention, the final arch enemy bastion fell to the Iron Snakes, and the enemy leadership were crucified. Colonel Bagulin was later executed by the Commissariat for gross leadership errors. Episode 4 The End of the Road we continue as Warmaster Slado pushed onwards towards Balhut. In addition to those conflicts covered previously, dozens of fleet engagements, as well as major and minor planetary assaults had taken place during Operation Newfound. The following are the most notable engagements and battles of this part of the Crusade. The First Battle of Severin The world of Severin is the main strategic objective of Operation Newfound and its conquest was essential to secure the territory that had been taken due to its location on the main and fastest stable warp route to Balhut as well as its links to the other worlds in the Newfound Trailings Group which Slado had marked for conquest during this phase of the Crusade. It was essentially a crossroads but to a lesser extent than Balhut itself However, it did offer the Crusade the best path to that crucial world. In addition to its strategic importance, it was located in the region known as the Reef Stars, which are notable for the holy visage of the saint the stars form, from the right angle and distance of course. This added additional spiritual significance to the more devout Crusaders such as Slado himself, and it was along this route that St. Sabbath's original crusade had travelled. The First Battle of Severin, as it would become known, began on Candlemas 757. 
and initially routed the arch enemy forces and even slew the Chaos Commander, Magister Cavulo. The mass Imperial Guard ground assault, led by Lord Militant Hummel and General Bulladin, was forced to dig in and break off the pursuit and eradication of the arch enemy forces. Due to extreme weather conditions setting in, at a suspiciously opportune moment for the Chaos Worshippers. The enemy regrouped and counterattacked, retaking Nafar City, Colchis, and Ramari. Bulladin pushed through the extreme snow and rain conditions, encircling and retaking Ramari. Hummel pushed towards Colchis, engaging in a six week air superiority war and retaking the city. Lord Militant Hummel would become known for his reliance in favour of air power as the crusade progressed. The remaining arch enemy forces at Nafar City would bleed the Imperial forces over the course of eight weeks. 3,000 men died to take two kilometres of ground before the city's walls. Faced with failure to take the city and these extreme losses, Bulladin offered his resignation to the War Master. Slado refused and ordered him to do it again. Reinforced by a Warlord Titan, the Victress Impersonata, Bulladin's forces attacked again, finally overrunning the city's walls and defence, then stormed the Upper Palace, almost capturing the notorious Pata Buka, the new Chaos Commander. He unfortunately died resisting capture. Fornex Aleph One of the strangest and most costly engagements for the Imperium occurred on the planet of Fornex Aleph. In 757, Imperial scouts reported that Fornex Aleph was an arch enemy world with moderately sized hives as well as a large defence fleet. Heavy fighting was expected to conquer the system. To that end, Slado directed a considerable fleet and guard army under one of his most promising protégés, General Jatta Elbeth. Elbeth had nine regiments, including two full armour brigades and a full force of 300 iron snakes of Ithaca deployed to this attack. Unfortunately for the Imperials, massive but localised warp storms erupted en route which delayed the date of the invasion of the system twice. The Iron Snake's fleet of battle barges were held becalmed and unable to enter the warp for four months, and the main naval and guard fleet was caught and scattered en route. When Elbereth finally translated in system, he had only a third of his strength, the rest of his force either being scattered to some neighbouring system or lost. Elbereth was no fool, and was seen as one of the War Master's rising stars with great prospects for future command. For that reason, he did not launch a foolhardy attack on Fornex Aleph and instead withdrew his forces to the system's edge to await the arrival of the rest of the invasion force or attempt to flee the system if the enemy seemed too powerful. As time passed and having received no challenge from the arch enemy forces reported on Fornex Alpha, Albrecht ordered the rapid pursuit frigate Ziegler to conduct an intruder pass into the system to gather intelligence on the enemy's strength and disposition. To the astonishment of Albrecht, the Ziegler reported that no resistance had been encountered from the planetary defences, the orbital yards were empty and that no enemy fleet had been detected. Additionally, its scans detected no electromagnetic activity on the planet. No Vox, no power, no sign of activity. The world looked abandoned and its cities were dark. The cruiser Claudio was dispatched to conduct a more detailed scan and returned with the same results. There was no one on the world. There were not any signs of industry, power or activity of any type, even in the hinterlands outside the main hive cities and major settlements. The planet looked dead. After much consideration, Albert decided to lead a spearhead force to the surface, consisting of two regiments of ray-barked heavy infantry and the Vitrian 10th Armoured Brigade, 16,000 men and 800 fighting vehicles. 
The assault encountered no resistance, as it encircled and then entered the main hive city of Kyosom. Kyosom, like every other city the Imperials investigated, was empty of people. Half-eaten meals were found in homes, and half-finished games of regicide were found in street parlours. Every single human being on the planet had simply disappeared. Elbeth's engineers restored power to the main cities, which had wound down from lack of supervision. Plague was ruled out, as there were no burial pits or signs of panic from mass contagion. They all seemed to have simply just disappeared from the planet in an instant. Elbeth gathered his forces and fortified Karazhan. Reinforcements were expected soon, but from Elbeth's combat log, the foreboding and unnerving stillness of the deserted world began to eat at the moral of even the stoic vitriols. At night, screams were heard throughout the hives, though no one was ever found. Elbeth reported to Slado regularly of what he described as the fearful absence we have uncovered. On the first day of 758, all transmission from Elbeth's force ceased. The Iron Snakes finally broke free of the warp storms and arrived in orbit of Fornix Aleph, eight days later. The full 300 Astartes launched drop pod assaults across the world. Even the sons of Ithaca were disturbed by the world, reporting back to Slado, Warmaster, my lord, there is no one here at all. It was not simply Elbeth's ground forces that had disappeared, the fleet had gone as well. The only evidence that could be found were two drop pods washed up on the coast, equipment and supplies stowed in the area the Imperial Guard should have been, and Elbeth's log, as well as some personal effects. And most oddly of all, on the roof of an eight-story hub block, a single Vitrian Lehman Rus Conqueror had somehow been deposited. All the crew were gone, the cords from their voxets having been fused from the last 30 centimetres of cord. And, still gripping the gearbox lever, a gauntlet containing the calcified hand of its owner. Three days later, the Iron Snake's fleet detected a ship entering fatal orbit around Fornax's sun. The ship was believed to be the Claudia, but this was not confirmed before the ship entered its fiery grave. Slado ordered the Iron Snakes to withdraw, lest such a massive and powerful force suffer the same fate as those before, and rob the Crusade of one of its strongest fighting forces and potentially damage its prospects. However, before they could withdraw, a large stellar object, which had somehow been undetected, either a comet or a meteor, smashed into Fornex Alpha's polar regions, unleashing cataclysmic natural disasters across the world, such as volcanic eruptions, earthquakes and tsunamis, as well as the collapse of the northern ice shelf. The Iron Snakes, unable to leave the world in the short term, due to the damage in the atmosphere, hunkered down in defensive positions in the remaining hive cities and withstood the fallout from the meteor strike. But then, from the blasted north came forth a vast legion of demonic entities surging forth and laying siege to the Iron Snakes positions in the hive cities. For nearly a year, this brutal war continued, with the Iron Snakes fighting back legions of demonic foes as they threw themselves at the walls of the Hive Cities. Even when the environmental damage from the Meteor Strike abated, the Iron Snakes fought on, but now with support from their battle barges in orbit. Eventually, the scattered elements of Elbeth's original invasion force finally began to enter the system and immediately deployed their guard forces to aid the Iron Snakes. But by then, the brave sons of Ithaca had vanquished the demonic foe utterly. The Force Commander, Brother Captain Cools, called it the long battle through the endless night, and it had cost them dearly, but Fornax Aleph had been cleansed and secured for the Imperium. The Iron Snakes had now secured the Imperial Crusade from defeat and dishonour on two occasions. The Imperium has been unable to give a full explanation for the disappearances on Fornax Alpha, 
nor the emergence of the demonic horde, other than to speculate that it must be connected to the warp storms, which had erupted in the stellar locality, or some plot by the forces of the archenemy, to utilize arcane and twisted sorcery to attempt to fight the gallant crusaders of the Imperium. Whatever the reason, the recolonization of Fornax Alpha has been underway for the last 15 years, and the planet was deemed purged of corruption. No other instances of disappearance have occurred, but on some nights, screams can be heard ringing out across the hives to this very day. Astartes in the Sabbath Crusade As mentioned previously, the Iron Snakes have proven themselves essential and a supremely effective fighting formation during the Sabbath Crusade, and they will continue to do so throughout the Crusade. Aside from the vast forces of the Imperial Navy, Imperial Guard, and elements of the Mechanicum which had joined the Crusade, those contingents of the Adaptus Astartes who had sworn themselves to St. Sabbath's Liberation Crusade and Warmaster Slado were a massive force multiplier to the advance. On numerous occasions, they would rescue Imperial forces from defeat by a foe which was well trained, highly motivated, and surprisingly numerous, as well as equipped with weaponry which was often the match for those fielded by the Imperium. The presence on the Imperial side of large forces of Astartes such as the White Scars, Silver Guard, who would suffer many casualties on Balhut soon, and were led there by their chapter master himself, and the 300 brothers of the Iron Snakes of Ithaca, amongst other chapters, offered the Imperium a solid advantage in its advance, as wherever they were deployed, the arch enemy could not hope to resist them. The Chaos forces appear to have had very few traitor space marines within their armies. In fact, on the few occasions they were encountered during the Crusade, they only numbered in the dozens, and on one occasion, Imperial forces discovered the destroyed wreck of a Chaos Space Marine Dreadnought, as well as on Balhut, where several Dreadnoughts were reported. Other than that, only individual Chaos Space Marines were ever encountered, and these were acting as field commanders or champions, although these individuals could wreak havoc and savage violence on Imperial forces. They could not hope to hold off the vast assault waves of men and armour Slado would deploy when invading worlds, let alone the company strength contingents of the Emperor's Angels, which would often act as the tip of the spear and attack the most heavily defended enemy positions. On one notable raid, deep into arch-enemy held space, several space marines from different chapters were assigned to assist the strike team of elite Imperial Guardsmen in fulfilling their mission. This discrepancy in Astartes' numbers would continue through the Crusade, and would always give the Imperium the advantage wherever the Astartes fought. As to why so few of the traitor legions were present in the enemy ranks, it probably is to do with the relative isolation of the Sabbat worlds from any of the larger warp anomalies which act as refuges, bases and fortresses to the corrupted and the thrice cursed traitors. Kosaminu the world that refused to die. According to Imperial estimates, the taking of the troubled world of Kosamino has cost the lives of around 8 million guardsmen from 760 to 773. The initial conquest of the world was conducted by Slato's second front force, whose role was to swoop in on enemy worlds which had been bypassed by the main crusade force and could offer alternative approaches to Balhut. General Kelso, a tankman, directed armoured assaults on the world's hive cities, capturing three of them in quick succession. The legendary Narminian I were deployed under the command of the then Colonel Grismond, who would later rise to the rank of General and play a major part during the Siege of Vervenhive, and will be mentioned again. It was in this campaign that Grismond began his rise to greatness, fighting two major tank battles around the city of Harshen and its surrounding dune seas. It took two years to finally conquer the world, and the most high-profile casualty amongst Imperial command occurred. When Lord Militant Vicarus, an extremely popular commander amongst the guard ranks, was ambushed and killed 
during the notorious Sabre Bridge incident, when Vickers' armoured convoy was provided with bad intelligence that his route was clear of enemy forces, but ran right into the foe. Cosimenius would be fought over three more times, when, after Bellhut fell, fleeing arch enemy forces managed to retake the world and the crusade had to dispatch forces from the front to re-secure it. The Second Battle of Severin The tough fighting that had stalled Operation Newfound was made worse by the outbreak of plague and famine on a number of worlds in the crusade's rear. Formal Prime, now acting as a logistical support now acting as a logistical supply hub for the advance, suffered outbreaks of Rosepock distemper, which delayed their movement of men and material to the front line. Famine and drought also affected a number of worlds, possibly due to the activities of remnant archenemy forces, limiting the flow of supplies and foodstuffs. But the Crusade had fought on, but the Crusade had fought on, and had achieved almost all of the objectives Slado had marked and a strike on Balhut was now possible. It was at this moment that the arch enemy forces under the command of Archon Nadzibar himself finally launched their counter-attack, which smashed into the Crusaders' front line, invading multiple worlds and placing a large piece of recently conquered territory at risk. Severin was invaded and overrun by Chaos worshippers, and General Bulladin and the forces under his command were rushed to the world, tasked with its defence. At least until Slado could gather the forces necessary to push the arch enemy back. Bulladin's orders were to deny the enemy the world as a springboard to a deeper thrust into the newfound trailing group. And to that end, to hold the key fuel and supply depots which had been established on the world. Bulladin knew the world well and wrote, this place will not belabor me twice. The Imperial forces on Severin immediately counterattacked the enemy, Bulladin being unwilling to be bottled up in defensive positions and slowly annihilated. This confidence boosted the morale amongst the defenders and allowed them to at first stall and then begin to push back the numerically superior enemy forces. By 761, after nearly a year of fierce fighting across the planet, reinforcements began to arrive, and Imperial Command determined that Bulladin's forces had not only been battling the war hosts of Magistar Sholon Skara with his vile Kith brethren, but also the armies of Archon Nadzibar himself. The arch enemy forces on the surface were pushed back into several jungle walled cities in the southern continent, and after 16 months of war and siege, they finally broke, and those that could fled Severin. The Archon and Magister Skara began to withdraw their armies back to arch enemy territory, with Imperial forces in hot pursuit. The battle had been described by Imperial analysts and historians as the tipping point of the Crusade. If Severin had fallen, the arch enemy would have had the lightly defended centre of the Crusade's territory open before them, and could have broken Slado's armies in two and made them ripe for annihilation, as well as potentially seeing the entire reconquest of the Sabbat worlds reversed and the region once more under chaos domination. It is no understatement that Bulladin's efforts saved the Crusade from destruction and enabled the future victories to come as he blunted the elite of the enemy's strength and inflicted massive casualties. At the time, the full size of the arch enemy armies invading Severin was unknown, as was the presence of the Archon and his personal war hosts. If Bulladin had been aware of the foe he faced, and the odds against him, he may have been more cautious in the defence, instead of boldly driving at the foe. But for all the hardships, the balance of power had, for the time being, at least shifted into the Imperium's favour, and Slado would take full advantage. After the Archon's counterattack had been thwarted, with much cost, the Crusade's front line was stabilised, and Imperial High Command began to discuss the current strategic situation, and whether the change of direction was called for 
in the face of the resistance and losses already sustained. Kaiborn and Drevere voiced concerns over the tactics and direction of the Crusade and believed a drive straight at Balhut, Slado's intention from the beginning, would be costly and that alternative options could win the war. Slado, however, would not be swayed from Balhut. It was tactically essential to push deeper into the Sabbat worlds and would also allow for and secure the defence of all the worlds connected to it via its stable warp routes, which congregated at the Balhut system as if it were a stellar crossroads. Not only this, spiritually, Slado was committed to retracing the steps of Saint Sabbat's original crusade and treated with great respect the opinions of her main advisor, Fulternius, whom believed Balhut was the most important world in determining who controls the Sabbat cluster. So no matter the strategic merits of alternative routes of advance, Slado believed, as he always had, it has always been Balhut, it will always be Balhut, these worlds turn upon its axis. The Fabian Ruse In 764, the Archon's retreat from Imperial territory was complete, and he began to rally fresh war hosts and armies from his Magistars deeper within the Sabbat worlds, as well as various vassal warlords to create an unstoppable army to unleash against the Crusade in a single knockout blow. This pursuit of a single all-out major decisive engagement was Slado's desire as well. To that end, an intelligence operation began whereby Slado would attempt to corral the enemy into a massive confrontation, but this confrontation would occur on Balhut, his original goal, ensuring that the enemy would be smashed apart and the vital world would be in Imperial hands. The Archon attempted to draw the Imperials to the world of Fabia, where he would halt and destroy them. Slado allowed him to believe this, and ordered fleet movements and troop deployments into that area of space to create the impression of a massive build-up of strength, and that the Crusader forces were preparing to strike at Fabia. Also, as with any conflict, particularly on this scale, there are always going to be spies, and the arch enemy had spies operating within the Imperial War Machine. Slado saw to it that his operatives planted information on troop dispositions, as well as requisition orders, which when they reached the ears of the Archon, would prove that the Imperium is taking the bait, and create the impression that the Archon had more time than he did to organise his own plans. In addition to these secretive moves, Slado began to publicly support the alternative plans of Lord Militant Kyborn to launch a rimward attack on the arch enemy, rather than drive for Balhut, saying that it was a viable option if we closed at Fabia, which of course leaked immediately across the Imperial communication network and reached the Archon's ears, further supporting the evidence the arch enemy had been receiving. Archon Nadzubar, confident that he would have a mass engagement at Fabia, and believing he still had the time to strengthen its defences and gather more legions of the damned to his banner, moved his vast army to Balhut, controlled by his loyal magistar, Sholan Skara, to rearm and resupply his now vast host, in preparation for the decisive battle to come. And so, without knowing he had been deceived, his vast army and fleet were caught completely by surprise when the combined battle fleet of the Sabbat Crusade tore from the warp and began its mass assault of the Balhut system. Slado wanted Balhut, he wanted to destroy the enemy war host, and he wanted Nazibar's head, and though he would achieve all these things, the cost would be great. From Slado to all militant commanders, with immediate authority you are charged to commence planetary assault. Landing Wave Alpha signalled to begin. Landing Wave Beta signalled to begin. 
do this in the Emperor's name and may his grace protect you. Make them weep. Episode 5. Balhut. I have dreamed of this many times. In my worst nightmares, I did not witness this. Warmaster Slado at Balhut. The arch enemy was unprepared and had no idea the full weight of the Imperium's combined strength. Imperial Guard, chapters of the Adaptus Astartes, and the Imperial Navy was about to smash into their orbiting fleet and rain death upon the followers of Chaos. Slado initially planned to be at Balhut within two years of the launch of the Sabbat World's Crusade. Ten had now passed, millions had perished, fleets of ships now spun listlessly through the cold dark void and worlds had seen war and devastation on a scale not witnessed for millennia. Other leaders may have faltered in the face of the challenges presented by the corrupted and heretical forces of Archon Nadzibar. Other leaders would have altered their plans when the scale of the task became apparent from the almost endless reams of casualty reports. Other men would have been broken seeing the devastation they ordered unleashed from torpedo tubes and nova cannon of the ancient scarred and venerable battle cruisers and destroyers of the tireless Imperial Navy. The battle cannon shells and remorseless treads of near uncountable armoured divisions of Lehman Rust battle tanks and Banblade bear muffs, or from the endless legions of bayonet fixed rifles of the Astra Militarum, who march towards death or victory with only love of the Emperor and righteous hatred for the enemies of the Golden Throne. Other men may have fallen to despair knowing that it was they directing this theatre of horrors, ordering men to suffer hardships unthinkable, unspeakable torments and potentially their deaths to destroy and wipe from the very memory of the galaxy those who would deny the glory and self-evident sovereignty of him on terror in favour of sorcery and vile ritual at the altars of heathen gods and demons. Other men may have broken, but not Slado. As recounted at the start of this history, Slado was filled with an endless reserve of faith in the Emperor of Mankind and his chosen avatar, Saint Sabbat Beata. And like the pilgrim from the earliest days of humanity's evolution on old earth, to those who flocked to the shrine worlds across the Imperium, and the Avanti priesthood, who still, at great personal risk, travelled the routes of Saint Sabbat's original crusade to tend the holy sites and shrines to her faith and sacrifice. Slado was pursuing the Numinous. He had consulted Ecclesiarchy priests and the Tarot for guidance throughout his life, and had come to the conclusion that it was his duty in the spiritual and temporal to follow in the footsteps of Saint Sabbat and reclaim her legacy for the Imperium of Man. But in particular, this spiritual quest told him that it was Balhut where he would find his destiny. Balhut, that world which straddled warp roots and determined who dominated the Sabbat cluster. It was here that Slado was determined to take. Although he did hide the intense religious fervour he felt for conducting the crusade and reaching Balhut from his more worldly allies and colleagues. It would only emerge later by examining his personal journals and logs where he strove so hard for Balhut over any other course of action despite the legitimate and militarily sound arguments from his generals. Before the attack on Balhut began Slado hosted a banquet for select officers, of which Commissar Gaunt was one, where each was asked to swear a blood oath to protect the saint at all costs. After ten years of war and toil and horror against the enemies of the throne, the assault on Balhut was about to begin. Slado named his assault Hellstorm. It seems the main reason behind this was purely for the awesomeness factor. In the last hours of his life, Slado would regret the name, having seen the horrors and losses suffered by his forces during the attack, and, as he saw it, consigned so many 
to a storm of hell. As was his way, General Drevere quipped that Slado would have been happier if he had named the assault. Something better disposed, such as a constitutional in fine parkland or tea on the terrace. The plan for the attack on the Balhut system was thus. 1. Achieve orbital superiority and cripple or destroy as much enemy shipping as possible. 2. Orbital bombardment of key surface targets. 3. Rapid and covered landings of primary planetary assault forces. 4. General assault drop once primary targets have been captured. 5. Rapid and covered landing of secondary planetary assault forces to either reinforce troops on the ground or to attack secondary objectives. The Imperial Navy would strike at Balhut in four waves. The spearhead wave of rapid attack warships entered the system 16 hours ahead of the main invasion fleet. It entered the system stealthily, using the local star to mask its presence until the attack began. The main body of troop ships and orbital assault craft translated outside of the system in open space and slowly began moving towards Balhut five hours ahead of the main fleet, remaining undetected as the presence of the mass of the arch enemy fleet negated any ripples in the warp from movement of so many Imperial ships at once. Mainline battle cruisers and assault craft translated in system close to Balhut and engaged immediately in a mirror to the tactics utilised during Operation Red Drake. This force struck at the arch enemy of fleet, attempting to knock out the orbital batteries and any enemy strength in high and low anchorage of the world. This was extremely dangerous, as translating so close to a planet may result in you simply translating within the planet's core. But the Imperial Navy had been conducting this kind of operation repeatedly during the initial phases of the crusade and going forwards to surprise the enemy and to not allow them to gather a defence. As soon as the main assault began, the first wave powered up and joined the attack, catching the enemy in the rear. As they attempted to form line to face this surprise attack, the orbital docking facilities of Balhut High Station and Haladin Threshold were stripped of their defensive batteries and left useless ready for orbital assault and eventual capture. This fleet engagement was extremely successful for the Crusade. 52% of the enemy fleet was destroyed at anchor, with another 12% destroyed as they attempted to form line and fend off the Imperials. This compares to the loss of 9% of ships from the Imperium, including the Imperium's flagship. There were particularly heavy losses to fighters and light bombers used to getting close and neutralise orbital defence batteries on the docking facilities. After 20 hours the Imperium had gained orbital superiority and was engaged in running battles throughout the system as it pursued the remnants of the arch enemy fleet who were attempting to flee before the Emperor's righteous fury. Some elements of the enemy fleet would remain in system and continue to harry the Imperials and even breach the blockade to reach Balhut throughout the invasion either launching orbital strikes or collecting fleeing heretics at the battle's conclusion. These instances would not last long however as the Imperial Navy would circle round and either destroy them or force them to withdraw to the system's edge. Planetary bombardment of the designated targets began as soon as the Navy had won orbital superiority and would continue for hours with some witnesses stating that it seemed as if the entire northern landmass of the western continent was on fire. Following planetary bombardment, the Imperial fleet began to disgorge its cargo to strike at their primary planetary targets. The fourth wave, carrying the reinforcement divisions, then entered the system awaiting the order to deploy their legions of men and armour, depending on the results of the initial assault. Despite the massive firepower unleashed on Balhut, its orbital and air defences at planet side remained strong and around 32% of the Imperial troops were killed, either shot from the sky or on the surface, although this number was higher in some conflict zones. Balhut has two principal continents with several island chains 
where the majority of resource and energy production take place away from the major populated settlements on the continents. The western continent contains the majority of the population as well as several hives and demi-hives or cities which are vast but have not yet reached the level of true hive. The eastern continent contains the capital known as the oligarchy with its ancient buildings and large fortifications as befits its long history as a seat of power and place of administrative importance within the wider Sabbath world. Next to Balhut is the sprawling city of Balopolis. Balhut itself is generally a bleak and cold world with the population mostly gathered around the urban and industrialized areas. Despite being under arch enemy control for years the population had not been utterly corrupted and were used as a serf class to provide for the arch enemy. That being said, a great many of the population had been corrupted and there is a hidden history from the conquest of Balhut where the population was systematically purged of those heretical elements of the society by the representatives of the Holy Ordos. The stakes would burn for many years to come. The enemy forces were organised under their magistars as self-contained formations, although they would happily ally and fight alongside one another. They were separate entities, each with its own identity and foreign war. They were deployed across the planet to areas that could billet and resupply their forces, as the Archon was not expecting the Imperial Crusaders and had not necessarily stationed them for planetary defence which was a great advantage to the Imperial attack. Slado assigned his various commanders and generals specific objectives to secure. The following are commonly seen as the main decisive theatres of operation, although their description is necessarily brief, as each was a conflict of almost unimaginable hardship, and there were multiple small-scale engagements across the planet. The Western Front Marshal Blackwood proved his worth once more, taking ZB's city swiftly in the first three days. General Scalia, after hard fighting on the ninth day, took Boris High for the Imperium. Lord Militant Kyborn was commanding the largest single Imperial force on the planet, containing vast amounts of armour and had the support of the Titan legions of the Mechanicum deployed in force for the first time. The Arch Enemy had deployed the majority of their mechanised forces on the Western Plains and for nine days the two armies would manoeuvre and then unleash massive grinding assaults against one another. As word broke of the conquest of Boris Hive, the conflict for the Western Continent culminated in the largest set piece battle of the invasion of Balhut and possibly of the whole crusade when reinforced by fourth wave troops from orbit, Kyborn swept up the Luminar Estuary with his massed armoured columns and the Titan legions catching the enemy war host in the throat of Ascension Valley. What followed was a 16 hour straight up gun line fight. The battle for Ascension Valley was extremely bloody and vicious with the two armies throwing themselves at each other in a battle of annihilation that would determine who controlled the western plains between the major settlements. Eventually the Imperial forces utterly annihilated the enemy war host of Magistar Kull and Kyborn declared the western continent pacified and under imperial jurisdiction. The Southern Front The refineries of Gateria were taken by General Sultan, almost entirely intact, during the first day. General Oliphant's attack on the Tark Islands was not as successful and extremely bloody. The Tark Islands were the location of most of the planet's gas mines and refineries and along with Gateria provided the majority of Balhut's energy resources. It was found that almost every island had been fortified which resulted in massive casualties as the Imperial forces were forced to launch opposed landings on each. The casualty figure was far greater than it should have been as in a terrible instance three bulk lifters were provided with incorrect navigational information, landing from orbit over the sea, right in front of the defensive coastal batteries of the Tark Islands. All three were destroyed by arch enemy fire and resulted in the deaths of 9,500 men, 
Oliphant continued the assault despite this catastrophe. As the fighting continued, losses mounted, and to Oliphant's horror, two of the planet's largest gas mines were ignited, most likely by the enemy attempting to deny them to the Imperium. These fires caused planet-altering damage, and to this day have altered the climate of the Southern Hemisphere, and in some areas are still burning. General Oliphant, horrified at what had occurred and his failure to take the islands cleanly, resigned his command and would commit suicide three years later. The Northern Front The taking of Bellopolis was one of the most bloody engagements of the invasion. General Curl's forces landed and began the attack on the city and found themselves faced by the fanatical followers of Magistar Sholan Skara with his corn-worshipping skull-takers, the Kith. In a campaign of intense engagements, the battle for Bellopolis was extraordinary as these fanatics extracted a bloody price for every inch of ground to the cries of blood for the blood god. I have never seen such fury, nor such devastation. Every street corner is a last stand, every hab stack an apocalypse. I have seen epic battles in the street, fighting as desperate and violent as any combat undertaken by men, and yet each one is quickly eclipsed and forgotten by the next. General Curl at Balhut. Two days into the fighting, Curl was grievously wounded and replaced by General Corson, who died the next day. Marshal Burns took command and fell five hours later. No other senior officer could make it to the front, and command fell to the most senior officer remaining on the scene, Commander Makaroth. Slado, deeply engaged at the oligarchy, feared for the situation, and most likely considered it a lost cause. Upon hearing of the intensity of the resistance, and the massive losses which had splintered the Imperial forces across the city. He immediately promoted Makaroth and brevetted him to the rank of Marshal, stating, in order that so young a fellow might receive adequate respect from the men at this thankless hour. Five days later, enemy resistance finally began to break and Makaroth was able to rally Imperial forces and push onwards into the city. Most men knew nothing more than what was happening in the immediate vicinity as amid the fire and turmoil every man's world closed down to the few metres of space around him there was little to and little to know except death. Statement from an unknown veteran of the Bellopolis assault. Makarov displayed his brilliance in this period, pulling victory from the jaws and axes of defeat managing to overrun and annihilate the followers of the Blood God. How he achieved this is not fully clear, but as his later career was to attest, Makarov trusted his instincts and ignored contrary information, meaning he took risks that others would not and was able to open up opportunities for victory, which more hidebound commanders would never consider. On the ninth day after the invasion began, Makarov drove through banks of chlorine gas, which had been released in desperation by the last remaining kith, and stormed their remaining strongholds in the central wards of the city. When Slado heard of the turnaround in fortunes, he was reportedly struck mute with great admiration. With this great victory, Makarov's credentials as a commander of note and hero of the Balhut invasion was apparent to all. The oligarchy is the chief city and planetary capital of Balhut, and was the most heavily defended target. Slado led the attack here himself. His force was the second largest after Kaiborn's massive army deployed to the Western Plains, and included the White Scar and Silver Guard forces, whose presence would prove essential in the intense fighting within the city's environs and in breaking open the heavily fortified defences and strongholds covering every artery of the city. Despite the presence of large numbers of Adaptus Astartes, Imperial casualties deployed to the assault on the oligarchy were massive, with all of the forces deployed to this front losing anywhere between 32 to, in some cases, 84% of their fighting strength in the initial landing or one of the various stages of the battle. 
The oligarchy was defended by the personal cult army of Archon Nadzibar, the war host of Magistar Kol Koresh, and a new army of woe machines under the command of Magistar Heritor Asphodel. The defences of the city were vast and strong. The orbital bombardment had had the unintended consequence of turning the hinterland approaches to the city into a desert of mud, rubble and craters. Storms also erupted in this region, which either resulted from the destruction unleashed on the area or by vile sorcery. This hindered the advance from the start, as Imperial forces were forced to move grindingly slow through this morass of ruin, with many being sucked down into the mud lakes which formed, or caught and destroyed by arch enemy forces when they became stuck. Additionally, chemical agents appeared to be present in the atmosphere, forcing the Imperials to use heavy rebreather units when not occupying a sealed vehicle which further hampered the movement and effectiveness of the individual soldiers. Despite this, the attack rolled on, and the first breakthrough in the enemy line came on the fifth day, when the White Scars routed Magistar Kalesh's forces at the Hollow Wall, and killed him during a four-hour gun battle through the cloisters of the Cyrene Palace. The Imperial Army was in. On day 7, the Silver Guard, led by Chapter Master Vegan, broke the line of the Emancipatory, but were countered and held by Magistar Heritor's woe machines until Slado unleashed a mass armoured assault on the breakpoint involving the Pardus 12th, Katzog 18th, 21st, and 22nd, the Mariana 18th, and the 2nd Vitrium Mobile. Chapter Master Vergum continued the advance taking the Emancipatory and the Monastery of St. Kyrgios, with the Volpul 50th Blue Bloods, the Praga 10th and the Kolstek 477th in support. The same day, the Jantine Patricians and the Mordian Iron Guard 11th took the precinct of the Oligarchy, but were counter-attacked and forced out three hours later. They attacked again the next day and retook this position. Slado now drove for the Oligarchy Gate. Captain Alintis of the Silver Guard led the assault with the Adaptus Astartes, but they were cut down by war machines and their attacks stalled. By fortune and tenacity, the Hyken 8th, supporting the main attack, managed to fight their way through to the gate itself, and, led by a Commissar Ibram Gaunt, blew wide the gateway, which had at this point resisted three days of attack. The Silver Guard, the Colstic Hammers, and four other armoured divisions joined the Hykens and sped through the breach, taking the Tower of the Plutarch after heavy fighting. Slado himself advanced on Archon Nedzibar in his last point of resistance, the High Palace, with his personal bodyguard and eight regiments. But the price of taking Balhut seems to have hit Slado heavily. I never saw him look so fatigued. For there ever had been a fire in his eyes and now it seemed long gone. Statement from an unknown veteran officer of the oligarchy front. When Colonel Helmond of the Pragar Regiment stated that the palace will be ours sir, but for a few thousand more lives, Slado replied, start with mine, and took up his blade and personally led the first attack. Firefights took place throughout the once regal palace with the fight for the water garden lasting four hours. At some point Slado received a serious wound, though by bullet or blade it is unknown. But this would not come to light until after the battle. Slado and Nadzibar met on the Western Palisades, their respective bodyguard forces immediately engaging as the two leaders marched to face one another. Slado believing it was his destiny, Nadzibar sure of his defeat, and hoping to slay the war master and land one final blow to the morale of the crusaders and for the glory of his dark gods. Their fight lasted between 6 and 11 minutes and the followers of each were forced from the chamber due to the intensity of it. Slado received two mortal blows but somehow managed to land one of his own on the arch enemy warlord forcing him to withdraw as his foul life began to flow out of him. The arch enemy, 
and Imperials crashed into each other again, trying to rescue their respective lords. An orgy of violence ensued, as the Imperium purged the last remnants of the enemy, many of whom fell to their knees in mourning of the death of their heathen master. Slado was found, according to some sources, clutching an effigy of the saint. It was clear that he was dying and no medical aid could stop that. The Archon's corpse was found later by Imperial forces under the bodies of his palanquin bearers who had attempted to escape. And with that, Archon Nadzibar, Lord of the Sabbat Worlds and Chosen of the Chaos Gods, was finally slain. And although pacification and small-scale resistance would continue for the next few months across the planet, and the purging of the local population would continue for many months and years, with vigilance against heresy maintained to the current day, the conquest of Balhut was all but complete. I am done, and yet I am undone. Attributed to Slado on his deathbed. While on his deathbed, Slado continued to make arrangements for the crusade. Firstly, he rewarded many of the officers and men who had carried out acts of valour during the conflict. Several regimental commanders were granted the right of conquest, whereby if they managed to conquer a world in the crusade going forth, they would be given it and made governor and their regiment would be granted to them to act as a defence force and as his imperial policy form the new political elite of their new homeworld, to one extent or another, depending upon their inclinations. Commissar Gaunt, in recognition of his actions at the Oligarchy Gate, was given the right of conquest and, additionally, promoted to the rank of Commissar Colonel, and would later be assigned to lead the regiments of the Forest World of Tanith, which would soon be asked to raise forces for the first time. An interesting historical note is that at some point during the chaos of this final confrontation in the High Palace where Slado fell, occurred the first recorded instance of the appearance of the Blood Pact, a force that would go on to plague the Imperium as the Crusade goes on. Sergeant Commodus Ryland of Slado's personal bodyguard was captured by the Blood Pact, although he later managed to escape and make Imperial intelligence aware of their existence. High Command itself began to manoeuvre as thoughts turned to who would succeed the old man as War Master. Many believed it should be them. And this was the problem for Slado as he foresaw the possible disintegration of the Crusade due to political infighting. A strong leader was required to push forward and capitalise on the victory and destroy the now leaderless arch enemy forces which still existed in vast numbers throughout the wider Sabbath worlds. With Balhut conquered, the Imperial gains in the newfound trailing group were secure, aside from those scattered remnant forces which were now moving behind Imperial lines. Multiple options were open to the Imperial commander as to which direction to go next, in order to advance the Crusade. Slado was a hero, and great was the grief across the Imperium and on terror itself, when word reached it of the death of the old man. All knew that such a hero of the Imperium would join the Emperor and stand beside his golden throne with those other martyrs to the cause of mankind, and would continue to fight for the Emperor against the forces of darkness, until the end of the universe. Slado had succeeded in giving the Imperium a shining example of Imperial might and will to push back the darkness and restore glory to the Imperium in this dark would continue for years, both in terms of its economic and industrial resources and defences. It would go on to act as a staging world, but also a relief world, whereby veteran regiments would be rotated out of the front line to regroup and retrain. Balhut was a strategic world, so its security was paramount in case a swift force of the arch enemy managed to slip past the front line and retake it. The population would continue to be monitored for signs of heresy going forward, but its population would increase vastly because of the imperial forces that would be deployed there, as well as the logistical networks and the staff they brought with them. 
Several large forces and notorious Chaos Commanders managed to escape the fall of Balhut. These included Sholan Skara and his remaining kith, and, to the future regret of Vervenhive, Heritor Asphodel fled the oligarchy several days before Nadzibar's fall. Both would prove threats to the Imperium for years to come. As the Imperium occupied the whole of the planet, the true horror that had occurred on the world became apparent. Although there were almost countless instances of heresy on the world, and the acts of corruption and vile ritual were immense, the two most notable examples were the murder camps of Sholan Skara, which existed purely to satisfy his followers' genocidal tendencies on thousands of living subjects. The discovery of these sites broke the minds of many of the Imperial personnel who found them, and drove others to relentlessly pursue the perpetrators of such evil. Episode 6 Tanith The High Lords of Terror, lauding the great victory of Warmaster Slado's efforts on Kulan, tasked him with raising a crusade force to liberate the Sabbat Worlds, a cluster of nearly 100 inhabited systems along the edge of Segmentum Pacificus. From a massive fleet deployment, nearly a billion Imperial Guard advanced into the Sabbat Worlds, supported by forces of the Adeptus Astartes and the Adeptus Mechanicus with whom Slado had formed cooperative packs. After ten hard-fought years of advance, Slado's great victory came at Balhut, where he opened the way to drive a wedge into the heart of the Sabbath worlds. But there, Slado fell. Bickering and rivalry then beset his officers as they vied to take his place. Lord High Militant General Drevere was an obvious successor, had chosen the young commander Makaroth. With Makaroth as war master, the crusade force pushed on into its second decade and deeper into the Sabbath worlds, facing theatres of war that began to make Balhut seem like a mere opening skirmish. From a history of the later Imperial Crusades, the arrogance of the man is matched only by his incompetence. This decision, which he seeks to foist upon us, demonstrates he simply does not understand what is out there, or what it will take to vanquish it. Lord Militant Kyborn, prior to the Cabal salient advance. The Cabal systems is a worthy goal, but perhaps due consideration might be given to the steps along that path, which manifestly are worthy goals in themselves. General Kelso, prior to the Cabal salient advance. From the War Master to all militant commanders, it has been made known that some commanders of men believe miscalculations have been made in the aftermath of Balhus regarding the strategic response to the arch enemy's retreat. Any officers with such misgivings are invited to attend me personally as soon as possible to present the nature of their concerns fully and completely. Makaroth at the start of the Cabal salient advance. Makaroth had been installed as War Master, but Imperial High Command was not united behind this change. Many thought him arrogant, many thought him inexperienced. Many felt slighted that so junior and unworthy an individual had been propelled through the ranks and given command of one of the greatest Imperial forces currently assembled in the galaxy. A truly once-in-a-lifetime situation, and the opportunity for glory and power was felt by some to be misplaced in Makarov. But being Slado's pick for leadership, the vast majority of the High Command acceded to the wishes of the old man. Additionally, the High Lords of Terror agreed to the ascension of Makarov, so on paper the situation was settled. But behind the scenes conflict remained, Many believed Makarov was making bad strategic decisions. Many believed that they should replace him still. Despite this, and aside from some cliques and factionalism within the Crusade command structure, Makarov more or less secured his position and control over the armies and resources of the Crusade. Following the Imperial victory on Balhut, a small, when compared to the host that had fought on the planet, but still relatively considerable force of the archenemy, managed to escape the system. 
These forces consisted of the remnants of the Chaos Fleet, which had been smashed and scattered by the initial Imperial assault on Balhut, who had then rallied and managed to extract arch-enemy ground forces from the surface, risking the Imperial blockade surprisingly successfully. These fleets varied in size and scattered into smaller groups as they fled the system. Some of the more significant enemy forces which had broken loose from Balhut managed to slip behind the Crusades' lines and began striking at many of the worlds recently conquered by the Imperium. In addition to these splintered remnants of Nadzibar's combined war host, many other forces of archenemy troops had been en route to reinforce their Archon from deeper within the Sabbat Cluster, and, hearing of his death, began to launch their own campaigns deep into Imperial territory, while the majority of the Crusades' fleet assets were gathering at Balhut. Small warbands and full-blown armies, individual Chaos raiding ships and full-scale fleets rampaged through the newfound trailings group, slaughtering the inhabitants of whole worlds, putting others to the torch or simply hunting out Imperial installations and massacring their garrisons, cutting supply lines as they sought vengeance, safety, or, for the more intelligent amongst them, to regroup with other arch-enemy forces in order to repel the crusade when it attempted to advance further within their territory. Only scattered patrol fleets and garrisons of second-rate Imperial Guard occupation forces opposed them, as Makarov sought to gather the greater part of his strength for a drive towards the Cabal systems. Warmaster Makarov was accused of not consolidating the aftermath of Balhut, but it is evident consolidation was his primary aim. He simply did not consolidate in the way Slade might have done. That is to say, he did not order an incremental system-by-system -system securement of the immediate territory, coupled with a firm prosecution of the fleeing enemy forces, before pushing on from a stabilised base against the next line of dispute. Makarov knew Slater had set the enemy running and wished to capitalise on this weakness by thrusting forward boldly on the hunt, instead of labouring to tidy up loose ends. The Cabal system zone, ringed as it was by the infamous Fortress Worlds, would be a gargantuan trophy to take, and Makarov sought to bring the Crusade into striking distance of the Cabal group before the arch enemy could gain advantage by gathering at that point. Makarov was well aware that the forces of the Runa's powers had lost their Archon. They lacked genuine centralised authority, and Makarov's hope was to drive the devastating lance into their very heart by making an orchestrated move that none of the scattered enemy sections could predict, or rally against swiftly enough. In short, he did not wish to waste time and manpower clearing the disorganised, scattered components of the enemy, but rather strike at the centre. As he wrote, I will aim my strike to the head, not the limbs. No one, not the arch enemy, nor even Makarov's generals and marshals, expected him to drive the Crusade spinewards across two major system groups to the threshold of the Cabal systems. So that's precisely what he did. Excerpt from To the Head, Not the Limbs, in Barheen, Tactical Imperatives. Many of the High Command objected to this move, and dissension was rife, as well as conspiracy. Not only did they object to allowing so many of the enemy to advance and slaughter Imperial worlds left almost defenceless to these splinter forces, but the Cabal worlds themselves were a vast and heavily guarded territory, surrounded by legend legendary fortress worlds. To get there, a vast advance was organised, to push through and create a large front along the border of the Cabal worlds, which would then launch multiple assaults simultaneously in echo of Slado's original operation Red Drake, which broke open the newfound trailing group. To get to this point, large stretches of the remaining newfound trailing group's central belt would need to be conquered, and where they remained in Imperial hands, liberated. In addition to these newfound trailing worlds, the Crusade would need to take the Menazoi Clasp and the Khan group. Warmaster Makarov, like Slado, set his mind to a single overriding objective and began to mobilise the might of the Sabbat Crusades to that end, 
For Slado, it had been the central capital world of Balhut. Although the organisation and execution of the Crusade and the great feats accomplished leading to the victory of Balhut, set Slado apart in the annals of Imperial history as a truly great hero of the Imperium. Makarov decided upon an arguably more ambitious objective, the reconquest of the entirety of the Cabal systems. One of the many worlds lost as a result of Makarov's decision to press forward rather than waste time and resources hunting down enemy forces that had slipped behind the Crusades front line was the forest world of Tanith. Editor's Note Up to this point, this history is drawn primarily from the Crusade archives and no sanctioned academic works from scholars, as well as memoirs and biographies from officers and other Imperial officials, which, following correct censoring, have been made widely available to the general population, as well as more technical works utilised for the training of new and future officers and other specialists. From this point onwards, however, this history will utilise these official histories, as well as the regimental histories, from the TANF First and those other regiments and agencies involved in the same actions. Additionally, it will include personal records and after-action reports that exist from the same. The TANF First, under the command of Colonel Commissar Ibram Gaunt, were to prove pivotal in a number of crucial engagements and through their experience we can explore the true scale and sacrifice of this glorious crusade to retake the Sabbath worlds in the name of him on Earth. Tanith was a relatively lightly populated planet in the Sabbath worlds, which had not fallen to chaos when Imperial authority broke down and the Arch Enemy spread its influence throughout the cluster. Along with other worlds, it continued unbroken in its loyalty to Terra, and even interplanetary trade continued despite the breakdown of Imperial authority in the region and the Sector Governor being forced to flee, as well as the end of the Civitas Imperialis. Tanif's only notable export was Nalwood, a highly valuable lumber. The planet had a relatively small-scale lumber operation sh shipping this wood across the Imperium, where it was highly valued by the upper echelons of Imperial society who purchased it for inclusion in their villas, throne rooms and other visible locations as signs of status due to the expense of shipping the wood from this distant corner of the galaxy. Although a mark of wealth, it was rightly considered an excellent material with a great beauty when shaped by skilled carpenters. Now wood trees are similar to pine trees which are common across the Imperium since the Great Diaspora when that first great wave of human colonisation seeded so many worlds with the fauna and life forms from humanity's birthplace. Now wood trees, however, were not static and through some means were able to move and it is speculated that these trees were pursuing the sun or some other climatic event. This meant that regularly the forests of the world would change position and it is postulated that this contributed to the TANIF's ability to unerringly sense direction and memorise geographical features due to living in continuously shifting environments which then entered the gene pool more generally and became a trait. No extant research has been conducted on the origins of Nalwood or its relationship to the TANIF population so it is not clear whether this ability to move was a natural development through the evolution of an existing Terran breed of tree or a mutation brought about by, by artificial means, perhaps during the terraforming process, or whether it was brought by the original colonists at all and perhaps was a native tree that had developed independently from human intervention. The collection of Nalwood lumber and the production of worked Nalwood items was the planet's main industry and many of the future ghosts, if not former hunters, worked in the logging industry, as it was the planet's main export. TANIF did have a reasonable technological and industrial standard, able to produce all of the items required for humanity to lead a comfortable existence, without constant resupply from neighbouring worlds. Which, in any event, it was isolated from being situated along the spinewood border of the Sabbat Cluster, and a fair distance from the main trade and warp routes of the newfound trailings group, 
When chaos came to the Sabbath cluster, life on Tanith remained largely unaffected, except for, we must presume, the occasional lost cargo hauler. Tanith's permanent settlements sat enclosed within vast stone walls, which the Nalwood trees would be forced to move around. The capital city was Tanith Magna, which was walled in this way, and housed the planetary government and the planet's spaceport. Individual families and small communities did live in the forest themselves, and were attenuated to the constant movement of the trees, perhaps building settlements near geographical features that would be avoided by the Nalwood. These communities would be involved in agriculture, farming and lumbering. Settlements existed along the coasts of Tanith and concerned themselves with fishing and, we must speculate, possibly the collection of Prometheum, similar to other imperial worlds with a need to generate their own energy to support their infrastructure and cities. The last guns issued to the Tanith appear to have been manufactured on the world as they had now irreplaceable Nalwood stocks. As the Crusade progressed, these LAS rifles from the founding would be replaced by those produced on other worlds. The same in every aspect, but lacking this one final link to lost Tanith. The government of Tanith was an aristocratic republican system, where an elector was elected by his peers to rule. Such systems of government are allowed on worlds where draconian measures are not required to ensure the population remains loyal, orderly and productive, and are fairly common on lightly populated or agri and low industrial worlds. As Slado advanced his forces into the newfound trailing group, Tanith, like other worlds, was brought fully back into the Imperial fold. But like other worlds liberated by the Crusade, it now needed to provide the Imperium with resources to be fed into the campaign to propel it onwards and lessen the burden on the highly strained and extended supply lines from outside the Sabbath Cluster. The Administratum determined that Tanif's tithe would be increased and paid by the raising of Imperial Guardsmen to fight for the liberation of the rest of the Cluster. Initially, Tanif would raise three regiments of light infantry to serve the Crusade. What future plans the Administratum had for Tanif to pay their tithe is at this point redundant, but Colonel Commissar Gaunt had plans to raise additional forces from the world once this initial founding had been bloodied and tested on the Crusade's front lines. The Tanif were beginning to recruit and train these regiments as Warmaster Slado launched his attack on Balhut. Following the great victory and Makarov's ascension to Warmaster, the need for fresh troops was great, and an experienced officer was dispatched from the Crusade command to help lead and shape these foundling troops. Marked for greatness and later honoured by Slado on his deathbed for his feats of valour with the Hierakan VIII at the Oligarchy Gate, which saw the breach of the last main defence of the city, allowing the final assault on Nadzibar in the High Palace the following day. Despite, or perhaps because he was honoured by Slado, and promoted to the rare rank of Colonel Commissar, and even given the rights of settlement for a world he conquered, Gaunt was now considered a political liability within the upper echelons of High Command. Seen as one of Slado's chosen, he was not looked upon kindly by Warmaster Makarov who was swiftly placing his own chosen and trusted officers into positions of command and slowly removing dissenters and those not considered fully committed to the new order. This is perhaps why Gaunt accepted the command of the Tanith. Gaunt entered the Tanith system on board the frigate Navair and entered orbit along with several transport vessels. Making immediate landfall, he ordered that the men should be embarked immediately, wishing to be away from this forest world as quickly as possible and back to the front. It was this decision which resulted in there being any Tanith survivors. The Tanith regiments being formed were light infantry primarily, and the Minotaurum's assessment had highlighted their stealth and scouting abilities as specialities. The regiments were formed and organised along standard Imperial Guard lines. The training they received covered all of the necessities of life within the Guard, including lessons and training with various forms of standard issue weaponry, as well as learning squad tactics and larger strategy. 
Despite what some may consider savage cultural norms such as tattooed faces and piercings, the ghosts themselves were fairly well educated and literate people with a good understanding of the universe and of their place in it. Like all loyal citizens of the Imperium, they were devoted to the God Emperor, but their culture appears to have lacked some of the more zealous aspects of Imperial faith, which many Imperial commanders will vouch is sometimes a double-edged sword when it comes to organised warfare. Together with their innate stealthiness and abilities learned from their forest world upbringing, the ghosts utilised cameline cloaks, made of a material which blended into their surroundings, which coupled with the ghost's abilities, made them adept at hiding from view in most environments, from heavily forested to heavily urbanised zones. Having met the planetary government and elector, and gone through the ceremonial formalities from such an occasion, Gaunt was brought the shocking news that an enemy fleet had entered the system and was heading for Tanith. With due consideration for the forces at his disposal and the size of the arch enemy force closing on the undefended planet, Gaunt elected to continue to load as many men as possible upon the transports and leave the world with what he could salvage. As the arch enemy unleashed its fire on Tanith, the world burned. The atmosphere was stripped and the vast seas of forests were turned into a terrible inferno. Landings of arch enemy troops occurred in multiple locations and primarily at Tanif Magna, where the local militia and those green troops who could not be evacuated from the planet were smashed by the enemy and the population was butchered. Heading to the spaceport to reach the last shuttle with his adjutant Sim, Gaunt ran into arch enemy soldiers and the ensuing combat saw Sim die. Gaunt was rescued in this moment by a civilian aide who had been assigned to care for him during his stay and also to play the planet's trademark instrument, the Tanif Pipes, as part of a tradition for all strangers and visitors. This civilian, a teenage Bryn Milo, manned a heavy bolter and slew Gorn's assailants, and with the boy in tow, they boarded the shuttle and fled the world. With Gorn on board, the Nevea, which had held station a great risk in orbit as the Chaos Fleet launched its assault on Tanith, and the small flotilla with its last remnants of the Tanif population fled the system. Colonel Commissar Ibram Gaunt Gaunt gained his promotion and command from Slado for his actions on Balhut while leading a force of the Hyken Eighth in a successful strike on the Oligarchy Gate. Following a counter-attack by the woe machines of Herator Asphodel forcing back the Astartes of the Silver Guard with heavy casualties. The Hykans, with the Emperor's protection, penetrated the arch enemy lines, reached the gate, blowing it, allowing Slado to drive an armoured wedge of four mechanised divisions and the now vengeful Silver Guard into the very heart of the oligarchy. The following day, the city, the main objective of the planetary assault, had been taken with Slado leading the final attack on the High Palace, receiving mortal wounds, but destroying resistance within the planetary capital, and slaying the Archon, Nadzibar. Gaunt had already been marked for glory by Slado as a rising officer with great potential within the Imperial command structure. On his deathbed, Slado promoted Gaunt to the rank of Colonel, in addition to his commissariat position, and gave him the rights of conquest for a world he conquered, a great honour for any Imperial officer. Upon Makarov's rise to Warmaster and the internal politicking of High Command, Gaunt was offered the opportunity of command of the new founding of Guard Regiments from the relatively unremarkable world of Tanith, which before its destruction he believed could be moulded into a new and large force of light infantry with which he could gain great glory and aid the Crusade in the wars ahead. Unfortunately, with the destruction of Tanith, Gaunt was stuck with half of the troops he originally envisioned, and no way of replenishing their number. Additionally, the morale of the men of Tanith had taken an obvious hit from the burning of their homeworld, and the knowledge that all they knew was lost, and that they were all that remained of their people. Although the first few years were difficult, to say the least, Gaunt, through a show of martial valour and excellent leadership, 
earned the loyalty and trust of the men of Tanith, even if some understandable ill will remained over the whole situation. Gaunt crafted a disciplined and highly skilled fighting force, which could easily have fallen into nihilistic despair given the circumstances of their formation. Gaunt's command style was highly influenced by his apprenticeship to Commissar General Delane Oktar, who took Gaunt on as a cadet. Oktar and Gaunt served with the Hyken regiments, and particularly the 8th, leading them through many engagements on multiple worlds prior to and then during the Sabbat Crusade. These were formative years for Gaunt's education as a political officer, but also as an imperial officer and leader of men. He learned how to get the best from soldiers as a leader and to act as a symbol of imperial bravery and honour. But also, as a commissar, he was the hand of judgement for those who failed the ultimate test of loyalty. Unlike many commissars, Oktar was not given to motivating men through fear, and this lesson was passed on to Gaunt through his time with the Eighth, and would serve him well in leading the Tanith first, earning their trust and loyalty in the years of conflict following their calamitous foundation. Oktar taught Gaunt the need for strong command structure, led by exceptional officers selected upon merit, unit cohesiveness, recognising the individual qualities of soldiers, and leading from the front. Oktar specialised in turning regiments into elite fighting formations, and the lessons he imparted can be seen realised in the effectiveness of the Tanith first and only. Oktar was also a commissar who, unlike many of his colleagues, rarely resorted to the bolter and the firing squad to boost morale and ensure steadfastness. Believing that it was the commissar's role to not only instill fear of failure and the consequences of disobedience and treason, but to inspire the soldiery to feats of valour through example. Winning is everything, but the trick is to know where the winning really is. We're political animals, Ibram. Through us, if we do our job properly, the black and white of war is tempered. We are the interpreters of combat, the translators. We give meaning to war, subtlety, purpose even. Killing is the most abhorrent, mindless profession known to man, our role is to fashion the killing machine of the human species into a positive force, for the Emperor's sake, for the sake of our own conscience. Commissar General Delane Oktar Gaunt was selected to be a Commissar after displaying desirable traits while in the Scholar Progenia. He was sent there following the death of his father, his mother having died early in his life. His father was second in command to General Aldo Darcius during the Greenskin invasion of Cantor, and as would later be revealed to Gaunt, betrayed and left his father and his unit to be surrounded and slaughtered by the Greenskins, in order to preserve his career in the face of Imperial reverses during the campaign. Later in life, Gaunt would learn the truth of his father's death, would seek out General Darcius, a man he once considered his uncle, and in a chainsaw duel on the planet Keed 1173, would slay this man, he as a commissar, had sentenced to death for cowardice, and in return received a near mortal blow from a chainsword across the stomach. Darcius was a native of Jantnor Mendus and a powerful member of the Jant nobility. This was the homeworld of the Jantine patricians, a proud and famous regiment which, for 15 generations, had provided elite soldiers to the Imperium's armies. The patricians are heavy shock infantry who dressed in gold and purple dress uniforms and in war were equipped with heavy armour including ornate cuirasses. For 15 generations they had gained glory for the throne and for Jant, but the execution of General Aldo Darcius was a black mark on their honour. The Jantine patricians would not forget. Following Darcius' death, his positions and estate were stripped from his family and posterity. His family's name was wiped from Jant's records, such was the horror at this mark on their military prestige. Darcius' old regiment adopted his now orphan and destitute son, who took the name Draker Flans, eventually rising to the rank of Colonel of the regiment, and, along with his men, held a deep hatred and urge for vengeance for Ibram Gaunt. Gaunt gained the knowledge of his father's death while serving as a cadet under Oktar. Inquisitorial records show that it was during the Darandara pacification while serving with the Hykens. 
Once the rebellion on the world had been crushed, Imperial forces moved to consolidate their grip, and the members of the Emperor's Holy Ordos began interrogating the captured members of the leadership to root out heresy. Inquisitor de Fay requested Cadet Gorn's assistance in the interrogation of one prisoner, a female psyker, who refused to cooperate with de Fay, stating she would only speak to Gaunt. This girl was a member of the world's elite and de Fay believed she knew the secrets of why Darandara had fallen to rebellion. And being one of the more enlightened servants of the throne, de Fay believed it worth letting her speak to Gaunt and perhaps gaining knowledge this way rather than risking the more direct methods of interrogation he had available to him. Gaunt met this girl and during her traumatic psycho experience she divulged many truths that would not become apparent until later in life. But she did tell him the reason for his father's death, which Darcius had used his influence to successfully cover up. It would be years later that Gaunt gained his vengeance, when the two were by chance deployed to crush the tribal rebellion on Keed 1173, and many years after that until the other utterances of this psycho girl in the cell on Darandara were truly understood. The frigate Navea had been assigned to Gaunt as the flagship of the small transport fleet that had been intended to carry the new TANF regiments and their equipment and supplies back to the front. Now with only 3,500 TANF having been evacuated from the surface, with the items they were carrying on their backs, a deputation met with Gaunt on board the Navea. Fifteen men had been selected to speak for the rest, and Gaunt requested that they choose three of their number. The three selected were Ilham Rawn, Colm Corbick and the young Bryn Milo. The discussion was heated. The men were not happy to have lost their world and understandably some of their anger was directed at Gaunt for leaving their world to die despite the certain death it would have meant for them all. They had lost their chance to fight for their people, their world. Gaunt made clear to them that they were now oath-sworn Imperial Guardsmen and their duty was to fight the enemies of man, not die in a hopeless battle. You're not men of Tanith anymore. You weren't when you were camped out on the founding fields. You're Imperial Guard, servants of the Emperor first and nothing else second. I mourn the loss of any world, any life. I did not want to see Tanith die, nor did I want to abandon it. But my duty is to the Emperor and the Sabbat World's Crusade must be fought and won for the good of the entire Imperium. The only thing you could have done if I had left you on Tanith was die. If that's what you want, I can provide you with many opportunities. What I need is soldiers, not corpses. Use your loss. Don't be crippled by it. Put the passion into your fighting spirit. Think hard. Most men who join the Guard never see their homes again. You were no different. Most can look forward to living through a campaign and mustering to settle on some world their leader has conquered and won. Slado made me a gift after Balhut. He gave me a military rank of colonel and granted me settlement rights to the first planet I win. Help me by doing your job and I'll help you by sharing that with you. Commissar Colonel Gaunt, following the flight from Tanith. With no officers surviving the evacuation, Gaunt promoted Corbeck to Colonel and Rawn to Major and took Milo on as his adjutant. They were ordered to select squad leaders and reorganise the men as well as motivate them. They were now the Tanif first and only and as the sniper Larkin would quip later on, Gaunt's ghosts. Colonel Colm Corbeck was a big man with natural charisma whom the surviving ghosts rallied around. He taught Gaunt the culture of Tanith, insisting that he wear the camo cloak like the rest of them, and along with Scout Sergeant McCall, instructed him in the Tanith way of war. In battle, he was highly skilled and courageous, leading from the front. With no airs or graces, he would live amongst the troops and became a father figure for the regiment. In the early days, with resentment to Gaunt high, he would lend his support to his new commander, seeing that to survive the wars ahead, the Tanith must be united. Major Rawn was a sly, lean and vicious character, perfect material for the Imperial Guard. 
He was the predominant leader of the malcontents within the regiment. Later, after many battles and close shaves, he would gain a grudging respect for Gaunt, particularly after he saved his life several times. He swore that he would kill Gaunt one day, but the rage over the loss of Tanif appears to have waned in the following years. He is a respected but feared commander of the regiment now. None doubts his skill nor risk opposing him. He is devoted to the first and only, and is willing to throw himself into the fight if it means slaying the arch enemy. Bryn Milo was a civilian pipe player and guide in Tanif Magna, assigned to Gaunt during his visit during the regimental foundation. As the world fell to chaos, Milo saved Gaunt from arch enemy soldiers. Gaunt took the boy with him, meaning he was the only civilian to escape the world. He became Gaunt's adjutant, serving him well as an aide and also providing insights into the mood of the men and their culture. Milo began to exhibit a somewhat disturbing prescience, able to accurately predict when an enemy attack or an odd situation would occur. This would cause problems later, as such things are closely monitored by Imperial authorities, from the potential dangers of having a rogue psyker within the ranks. But it was never proved that he did in fact bear the abhorrent psyker gene. After several years of service as Gorn's aide, Milo reached the age where he could join the regiment fully and his time with the commander proved useful, giving him a natural authority amongst the men, but also keen combat instincts. He became a mascot of the regiment, although this lessened somewhat with his induction to full trooper. But he acted as a reminder of lost Tanith, as the ghosts marched to battle or reclined on bunks travelling between worlds, Milo's Tanith pipes could be heard playing the songs of their lost homeworld and people in joy and in sorrow. Gaunt, having barely survived the annihilation of Tanith and a potential mutiny from the despairing survivors, prepared to lead these shaken and still untested soldiers into their first engagement of the Crusade. Black Shard The planet Black Shard was the first battlefront the Ghosts were assigned to following the fall of Tanith, and would be their proving ground to Gaunt after weeks of reorganisation and training on board their transports. The Ghosts were ordered to aid in the attack on the old citadel of Blackshard in support of the 10th Royal Sloka, a regiment of heavy infantry who wore heavy spiked bronze plate armour reminiscent of the techno-barbarians of legend. The Ghosts agreed to act as the lead element as the terrain was muddy and infiltration of the citadel relied on using tunnels. Imperial intelligence estimated that a force of around 17,000 cultists along with an undetermined strength of unconventional forces, such as the dreaded Spawn, were dug deep into the ruins of the old citadel. Artillery would provide cover for the Imperial advance, and the Ghosts would use the tunnel systems to infiltrate the enemy positions, with the Royal Sloka ready to reinforce any beachhead. The Ghosts' advance went well, and after some heavy but brief engagements with the cultists, they found themselves holding a large temple within the citadel. This temple housed a foul shrine to Chaos, and Gaunt ordered it destroyed with demo charges. Rawn and Gaunt stayed behind to rig the explosives as the rest of the Ghosts withdrew. It is postulated from Tanith veterans that some kind of altercation took place between the two, but neither has added anything to the official record. The explosion that followed was greater than expected, or than it should have been given the amount of explosives used, suggesting an unleashing of dark forces. The effect on the arch enemy was instant. With the shrine destroyed, they all, to a man, committed suicide. And instantly, the war for Blackshard was over. A wounded Gaunt reached the Imperial lines 20 minutes after the explosion, carrying an unconscious Major Rawn on his shoulder. General Hadrak commander of the front, received credit for the victory, but did offer high praise and acknowledge the role of Gaunt's ghosts in the victory, noting in particular their stealth abilities. Voltmund After their victory at Blackshard, the war for Voltmund would be bitter for the ghosts. It was on this world that the ghosts would first encounter the royal Volpoon, and their future notorious commander, Lord General Notches Sturm. Sturm had active command of the theatre and had requested the ghost presence as the battle for the planet was dragging on due to the ancient and powerfully constructed defences of Voltman's capital. 
Volsis City. The Royal Blue Bloods are a highly skilled and renowned regiment of heavy infantry, drawn from the world of Volpoon. The regiment selects its members from the nobility of the world and committed multiple regiments to the Sabbat Crusade. Although their fighting prowess is rightly respected, the Volpoon are also known for their supreme arrogance and distaste for other regiments, made of what they consider to be low-born peasants. They consider themselves the noblest regiment in the Imperial Guard, and are not afraid of telling others so. This leads to conflict with some regiments, and the Volpoon take a dislike to any force which is not, in their opinion, civilised. Stern believed the introduction of stealth and infiltration experts like the Ghosts, who had achieved great acclaim for their almost single-handed destruction of the enemy hosts on Blackshard, would be able to break the stalemate of the siege. The enemy was led by Chantha, a corn champion, who, as well as having a force of experienced cultists at his command, also had a contingent of traitor Astartes, the dreaded World Eater Berserkers. The cultists were bloated, wretched creatures, heavily armed and uniformed in robes soaked in vats of blood. The ghosts were ordered to rendezvous with the Katzog Serpent's 17th Armoured Regiment before making their way to the siege lines of Voltis City. The Katzog Regiment is recognisable for painting their tanks with turquoise and gold feathers, the feathered serpent being an emblem of their world. En route, the ghost scouts detected a sizeable chaos warband in the woodlands and began to pursue. They caught up with them as they were launching an ambush on the Ketzog Regiment, which, consisting of basilisk tanks and other armoured artillery and transports moving in column, was facing annihilation by a foe, which consisted of seven World Eater traitor marines, who were carving up the tanks and their crews, who aside from the pintle-mounted weapons of their tanks and sidearms, had no defence against the gene-wrought and corrupted worshippers of the Blood God. The ghosts attacked immediately, and with overwhelming fire managed to slay the surprised traitor Astartes. Although casualties had been taken, the Ketzog had been rescued from almost certain destruction by the ghosts' intervention. Both regiments moved onwards to Voltis City, and then to their assigned positions, the Ketzog to provide artillery cover to infantry advancing on the city, and the ghosts to attack the Watergate on the city's flank to either create a breach in the vast walls or gain a beachhead within. The enemy defended this weak point heavily, knowing its vulnerability. After a fierce fight, the ghosts gained entry, but resistance continued within the chutes and tunnels of the Watergate. Realising that the gate would fall, the arch enemy opened the sluices, unleashing hundreds of gallons of water, washing the ghosts out. Although at first it seemed the engagement had been an utter defeat for the ghosts as they scrambled to reassemble through the now submerged plains outside the Watergate, by the Emperor's blessing a force of ghosts slipped through the enemy defenders before the water was unleashed. This force under Sergeant Klugen detonated its demolition charges in some of the cisterns within the walls, blowing a hundred metre section of the wall to pieces. The Volpoon Bluebloods launched an all-out assault on the city immediately taking it after heavy fighting with the corn worshippers. This victory would not have been possible without the breach in the war, but for their efforts the ghosts were punished. Official records believe the incident to be an accident of friendly fire, but based on later events and the accounts of those present, it appears that out of pure spite and distaste for what Sturm considered peasants and savages managing to take a position in a day which his forces had been trying to crack for months, he ordered the Ketzog to fire on the withdrawing Tanith. Despite the Ketzog commander, Ortis, protesting, Sturm ordered the strike. Around 300 Tanif died in the attack, including the hero of Ortis, Sergeant Klugen. As the ghosts approached the siege line, the Ketzog were appalled. Records show that Gaunt struck Major Ortis and was threatened with court-martial by General Sturm. But Ortis would contradict this, stating that his wounds were caused by a misfiring artillery piece, and so spared Gaunt to court-martial. The Imperial forces were withdrawing from Voltis to be replaced by second-rate troops to act as occupation and garrison forces, as per Warmaster Makarov's orders in this phase of the Crusade. When the Ghosts, already loaded on their transport ships, were again, out of spite, ordered back to the surface by General Sturm to assist in the clean-up of the remaining holdout enemy positions. More insult came when the Ketzog were also redeployed to this onerous duty. They were assigned to take the city of Kosdorf, Voltman's second city, 
the city had been decimated when the Chaos Forces invaded and the population massacred. The Chaos Forces holding the city were of unknown number, but were resisting the Imperial advance. This was a depressing time for the Ghosts. After suffering heavy losses from their battle and their later artillery attack, morale was low. Gaunt himself is known to have worried about the choices he had made in accepting the command of the Tanith, and practically ending his career with the command of a remnant force of troops and with few favours amongst high command. No one wanted to be involved in this mop-up operation against these remnant chaos forces, but orders were orders. Gaunt led an expedition to the city and they encountered heavy resistance amongst the ruins of Kosdorf. There appears to have been an element of chaos sorcery involved, drawing upon the fears of the enemy to create manifestations of their deepest thoughts and regrets. The fighting was fierce and the ghosts fought a withdrawal from the city, inflicting heavy casualties on the enemy. This battle went some way to unify the ghosts due to the psychic attack unleashed upon them and the bonding through combat with Gaunt. After extricating themselves and linking up the rest of the first and only, they appear to have had the majority of the arch enemy forces in pursuit when the Ketzog unleashed a mass artillery bombardment upon the area the enemy occupied. The majority of the Chaos forces appear to have been annihilated in this strike, and the dead city of Kosdorf was reclaimed for the Imperium. Ramillies 26843 The conquest of Ramillies was practically over by the time the ghosts were deployed. The Raven Guard of the Adeptus Astartes had struck at the enemy fortresses, annihilating the foe so that the fires from the pyres of their corpses burned for days. The Raven Guard had achieved a victory and had now bigger battles to fight on other worlds, so the ghosts were ordered to hunt down and wipe out those scattered bands of arch-enemy soldiers that had fled before the Emperor's angels. The ghosts hunted down and destroyed these pockets of resistance until it became apparent that there were no more survivors out in the wilderness. But Scout Sergeant McColl believed that something was still out there. Gaunt, trusting in the judgement of the Scoutmaster, allowed the sweeps to continue for a few more days, but if no contact was made with enemy forces, the ghosts would signal mission accomplished and withdraw. McCall deployed his scouts into the wilderness, trying to hunt down this last foe. He picked up the trail eventually. It was large, that was clear. Ramillies has a species of fern which, upon hearing sound, shoots out barbs, and one of McCall's scouts was killed by these. As McCall moved to investigate with Scout Doer, they found the body of Scout Raffle. Unfortunately, in that moment, Raffle's comm bead went off and the sound unleashed a new wave of barbs which skewered Doa's leg. As he screamed, their prey was drawn to the sound and as it stomped into view, McColl recognised it as a Chaos Dreadnought. Its optics had been damaged during the conflict with the Raven Guard and it had shambled into the forest blind and clearly had been stomping around for weeks in the wilderness, using sound alone. It slew Doa, who in terror and pain cried out. McCall, silent like no other, stalked around the blind beast. He used grenades to manoeuvre the bear moth and set his last rifle on the ground. As the dreadnought stalked towards the grenade sound, its foot struck the rifle. It bent down and picked it up in its vicious claw and raised it to its face. McCall had set the rifle to overload and it exploded in front of the beast's sarcophagus, dealing the final amount of damage to crack it, allowing the wave of spines that flew from all around at the sound of the explosion to penetrate its hide and slay the foul abomination within, skewered by hundreds of spines. With the dreadnought slain and chaos purged from the world, McCall gave Gaunt the news that Ramillies was now free from enemy forces, and the ghost withdrew to the next front. Buse of Felon. The world had fallen from within, when Knockout, known as the Blighted and as the Smiling, started a rebellion of his cult army that overthrew the 32 noble families which ruled the world and crucified them, propping their bodies up throughout the city in places where before the family's heraldic displays had once stood proud. Slado himself at the start of the Sabbath Crusade stated that Buse of Felon the noble and honourable world was one of those he was most eager to reclaim for the Imperium. The Imperial siege of the city was dragging on. The arch enemy were dug in and well equipped, 
the defences of the capital were strong. Gaunt attempted to infiltrate the city via the aqueduct, but the enemy anticipated this move, and although the ghosts made good progress and penetrated the city, they would eventually push back. The sniper, known as Mad Larkin, the undisputed best sniper in the regiment, took an opportunity and snuck deeper into the city during the firefight. Knowing his psychological instability, many of his comrades believed he had snapped and deserted, but although suffering from some form of epileptic episode or perhaps being blessed by the Emperor's presence, he made his way to the now desecrated Imperial Chapel overlooking the city. Gaunt had told the ghost before the engagement that the best way to take the city was to slay Nokad, as with his leadership it would take years to break the foe. To that end, Larkin took the opportunity to find a spot and take a shot at the foul cult leader. The ghosts were being cut to pieces as they were pushed back from the city, Nokad and his singing and mutated horde advancing upon them, when a single hot shot last round flashed from above and Nokad's head was vaporised. With his death, the Chaos Forces lost all hope and were butchered by the righteous steel of the Imperial Crusaders. Larkin was found and retrieved from the chapel and hailed as a hero by the ghosts. Typhoon 8 Typhoon 8 was an ice world which had been invaded by an orc force, which had moved into the Sabbath world smelling conflict on the cosmic air. The ghosts were dispatched and began operations in an effort to push the Greenskins from the world. Unfortunately, the cunning Greenskins managed to cut up and scatter several Tanif units. Major Rawn's unit was harried and pursued until only he remained, and, wounded, found shelter in an ice cave. Within the cave, he attempted to seal his wounds, but was found by an orc, who proceeded to batter the wounded Major, nearly slaying him. Gaunt was also separated from his unit, and found himself entering the cave. He slew the greenskin before he could finish Rawn. Begrudgingly, Rawn allowed Gaunt to attend to his wounds, and the two sat around a chemical fire and ate rations, and slept after the struggles of the day. They awoke to orcs entering the cave, and after an exchange slew these hunters, the two men moved out of the cave and entered the frozen wasteland beyond, moving towards the Imperial lines. A mob of orc buggies was pursuing the pair across the snowy plains, checking the caves as they went. They moved into cover, waiting to ambush the next buggy that came close. Hidden by their cloaks behind a small outcrop of rocks, they leapt up, unleashing Laz and Bolter Fire, killing the crew. Leaping atop the vehicle, they removed the corpses and Gaunt sat in the oversized driver's seat, accelerating away with the other buggies in hot pursuit. Eventually, they moved over a frozen lake and the buggy plunged through the weaker ice. Gaunt and Rawn managed to clamber onto a glacier formed from the now rapidly crumbling lake ice before their buggy sank. Several orc buggies plunged into the now open waters and the rest pulled up short, shouting jeers at the two men sat on their glacier as the current took it. This incident would go a long way to bonding the two men and lessening Rawn's animus, as this was the second time Gaunt had saved him. Caligula The invasion of Caligula was a full-scale planetary assault. Several of the planet's hives had fallen to chaos and the Imperium was eager to resecure the world and aid the loyalists on the planet. The main target was the hive Nero. As the drop ships descended upon the city, a vast psychic storm was unleashed on the Crusaders. Many were caught in this turmoil. Luckily, the majority of the ghosts had penetrated the storm that now hung over the city. Gorn's own ship was forced down into one of the sunken forested valleys which dotted the surface of the world, which was primarily desert, but for these sunken oases of fertility. Colonel Corbeck led the ghost's assault. As they penetrated the hat blocks, the horror of the Chaos Forces was made apparent. The things they had done to the population, 
and what those who had joined the Chaos Forces had done was vile and sick in the stomach of every noble son of the Emperor. The ghosts fought through the hubs and penetrated deep into the city. There they encountered a demonic entity, a vast life form, which, due to the intuition of the sniper Mad Larkin, was determined to be the cause of the storm, which was now holding back the orbiting Imperial fleet as well as their reinforcements from the surface. Corbic contacted their transport, the frigate Navir, and was able to convince the captain to launch a pinpoint o- a pinpoint orbital strike on the beast. With its slain, the storm broke and the Imperium was able to feed in additional troops and purge Nero of the Chaos Taint. Away from the city, Gaunt and the survivors from his crashed dropship found a lab which had been growing foul creatures and it is surmised by Imperial intelligence that this was the genesis of the Taint which spread across Nero, corrupting it. Gaunt ordered the site burned to the ground. The Imperial Invasion Force stayed on the planet for some time to secure it and hunt down enemy forces. The wastelands between the Hive Cities had become lawless regions, we must assume more than before, with bands of raiders and refugees lining the main highways between them and continuously attacking supply convoys. The ghosts were assigned to defend these convoys and Gaunt in secret was told to hunt these bands down and in that effort Gaunt laid a trap. The reason for the secrecy was that Imperial Intelligence had discovered that the Raiders were gaining intelligence on the convoy's movements from drivers on the large haul of vehicles. Gaunt assigned Try Again Bragg to command the defence of the convoy, much to the horror of many ghosts, who though well liked by his comrades, was considered a bit dim, and many not knowing the truth of the traitors within the convoys, believed that Gaunt was sacrificing Bragg and those other ghosts assigned to defend the convoy. Try again Bragg was a giant of a man, able to carry and fire heavy weapons that normally would be pintle mounted on vehicles or require multiple people to just move them. His aim, however, was not the best, hence the moniker Try for Try Again Bragg. To many, he seemed like a gentle giant and a little bit dim, but Gaunt could see the man was not dumb or slow. He had just become deliberate because of the great physical strength he had. Also, knowing that people often viewed Bragg as slow, Gaunt selected him for command and gave him a large convoy to defend, hoping to draw out a large portion of the raiders with the promise of rich loot and a poorly led defence. Each of the haulers had a complement of ghosts manning stubbers and armed with las rifles, as well as ghosts on bikes acting as outriders to the front and the flanks. The raiders took the bait, launching a large scale attack on the convoy. Bragg moved the convoy into a defensible position rather than flee, drawing more of the enemy into the open. As the fighting intensified, at Bragg's signal, flights of marauder bombers descended from the skies, unleashing their payloads on the attackers. Their payloads on the attackers surrounding the convoy, annihilating the greater part of all the raiders in the region. The ghosts had been monitoring the Vox traffic coming from the convoy and discovered that one of the drivers had been communicating with the raiders and was attempting to shoot his way clear. Bragg caved the man's head in with a mighty fist before he could fire a shot. The Tannic first and only were later redeployed to a new front. To continue with the wider campaign, Makarov adopted the features of Slado's earlier strategies, such as Operation Reddrake pushing the campaign forward, but launching multiple small-scale invasions and reliefs of defended worlds. His tactic was to maintain active forces of veteran regiments, deploying them to the conflict zones, and then immediately withdrawing them and replacing them with second-line garrison troops. These veteran formations would then be transported to the next world to ensure the Imperial advance was relentless and the best of the Crusade's fighting forces were in the front without bogging them down with occupation and counterinsurgency duties. This whole five year phase of the crusade from 765 and Makarov's assumption of command was described by the war master as that time I spent chasing the horizon, but by others as a mad blind rush. There was no madness however in Makarov's plan, risks for sure, but every one had been weighed up and considered as a well thought out plan of advance into the distant Cabal worlds. Every move was considered by the genius of the War Master 
even if many of his comrades could not appreciate the scope of his vision. Episode 7 Conspiracy The War Master's duty is to rid these stars of the ruinous powers and all fell blight containing them and accomplish with the provident grace of the God Emperor an ending unto the demons that stain the Imperium of mankind with their foul distemper. Ecclesiarch Tarquil Benedicta Osonius, at the Sermon of Blessing of the War Master's Election, Balhut, M765. The next four years of the Crusade would see dozens of worlds taken by the Imperium along the central belt of the newfound trailings group. As Makarov directed the vast armies and fleets of the Crusade, towards the Cabal worlds. Most of these wars were liberation efforts of Imperial worlds which had fallen under the occupation of the Arch Enemy during the initial conquest of the Sabbat Cluster or had been taken by the various armies of Chaos following the fall of Balhut. Nominax Makarov personally led the attack on this hive world. It was a regional agricultural powerhouse and essential to allow for Minotaurum supply lines to support the push on to the Cabal systems. For Makarov it was not only strategically important but also allowed him the opportunity to silence many of his critics within the high command by conducting a brilliant and swift victory straight after assuming the position of War Master. The Pragar Regiment led the attack on the world and, under Makarov's masterful deployment of these regiments, displaying an in-depth knowledge of the different strengths and merits of each of the guard formations in the Crusade. Grimmer The conquest of the world had begun a year before the invasion of Balhut and had ground on in stalemates since then. Makarov deployed the 50th Royal Volpoon and gave command of the theatre to Lord General Notchus Sturm. Despite Sturm's future infamy, he led this campaign with skill and conquered the world within a week. The Volpoon's use of armoured support allowed the Crusade to smash the enemy's resistance, annihilating and cementing their victory in the streets of Mathus, the planetary capital. The arch enemy leader, Magistar Sherinday, committed suicide to avoid capture. After this victory, Sturm and the Royal Volpoon were deployed to attack Voltamund, and here were held fast during the protracted siege of Voltis City, the events of which we discussed in the previous episode. Presarius. The Iron Snakes chapter once more threw themselves into the fight as the Crusade advanced. Presarius had fallen to chaos through the revolt of its mutant underclass used to work in the tectonic foundries beneath the hive cities. It was the habit on this world to augment these mutants with partial mechanization to assist in their work. But the error of this custom, and some would say the error of cultivating an abhorrent class of genetic deviancy, was shown when these mechanical monstrosities advanced up the spires. The battle for Presarius was gruelling. The Iron Snakes were cut off twice from resupply and surrounded, with their ammunition spent the battle developed into a brutal hand-to-hand -hand melee, which lasted nine days, resulting in the virtual extinction of the mutants. For the loss, for the loss of 39 battle brothers. This great feat against the foe was honored by Chapter Master Vegum, who had his silver guard 
bow bareheaded before the sons of Ithaca upon their return. We rejoin now the regimental archives of the Tanith First and those pertinent imperial records to explore in more detail several of their engagements as well as the conspiracy to unseat the War Master and through the hubris of the conspirators the potential to not only destroy the Crusade but perhaps the Imperium of Man itself. Fortis Binary The Ghosts were deployed to this front following their actions on Voltmund. General Hector Drevere had command of the theatre and was tasked with retaking the forges from the rebel population. The forge world had fallen to an internal rebellion fermented by chaos invaders and these rebels named themselves the Shriven. They had taken the forge cities and the Imperial Reconquest Force had been locked in a dogged siege involving trench warfare and mass deployments of artillery, of which Fortis Binary was a major manufacturer, and so had a vast amount of guns and almost endless stockpiles of ammunition, as well as the means to produce more. The Shriven themselves were utterly corrupted, subject to mutations throughout their ranks. Being a forge world, their equipment was comparable to the Imperial Guard, and at all times wore industrial overalls in place of a standard uniform. This manufacturing capacity and the vast potential industrial production of war materials made its reconquest essential for the future of the Crusades' advance. Drevere was not known as a commander of vision, but with a certain callous use of brute force achieved many victories for the Imperium, both during and before the Sabbat Crusade. For that reason, he had slipped easily into the meat grinder mentality during the campaign, ordering artillery bombardments and mass infantry assaults against defended positions, hoping that one of these costly attacks would create a breakthrough for his armoured and mechanised formations to push through and turn the arch enemy's line and thus winning the war. Foremost amongst his armoured strike forces were the Jantai Patricians, under the command of Colonel Flans. Colonel Flans's identity, Colonel Flans's identity and history has been covered in a previous episode and Gaunt would not learn of it until the two met in the deeps below Manazoid Epsilon's surface. The ghosts, being light infantry, and specialising in stealth, were not ideal troops to be deployed to a trench front, and had suffered heavily during their time on the line. Following the repulse of a shriven assault, the Tanif First, along with the Vitrian Dragoons, were ordered by command to assault the front line. This kind of attack is generally considered suicidal for infantry, and General Drevere appears to have been encouraged in his decision by Colonel Flans. The attack began, and despite heavy resistance and hand-to-hand fighting, the ghosts captured the Shriven Ford trenches, with Gaunt leading the assault from the front. The Shriven launched a mass artillery bombardment, creating a continuous impenetrable curtain of explosions across the entire front line and withdrawing their forces back into the cities. Safe in the knowledge that this cover could not be penetrated. This was a feat few forces would be able to match with the sheer volume of continuous fire being unleashed. The almost endless stockpile of ammunition allowed a sustained level of firepower greater than many Imperial armies were even outfitted with. The Tanif were cut in two by the bombardment. Those elements caught behind the shelling returned to the Imperial lines, and those in the Shriven lines were forced to advance deeper into the enemy position to avoid the artillery fire. These forces themselves were cut off from each other, having assaulted different sections of the Shriven front line. 
but pushed forward through the now abandoned defensive positions. Encountering many signs of the corruption that had taken over the population of Fortis Binary. When foul shrines to the ruinous powers were encountered, the Tanif burned them or blew them up. Unfortunately, Trooper Droyle was hit by a piece of shrapnel from one of these destroyed shrines, the effects of which would be felt shortly afterwards. Colonel Corbeck's force found itself entering a series of vast sheds that had enormous networks of drums beating in some kind of ritual fashion. As the drums beat in a seemingly random cacophony, Trooper Droyle fell to the corruption stemming from his wound, transforming into a 12-foot abomination of bone as an entity materialised using Droyle's flesh to create its form. The beast was felled by a lucky shot from a missile launcher and Colonel Corbeck, understandably affected by this, ordered the shed and the drums destroyed. The ghosts would destroy several more sheds and these detonations would mark their position to the other scattered Tanif forces, allowing them to unite. They also attracted a force of Vitrian Dragoons, led by Colonel Zoran. As fortuitous as this gathering was, the vast plumes of fire and smoke erupting deep within the Shriven's lines attracted enemy artillery fire, which began to slowly creep forward and bombard the area. With their forces gathered, they had a combined strength of 400 guardsmen, and the two commanders agreed to strike deeper into the Scriven territory in the hope of doing more damage, rather than being surrounded and destroyed by enemy forces, moving to investigate the drum shed's destruction. The Vitrian Dragoons are a heavily equipped infantry force. They utilise a form of glass or ceramic chainmail armour, which has some utility in resisting kinetic impacts, but is primarily intended to deflect LAS and other energy weapons. They also equip themselves with full face helmets. Their weaponry is standard guard issue. However, they tend to set their LAS rifles to the highest power setting, rather than the lower strength as is normal for Imperial forces, believing that it is better to fire once and slay the foe, despite this draining their power packs, far more swiftly than would normally be expected. Each Vitrian carries with him a small book called the Bahata, which contains their culture's condensed honour code and philosophy. This scratch force entered the Scriven tunnels and followed the sound of activity and the rail tracks, which appear to have linked the ammunition storage dumps with the artillery positions. After several serious firefights, including the slaying of several traitor Astartes, the force discovered a large man here by foul offerings and radiating the vile aura of the ruinous powers. Seeing this, Gaunt was reminded of the words of the Psyker Girl on Derendara decades before, where he was told, There would be seven stones of power. Cut them and you will be free. Do not kill them. Holding off the fanatical attacks of the Scriven, as they attempted to retake the chamber the man here was located, Gaunt rigged it with explosives to topple from the blast. Having rigged the explosives, the guardsmen fled. And following their detonation and the toppling of the man here, an eerie silence descended across the planet. With the toppling of the standing stone, the ritual that had been taking place was disrupted, and the followers of chaos in despair committed mass suicide, perhaps to assuage the anger of their ruinous deities by offering their souls as recompense. Whatever the insane reasoning, Fortis Binary, though damaged and now severely underpopulated, was retaken fully by the Crusade. Conspiracy Most Foul Cratia City, Pyrites Following Fortis Binary, the ghosts were rotated out of the Crusade front line, 
for rest and recuperation. While on the world, Gaunt received a message from a former comrade asking for assistance. This colleague was a member of the Crusades intelligence force and the two had worked together in a previous engagement years before. Gaunt was asked to meet this colleague on the outskirts of the city. This intelligence agent, known to Gaunt as Ferid, was not there, however. But one of his couriers was, and handed Gaunt a data crystal, set with the million security clearance, one of the highest in the Imperium. As this exchange was taking place, they were attacked by an unidentified strike team, which slew the courier. And despite Gaunt killing all but one of the assassins, he was also almost eliminated. If not for the timely arrival of a slightly inebriated Commissar Blenner, who had insisted in the officer's bar on accompanying Gaunt. Gaunt and Blenner had served together in the Scholar Progenium, and were friends of a sort, although serving with a disciplined, loyal and courageous regiment like the Greys, had softened Blenner's approach to his commissarial duties. As a side note, the Tanny First left its mark on Pyrites through the elimination of a local criminal chief and his entire gang of 20 brutes in a gunfight in the darkness of a warehouse where Corbick, Rawn and Trooper Fagor, after a disagreement over a cargo of illicit black market items, the gang went in and after a gunfight, there was nothing but a pile of corpses. And it is still spoken about to this very day. En route to Manazoid Epsilon. The frigate Navir had been reassigned, so the ghosts were transported upon the Mechanicum mass conveyor, Absalom, along with eight other regiments, four divisions of Jantine patricians, and three Mechanicus battalions. While on board, Gaunt was almost assassinated by a crew member who appears to have been under the psychic control of another passenger, one Inquisitor Heldane. Those interested in a more in-depth background on this Inquisitor are asked to gain the proper clearance from the relevant authorities and to request access and to request access to those historical records covering the activities of one Inquisitor Eisenhorn and the Scarus Sector. Heldane appears to have been the instigator of a plot to replace Warmaster Makarov with General Drevere, whom he believed he could control and thus direct the vast resources of the Crusade towards his own, no doubt, laudable aims. In order to progress this plan, he needed the information contained on the Data Crystal which was now in Gaunt's possession. He did not know what information was contained within the crystal, but he knew that this would tip the balance of power within the High Command and topple Makaroth. The situation on board escalated quickly, with the willing involvement of the Jantine patricians who, under Flans's orders, had extended the grudge against Gaunt to the whole of the Tanith First. After a number of clashes on deck, Major Rawn was captured and interrogated by Inquisitor Heldane. The Ghosts launched a rescue mission, utilising their stealth skills, and the sniper Mad Larkin shot Heldane in the face, incapacitating and nearly killing him. Larkin used a looted weapon, which is a common practice within the Guard, will often loot weaponry from war zones as trophies or mementos. With Rome recovered and the assistance of Colonel Zolan, whose Vitrians were also on board, and himself had formerly worked with and been asked to assist Gaunt in keeping the intelligence safe by Ferred, they were able, through subterfuge, to gain access to the ship's security mainframe and decrypt the data on the crystal. The information contained within identified an ancient relic from the Dark Age of Technology and pointed to the location of a fully functional standard template constructor, which built Iron Men. Iron Men were one of the main causes for the destruction of the old human empire during the Age of Strife, and one of the reasons for the Imperium's fanatical aversion to artificial intelligence. 
The recovery of an STC system would be one of the greatest events in Imperial history since the Great Crusade, let alone one which produced the terrifying war machines which brought mankind to the brink of extinction. Its worth would be incalculable. As an example, the only comparable situation in recent Imperial history was the recovery of paper copies of technical schemata from an STC system found by explorators. The plans showed how to produce strange new alloys to create combat blades and knives. Each of the explorators was rewarded with an entire world to rule for this great feat. So I must leave it to you to imagine the significance of finding an Iron Man producing STC. Gaunt revealed this information to his officers and men so that they understood the situation's importance. He determined to destroy it, reasoning that the Iron Man were a horror that should never be returned to the galaxy and most likely were corrupted beyond retrieval, having been on a world held by chaos for centuries. The STC was located on Manazoid Epsilon, which was a lesser objective in the Manazoid system. Dravir and Haldane were aware that where Gaunt went, the power they sought would be located, and arranged for the General to have the command of that theatre, and Colonel Flance volunteered his Jantai patricians to the invasion. The ghosts were deployed to the attack on Shrine Target Primaris, the largest main settlement on the world. As the Crusaders advanced on the different targets across the planet, the large stone towers ringing these settlements erupted with fierce energy, and arch enemy forces appeared on top of the towers via some form of teleportation unleashing heavy firepower from energy weapons and vicious rifles firing barbed rounds which shattered into cruel shards upon impact. The ghosts managed to withdraw before the towers became armed but the other forces were heavily mauled. The ghosts managed to bring down a tower breaking the ring of energy and allowing entry to what looked like a dead city. To what looked like an ancient dead city. Dravir, seeing that the ghosts were the only force to have broken through, took the opportunity to declare them traitors and ordered Colonel Flance to hit them in the rear and destroy them. Gaunt and a strike team of ghosts were already entering the tunnels using the mapped route contained in the intelligence information. They were joined by Agent Fered and his bodyguard. As they entered the tunnels, the power from their las rifles and other energy sources began to be drained. They had a firefight with a pack of arch enemy troopers before coming upon the STC's chamber. After navigating through a number of booby traps, the strike team entered the chamber. And they came before the vast machine, surrounded by hundreds of deactivated Iron Men. Gaunt began to order the planting of demolition charges. Agent Farad was shocked by this and attempted to stop the destruction of the STC and was slain during the ensuing firefight. The firefight accidentally activated the STC and the surrounding Iron Men. The first Iron Man the STC produced was a corrupted creature, proving Gorn's assumption of the grip of chaos on the ancient relic. The ghosts set their charges and ran. Unbeknownst to Gaunt, Agent Farad was a puppet of Inquisitor Haldane, and hearing of the existence of the Iron Man, STC, he exerted and pulled more of himself directly into his pawn in an attempt to secure the machine. When Gorn slew Fered, the psychic backlash from being so closely linked to his death created a devastating storm of energy which detonated, which atomized Haldane, General Dravir, and the entire and the entire Leviathan command vehicle they were based in in an instant. Despite Dravir's end, the orders of the Jantine patricians still stood. Under Major Brockus's command, a man who had witnessed the death of General Darcius, armed himself with his heavy stubber, and, leading his men from the front, he and his patricians pursued the ghosts, now engaged with the enemy deep within the ruined city. Sergeant Blaine had been left to guard the ghosts' rear, in anticipation of this kind of situation. Although they did not expect the patricians to actually attack them, the Jantine's hatred for Gaunt, and by extension, the Tanith, 
was too great and it is doubtful they would have stopped even if ordered. In a stunning last stand, 50 Tanifs stood against the entire Jantine regiment and slew 300 of them before being wiped out. Despite these heavy losses, the Jantine launched themselves at the rest of the Tanif regiment, although now the ghosts, thanks to the sacrifice of Sergeant Blaine's men, had a chance to prepare positions for the attack. Heavy fighting ensued. Major Brockus was the last to fall in battle, with a heap of the enemy dead around him, as the Vitrians had moved up to support the Tanif, surrounding and annihilating the Jantine patricians. Major Brockus was commanding the attack because Colonel Flance had entered the tunnels in pursuit of Gaunt. In the darkness below, the two men met, and Flance revealed his identity and the disgrace of General Darcius. Flance and those patricians with him fell in the ensuing combat. The destruction of the STC relic caused a massive explosion, which, for all intensive purposes, destroyed the main shrine city. This broke the back of the enemy, and Manazoid Epsilon fell shortly afterwards. Warmaster Makarov sent a communication through to Gaunt, thanking him for all of his efforts during the battle. In the next episode, the advance towards the Cabal systems continues with many great victories and defeats. Episode 8 Victory and Defeats Inheriting command of the Sabbath World's Crusade Force from the late and lauded Warmaster Slado, Warmaster Makarov renewed the Imperial Offensive to liberate the Sabbath Worlds a cluster of nearly 100 inhabited systems along the edge of Segmentum Pacificus. Many legendary actions distinguish this 20-year campaign, and many legends were made. The last stand of the Latari gun dogs at La Masia, the Iron Snake's victories at Prasius, Ambold XI and Fornex Aleph, and the dogged prosecution of the enemy by the so-called Ghosts of Tanith, on Canemara, Spurtis Ellipse, Manazoid Epsilon, and Monthax. Of these, perhaps Monthax presents the most intriguing question for Imperial historians. Ostensibly, a head-on confrontation with the forces of chaos, this action is clouded in mystery, and the details are still sequestered in the archives of Imperial High Command. Only speculation remains as to what truly occurred on the tangled shores of that hideous battle site. From a history of the later Imperial Crusades. Osgrey Hive, Sapintia. Following their costly but important victory on Manazoid Epsilon, the ghosts were deployed to Sarpicia and the attack on the Promethean producing Osgrey Hive, the defence of which was led by the notorious butcher Magistar Sholon Skara. The attack began badly due to miscalculations by the Imperial Navy, causing the landing craft to fall short of the shore and to drop their loads of troops and armour just shy of the beaches. The ghosts suffered heavily from this, as a majority of them couldn't actually swim, being as they originated from a forest world, and with few of their number originating from the coastal regions of their lost homeworld. Not only this, but the armoured support, in this instance, once again, the 17th Ketog Serpents, was mostly submerged. Those troops which managed to wade ashore were being cut to pieces, and the arch enemy gunners were lobbing shells at the bulkier troop transports moving in to reinforce a supposedly cleared beachhead. Two vast troop carriers were blown from the sky, one of them by chance or by intention, in its death throes, crashed into the fortified sea walls, breaching them in a display of twisted good fortune, for those guardsmen being shot to pieces, waiting on the beaches. Still, the enemy moved quickly to defend this breach, stopping any further advance into the complexes beyond, until the Ketzog armour could grind up the beach and begin providing covering fire. In the meantime, Trooper Catherine and several men with him 
noticed a door set into the now shattered wall and proceeded to climb and enter it. Fighting their way through the scattered enemy forces, they began to head towards the refinery stacks, which towered over the city. Once more they ran into the arch enemy. Once more they ran into the arch enemy and a vertical firefight ensued, resulting in the use of demolition charges, which so damaged the structure of these giant exhaust stacks that they began to collapse. The ghosts made their escape deeper into the hive. Surprisingly, they did not encounter any resistance and following the noise of Lasgun volleys, came upon a vast space with what appeared to be every arch enemy soldier in Osgrey Hive under the eye of Magister Skara. To the shock of Catherine and the ghosts with him, the massed ranks of the enemy were committing suicide in a bizarre manner. A rank would march forward, turn to face their comrades and then be shot by a volley from those heretics behind them. Turn to face their comrades and then be shot. A large earth moving machine would then glide down, scraping and collecting the corpses before dumping them in a heap. So the next rank could march forward and do the same. It is often fruitless and dangerous to attempt to understand the mentality of the damned and the heretical. But Imperial Intelligence reports state that it is likely a result of the destruction of the refinery towers caused unintentionally by this small squad of ghosts. Made it appear that the defences had been breached and perhaps their perverse beliefs demanded sacrifice in this way. Whatever the reason, the Magistar himself did not participate in this worship along with his followers and was captured alive. Colonel Commissar Gaunt, the ranking officer present, was ready to give the degenerate heretic the Emperor's mercy. But at the suggestion of Trooper Catherine, spared him, arguing that the Magister worshipped death in all its forms and a fitting torment was for him to live a long, long life. And he does still, courtesy of the Emperor's holy orders, I am reliably informed. Nacedon The initial phase of the reconquest of Nacedon was something of a debacle with an overextended advance of the Imperial forces having to beat a hasty retreat from a stronger than expected enemy force. As the 21st were withdrawing, they came across a field hospital of the Royal Volpoon Blue Bloods, in which 30 soldiers of this esteemed regiment, too wounded to be moved, had been left to their fate by their comrades in their haste to withdraw before the advancing arch enemy. Chief Medical Officer Dorden demanded to stay and care for the men, come what may. Colonel Corbeck agreed to stay too, and asked for a squad of volunteers to join him. Gaunt informed them that it was for one night, and then the Imperial counterattack would begin the next day. The ghosts fought a spirited defence, and several of the Volpoon managed to take up arms and aid the defence of the walled farmstead. The use of a heavy flamer on the main gates was essential in holding back the enemy, and accounted for a great many of the foe. The enemy brought artillery up, and given time, would have levelled the whole position. But the ghosts had held the place long enough, and the Imperial Counter-Strike pushed the enemy back. This action won them a fair amount of respect from many of the Volpoon, who, nonetheless, still considered the Tanif savages. Nacedon itself was retaken shortly afterwards. Monthax The world was a humid hellhole of mud and stinking jungle vegetation. The Tanif had been deployed to the trench front line, which consisted of waterlogged trenches shored up with prefabricated flakboard sections, with the dense jungle and small rivers and streams between the Crusaders and the foe. The enemy occasionally launched attacks against the Imperial line, and at first it seemed like it would be a gruelling but straightforward conflict. The first hint of the odd series of events to unfold was the reports of Scout Sergeant McColl, who, having deployed to scout the area prior to any Imperial advance, came across a vast ancient ruin in the distance, which should not have been there. Try as he might, he was unable to find it again, despite repeated attempts, 
This perturbed McCall, who was an almost preternaturally gifted tracker and hunter. Gaunt ordered him to keep searching for the ruin, sensing its potential importance. Then, the archenemy attacked. And although they smashed an Imperial regiment to pieces in their advance, they seemed to be assaulting the area McCall had roughly marked as the location of the ruin. As the Imperial forces sought to counter this mysterious archenemy movement and defeat the foe, no matter what warp-crazed madness had beset them, a vast storm erupted over the area as the two forces met. This storm was enormous. The touch of the warp was apparent to all, not simply the sanctioned psychers and astropaths in the orbiting fleet. A strange fury overtook those under the storm, and they threw themselves at the enemy with a drive to push forward to the centre. Third platoon, under Major Rawn, was the deepest into the storm zone, and with communication disrupted by the storm, they pushed on, which wasn't entirely unreasonable, being the standing order for all guard forces, to continue to advance when cut off from the rest of your forces until you meet resistance you cannot defeat. For the men of third platoon, peculiar sensations, visions and thoughts began to take over their minds. The later debriefing of these men and others caught under the storm's fierce wind, showers and lightning showed that the storm appeared to play on the deepest regrets, emotions and will for vengeance. The ghosts began to see Tanith during its fall, but this time they could and would fight for it. The cause of the storm and the true target of the arch enemy force was the ruins spotted by McCall, but its location was masked by illusions and xeno sorcery. It was in fact an Eldar outpost or sanctuary, housing a small contingent of this near-extinct species, composing of a force of Aspect Warriors and the Eldar following the various careers of their alien caste system. The leader was one Farseer Ion Kul, an ancient specimen for his race. It is postulated that he attempted to use the Imperial forces to defeat the archenemy forces besieging him by unleashing the warp storm to ensnare the minds in an illusion of their greatest regrets that would inspire them to fight and defend the Eldar with their lives. He took the risk of unleashing such power in order to hold the webway portal within the Eldar ruin and avoid closing the gate to protect Craftworld Dolph as this closure would be permanent, thus forever separating Monthrax from the Craftworld and from their race forever. Here we see the delusions of this candle of a species holding out hope of recapturing their ancient empire whose territories already belong to mankind, the true and self-evident masters of the universe. Unfortunately for the Xeno's witch's scheme, the powers he unleashed were too strong for him to control. A lesson one would have thought the failed race might have learned from by this point. And its original purpose soon broke down into a cataclysmic display of disturbed forces, both natural and unnatural. Only those close enough to the centre of the storm were caught in its clutches, and many of them, such as Scout Sergeant McCall, were able to see past the sorcerer's guiles. Third platoon was fully ensnared, however, and statements by these guardsmen show that, for them, it was like standing on Tanith during its fall and being assaulted by the arch enemy. All their pain and anger was used by the Xenos Witch's grand spell to fuel their need to fight for their homeworld, which they could no longer remember was already dead. They fought their way through the arch enemy, entering the Xeno structure, which to them was Tanith Magna, the capital city. And they would fight alongside other Tanith inside, who were in fact aspect warriors, wearing the illusion of comrades in arms. Third platoon would fight like devils for their homeworld, as they would have done if Gaunt had not denied them the opportunity and preserve them for the wars to come. As the storm worsened, the Imperials pulled back, unable to penetrate the strafing wind and rain. Inquisitor Lilith landed on the planet with a contingent of elite Volpoon stormtroopers under Major Gilbert. 
she ordered Gorn to gather a contingent of ghosts to accompany her and they fought their way to the ruins and the centre of the storm. Lilith and Gaunt had met shortly before when she was investigating the rumours surrounding trooper Brim Milo and the suspicion that he may be a psyker. After examining the evidence and interviewing Gaunt and Milo, no further action was taken. As the Volpoon and Tenif advanced through the storm, they came across Scout Sergeant McCall, heavily wounded, surrounded by dozens of arch-enemy corpses, having been pursued by them once he finally found the Xeno structure. He, like the men of Rorn's 3rd platoon, had been assailed by psychic visions of Tanith. Though heavily wounded, he threw his stealth abilities, and perhaps, by the storm stoking a reserve of vengeance inside his soul, had escaped his pursuers and left a trail of enemy corpses leading back to the cloaked Eldar position. As the combined force made camp to rest before forging on, the storm worsened, and one of the foul entities from beyond the veil materialised and set upon them, only defeated by the use of explosives on the demonic hound. They pushed forward, and finally coming upon the Xeno structure, found it surrounded and swamped by a vast besieging force of arch enemy, equipped with the full accoutrement of a siege, from artillery to trench lines, but they were being held off by the small but supremely effective cadre of Xeno's filth and the men of third platoon who from their point of view were defending the capital city of Tanith Magna from chaos invaders alongside leaner, taller, white-haired comrades. And they were fighting hard, together reaping a heavy toll on the enemy. This close to the origin of the Eldar psychic storm, it began to affect the men of Tanith and Volpoon, feeding on their emotions to make them fight all the harder, using their pain, their anger and their loss to spur them on to greater feats of martial glory than should have been possible. The ghosts were fighting for Tanif. For the Volpoon, it was Ignix Majora, a shameful defeat, staining their martial record. They fell upon the gunnery positions, using the captured heavy weapons to blast the rear of the enemy forces. They then advanced to full attack, cutting hundreds of the enemy to pieces, smashing through their formations before entering the Eldar ruins. Later analysis by Imperial tacticians cannot make sense of the engagement. 60 Volpoon and Tanif assaulted a force of 10,000 arch enemy troops who were heavily armed and in full battle readiness. And yet it did happen. By all calculations, Gaunt's force should have been annihilated within moments, but they didn't lose a man and slew around 2,400 enemy soldiers. The only way the tacticians and scholars could make sense of it was by determining that there were no enemies on the field that day, and it had simply been an illusion. It was the only way the calculations made sense. And so, one of the greatest and most successful Imperial attacks in the Sabbat Crusade and in the history of the Imperial Guard was removed from the Rolls of Honor. Once inside, Farseer Ian Kul explained that the storm was his creation, but had run out of his control, and that the portal to Craftworld Dolph must be closed to deny it to the foe. Inquisitor Lilith agreed to use her own psychic powers to close the portal, and so she left for Dolph with the Eldar. In a blinding flash, the gate was closed forever, and the resultant psychic aftershock slew 75% of the Imperial fleet to astropaths, who fell into seizures and died. Lord Militant Bulladin, wasting no time, ordered orbital bombardments of the massed enemy legions around the Eldar ruins, practically annihilating their forces on the planet. And with that, the Imperium secured Monthax in the name of the Golden Throne. Reverses Makarov secured his reputation and position as Warmaster via these many victories, but this phase of the Crusade was not without defeats. Arcilia 9 The campaign for this hive world was a bloody mess, resulting from the failures of the commanding officers, men recently raised by Makarov as he sought, for political reasons, to replace many of Slado's people. These officers would later be disgraced at a subsequent military inquiry into the debacle, 
Arsilia would later be taken by the Crusade, but the whole affair had been unnecessarily costly and was the origin of Makarov's famous words, too much blood, too much, too much. I cannot afford the spill for the Emperor's sake. The bloodbath of Arsilia would fade from memory, however, once the disaster of Parthenope came to pass. Parthenope. 20 divisions under General Onatar were deployed in 767 to capture the planet and crush the armies of Magistar Cux of the Oilis, who had been rebuilding his strength there since fleeing Balhut following the righteous slaying of the thrice damned heretic Archon Nadzibar. General Onatar appears to have underestimated the enemy's strength and resolve following such a glorious victory at Balhut, and fell for a feigned withdrawal of the arch enemy forces, drawing the Imperials deeper into the Catral Highlands, where Cux counterattacked and surrounded the Crusaders. Onatar, realising his perilous position, sent out pleas for assistance to the Crusade High Command while attempting to extricate his forces from the exposed highlands to form defensive positions in the mining towns of Turanon and Kailask. One Guard Division, formed by the 4th Samothrace, 2nd Minonite, 23rd and 26th Baldakian Fusiliers was cut off and, in the withdrawal, was forced to form up in the Bash Valley, where they were utterly annihilated following a concentrated five-hour artillery bombardment. Kylax fell to Cooks within days, but Anatar held to Ronin for three weeks, until the Adeptus Mechanicus deployed a relief force, but these were annihilated during a five-day campaign by the surprise deployment of war machines from the traitor legions allied with the Magistar. Days later, Tyrone and Fell and the horrendous fate of Onatar and his men during the conquest and sack of the town are still suppressed by the Holy Ordos for fear of the damage to morale such disturbing information may cause. Cooks would then deploy his surprising naval strength consisting of his own personal force and those others he had drawn to him following the arch enemy's flight from Balhut. This worryingly large battle fleet set upon the Imperial fleet which had transported Onatar's forces and the Mechanicum fleet which had answered his call for aid. This was the third largest naval engagement of the Crusade to date and ended in complete victory for Cooks, who caught and annihilated the Crusaders in the neighbouring Antioch system, creating the Antioch debris field consisting of the many burned out and shattered halls from the Crusader force. Parthenope losses continued. File 5 of 14. Carnis Nobilis, lost with all hands. Astro Fanive, mined, later boarded and sacked. Gauntlet of the Emperor, lost after sustained bombardment, sparked a reactor fire. The vessel had destroyed two enemy cruisers prior to its loss, and was caught and annihilated while trying to guard the retreat of the stricken battleship St. Orantil. Guild Mechanicus Mass Cargo Conveyance Brutito, one of 19 such vessels destroyed in the engagement. Wrath of Macarius, abandoned then annihilated. The vessel had crippled one enemy frigate, possibly the recurved blade, and forced a critical drive detonation aboard the Chaos battleship Prudence Vile before being overwhelmed by fighter-bomber assault. Eternal Light, lost with all hands. Sacred Vow, last sighted drifting after a serious engineering fire. It is believed the vessel was later vaporised by mines. Star Fury Pattern, Killer Kiss, tail number 11891 of Captain Loden Spale, lost to anti-ship batteries after two-hour defence of the cruiser Signum Nobilis during which Spale scored 19 confirmed kills. Star Fury 11E Pattern, Emil version, Void Mistress, tail number 47292 of Commander Belena Cortison, lost during fighter swarm dogfighting after recording 11 confirmed kills. Victory of Sumner Gate, immolated after ramming the arch enemy heavy cruiser unnatural causes. The enemy vessel was also destroyed. Extract from the Navy's Casualty Ledger for the Battle of Antioch. This was a terrible setback and buoyed up the arch enemy shattered morale following the defeat 
and death of their Archon, and the seemingly relentless advance of the Imperial Crusade. But given time, the Warmaster would raise fresh troops and receive naval reinforcements from Segmentum Command, so this defeat, although terrible in the short term, could be addressed unlike some other events. Erdesh. The forge world of Erdesh was one of the largest centres for industrial production within the Sabbath worlds, and had resisted multiple chaos raids and invasions since the fall of the cluster. Makarov hoped to advance and bring the world back into the fold, as he secured the Khan group. Unfortunately, it finally fell to the archenemy by 767, and its vast stockpiles of local pattern weapons and war machines, including unknown thousands of tanks, were taken by the foe and sent deeper into their territory, and would outfit many of the archenemy's forces in the years ahead. Also, every day the enemy held the world, the enslaved population, was set to work producing more of this weaponry. Weaponry such as the U-90 assault cannon, the Steg-4 light armoured car, N-20 and N-22 half-tracks, usurper self-propelled guns, AT-70 Reaver battle tanks, and the fearsome AT-83 Bregan super tank. The wide use of these weapons and machines would nullify much of the technological advantage the Crusade had enjoyed up to this point, and make the future battles of the Crusade harder and bloodier, especially when more elite archenemy forces, equipped with them, began to make their presence felt in the years ahead. Erdish would be retaken in 772 after five years of occupation and servitude. Several of the eight Erdeshi regiments serving with the Crusade took part in the Liberation Campaign. Magistar Rushek Vakin. For all of these setbacks, one event brought, if not joy, then peace of mind. When Magistar Vakin, long considered one of the most talented and gifted archenemy warlords, was finally slain in 768. General Uriens, another of Makarov's newly minted chosen men, stumbled upon the enemy fleet at High Anchor at Nizon II. Unlike many of the officers Makarov promoted beyond their capabilities, upon assuming the rank of Warmaster, Uriens was widely considered competent and effective in command. Seeing the opportunity, and being a commander of talent, he launched an immediate attack against Vakim and his notorious cult army, the Thorns of Heaven. Uriens personally led the boarding action on the flagship, the Crown of Thorns, capturing the Magistar, who would later escape through unknown means, and attempted to disappear on Nizon II within the sprawling hives. Vakim and nine members of his Guthka were hunted down and slain in a shootout outside Penator Hive by a kill team led by Urian's protege, Commander Lang Mauser. For several years from 764, Vakim's forces had been raiding and burning Imperial worlds, then slipping away before Imperial forces could amass the strength to face him. One of the worlds his war fleet sacked and burned was the forest world of Tanif. With his death, a grave threat to the Crusade and the lives of loyal citizens was removed and in a galaxy of horrors and woe, some small measure of, if not justice, then at least righteous vengeance had been achieved for his many, many victims. In the next episode, Makarov dispatches a task force to Vargas to put down a seemingly simple planetary conflict between rival hive cities. The Tanif first and only will discover, however, a more terrible threat as they seek to defend Vervan Hive. Episode 9 The Siege of Vervan Hive After the victories at Monthax and Larmetia, Warmaster Makarov drove his forces swiftly along the trailing edge of the Sabbat World's cluster and turned inwards to assault the notorious enemy fortress worlds in the Cabal system. Successful conquest of the Cabal system was a vital objective in the Imperial Crusade to liberate the entire Sabbat World's group. To achieve this massive undertaking, the Warmaster sent the line ships of the Segmentum Pacificus fleet forward in a pincer formation to begin the onslaught. While assembling and reforming his enormous Imperial Guard reserves, 
ready for ground assault. It took close to eight months for the troop components to convene at Solepsis. Thousands of mass conveyance transports carrying many million Imperial Guardsmen. There were many delays, many minor skirmishes to settle en route. The Praegar regiments were held up for six weeks, engaging remnants of a Chaos Legion on Nonimax, and a warp storm forced the Somerface and Sarpoi troopships to remain at Antioch 148 for three whole months. However, it is the events that took place on the industrial hive world of Vargast that are of particular interest to any student of Imperium military history. From a history of the later Imperial Crusades. Following the victories achieved during the previous phase of the Crusade, Makarov began to manoeuvre the Imperial front line for an advance on the Cabal systems and their fortress worlds. However, due to this huge logistical challenge, the Imperium lost time, allowing the arch enemy to regroup further and challenge the Crusades advance with fresh legions of their vile followers being formed deeper within their territory and the distant sanguinary worlds. The conflicts within their own leadership following the Archon's death on Balhut were also nearing their end, and with a new Archon who could provide leadership and unite the various Magistars and Warlords of the Arch Enemy hosts, the Crusade was set to face a more difficult challenge than they had since the victory at Balhut. It was during this period of reorganisation and preparation that one of the most well-known and heroic engagements of the Crusade occurred. The vile heretic, Heritor Asphodel, had been mentioned in this history before, and played a major role in the early stages of the Crusade's efforts as one of the most skilled and deadly arch-enemy commanders. Following the Imperial victory on Balhut, Asphodel, like many, fled the planet before the righteous fury of the God Emperor's servants could eliminate him, but not before his forces, including many of his signature woe machines, abominable and ingenious war machines, took a heavy toll not only of the soldiers of the Imperial Guard, but also the Battle Brothers of the Silver Guard Astartes chapter. Asphodel fled Balhut with the remnants of his own forces. The size of this force is unknown, but we can surmise that it included his personal warp spawn bodyguard, perhaps some number of corrupted tech heretics and other degenerate hangers on. The Heritor appears to have been gifted by his former Archon with two Dark Watch bodyguards, demonically spawned warrior creatures who could apparently phase in and out of the warp to appear behind a bow or avoid blows. In appearance, they were dark, tall, but thin creatures possessed of great physical strength and speed, who uniformly wore glossy black body armour, chainmail cowls, and armed themselves with demonically cursed red power sabres. The Dark Watch are rare, but appear to be a dedicated cadre of fell warriors, gifted to the champions of chaos as guards and enforcers. The Emperor's Holy Ordos have restricted any further information on these creatures, so it is unclear what their origin is, and whether they are a demonic entity, a Xenos breed, or some foul human mutation, altered and trained for their role. At some point in 766 and 767, the Heritor arrived at Vargast and began to spread his corruption to the world. Vargast In order to understand the conflict, we will briefly cover the history of Vargast up to the Ferrozoica War, which we refer to as it is commonly referred to now, much to the chagrin of the noble Northern Collective, as the Siege of Vervenhive. Vargast did not fall to the forces of chaos following the collapse of imperial authority in the region. This was surprisingly common. The arch enemy's hold on the region was dictated by their numbers, and so many worlds on the edges of the cluster, away from the main trade and transit routes, or of limited importance, or considered too costly an endeavour for the arch enemy to attempt to take, were left in isolation. Vargast is a minor hive world in comparison to many within the Imperium. Prior to the siege, it consisted of three main hive cities, Vervenhive, Ferrozoica, and Vanik. 
as well as many small satellite mines and townships. It also had what will most likely one day develop into a hive city due to its survival unscathed from the war, the Northern Collectives, which did and still does control several lunar colonies. It is worth noting that the Northern Collective, or as they refer to themselves, the North Col, was the most experienced military force on the planet, if not the most numerous, due to their deployment several years before to their lunar colonies where they put down a secessionist rebellion. The hives of Vergast were relatively autonomous in their day-to-day -day operations and the affairs of their citizens. Following the trade war which occurred in 679 or 90 years before the siege, Vervan Hive's ruler was nominally in the position of planetary governor, at least officially, although the ruling family of each hive city dealt with their own affairs in terms of law and order, trade, production and security, with the Skions of the various noble families and members of the merchant class vying for power within the various hives and through the normal noble web of family ties and politicking between the hives across the planet. Each of the hives specialised in production of certain technologies, goods and resources most notably to this history, and without getting bogged down in the minutiae of administrative records, it will suffice to say that Vanik was the primary supplier of Prometheum, particularly to Vervenhive, and Vervenhive itself was heavily involved in mining and had a history in advanced virus and security software. The planet itself did not have a heavy mechanicus presence, perhaps due to its relative isolation within the Sabbat cluster, although the administratum did have a presence on the world and several other imperial institutions based there. The world possesses an advanced level of technology when compared to the rest of the cluster and was fairly unique in that it was self-sustaining. Most hive worlds are not and require continuous imports of foodstuffs and raw materials from worlds nearby to maintain their populations and economy. The population had not fallen into the depths of degeneracy which occurs on many worlds with the citizenry living a prosperous life with only a light application of force by the authorities to maintain an orderly state. As mentioned though, Vervenhive held primacy and what could be considered a position of first amongst equals, its rulers had none of the powers one would normally expect from a planetary governor. Each hive maintained its own military forces and following the trade war, Vervenhive was granted the right to maintain a permanent garrison of 500,000 guardsmen known as the Vervan Primary, as well as 70,000 auxiliaries, which would act as gun crews for the enormous number of artillery pieces built into the Cyclopean adamantium sheathed walls which surround the city. This vast force was exempt from conscription into the Imperial Guard, with the idea being, perhaps, by whichever administrative clerk who made this agreement, that Vervenhive would be able to maintain its status with such a vast force of troops at its disposal, or at least the status quo between the hives, and stave off a costly and ultimately pointless for the Imperium planetary war. Order was maintained amongst this vast force of troops and the city's population by the Vervan Hive Primary Commissariat, the VHPC, which acted like a miniature version of the Commissariat for the Guard, which was subordinate to this institution and had few powers over members of the actual Imperial Guard. Problems with jurisdictions and the use of judicial powers would emerge throughout the siege, and we will explore these as we progress. The VPHC was headed by a full off-world Imperial Commissar to ensure its loyalty, which at the time was one future people's hero, Commissar Pius Cowell. The role of the VPHC seems to have morphed or perhaps not, from its main vocation with the VPHC occasionally being used by the Vervenhive ruling class and merchant class as a kind of secret police force. The exact composition of the forces maintained by other hives prior to the gruelling siege is not necessary for this history, and particularly in the case of Ferrazoika. It is difficult to imagine the horrors which must have befallen this once loyal and productive hive. By unknown means, since its destruction, records are now scant, the population was corrupted. We can hope, in a way, that there was opposition to the spread of the archenemy's power there, and that some resisted. 
But whether this occurred and what damage it could have done is a moot point, as the hive, its population, and its industrial capacity was taken by the great enemy, and led by Herator Asphodel, they were forged into a terrible weapon, which would cause horrific violence to those noble sons of the throne who oppose them. The distinction between trade and warfare is only seen by those who have no experience of either. Hieronimo Sondar, House Sondar, from his inaugural address, The Siege, Day 1. An hour before shift rotation, the klaxons across Vervenhive began to wail. They were joined by raid sirens, manufactory hooters, mill whistles and even the ceremonial horns atop the ecclesiarchal basilica. All raised up their alarm to the skies. Unease spread throughout the hive. Millions of workers looked at timepieces and up at the wailing klaxons in confusion. The main spine command station received dozens upon dozens of requests for clarification and confirmation from the Verve and primary forces stationed around the hive and manning its adamantium walls as well as the military retainers and bodyguards of the noble houses. For months, Hive Ferrazoika had isolated itself from its sister hives and rumours had circulated of a military build-up. The people of Vervenhive believed that after 90 years, Ferrazoika, or Zoika as it was known commonly, was about to launch a trade war. They would soon learn it was far worse. The population began to panic and head for their homes, or whatever safe place they had. The Vervan primary mobilised and began to man the walls in full battle readiness, raising the city's defensive guns. In the Square of Marshals, 300 Lehman Rust battle tanks of the 1st Primary Armoured Regiment, under the command of General Vigolian, the pride of the Vervenhive military, mustered and prepared to ride forth out from the Sondar Gate and advance into the grasslands surrounding the Hive. The events leading up to the siege of Vervenhive would later be examined by the Crusades Intelligence Departments and many truths not healthy for public morale would be uncovered and disseminated on a need-to-know basis. It appears that, via some means, the now heretic leaders of Ferrazoika corrupted the mind and soul of house leader Salvador Sondar, the Lord of Vervenhive, convincing the nutrient-tank-bound ruler that Ferrazoika was not going to war and that the two hives were peaceful trade partners, even as evidence of the massive build-up of military strength began to become apparent to Vervenhype's military forces, despite Salvador's attempts to hide intelligence, which he perhaps fully believed in his deluded mental state, were false. The truth, however, could no longer be ignored, and having seen irrefutable orbital information showing the mass advance of the Ferrazoican forces towards Vervenhive, Marshal Nid the head of the Verven primary and chief military officer of Vervenhive decided to act. With Salvador Sondar refusing to respond for calls for the mobilization of the Hive's military, Need instituted laws laid down by Sondar's illustrious predecessor, Hieronimo Sondar, and had the noble house legislature vote to call up the military and prepare for war. Also, the vote called for Sondar to be dethroned and the legislature to take command of the Hive City. Salvador, enraged, slew Nid before he could enact the edict and sever his mind from a Hive's civic and defensive systems. But Nid's action and temporary seizure of power allowed the Hive to muster its defences without which the Zoikin hordes could have broken the walls of Vervenhive immediately. Additionally, requests for aid were sent out across the planet and the local administrative contingent took it upon themselves as servants and representatives of the Greater Imperium to send for aid via astropathic communication to Warmaster Makroth. This would be little consolation to the men of the first primary armoured, who, outnumbered and outgunned, ran headlong into the vanguard of the advancing Zoikan war machine. The battle decimated the formation, and Commissar Cal took command, leading the remnants back to the city. As the battered armoured column sped back towards Sundar Gate, Zuiken long-range artillery began to fire upon the hive, hitting the hab sectors outside the walls and hitting inside the hive. This caused panic amongst the population, and floods of citizens from the outhabs began to flee to the relative safety of the city 
clogging its gates with traffic. Being a true and loyal servant of the throne, Commissar Cal ordered the armoured column to drive through the fleeing crowds, knowing that the hundreds of deaths this caused were worthwhile as the need to preserve the Vervin Hive's armoured forces was essential. Commissar Cole became known as the People's Hero for salvaging these forces, despite the bloody events at the gates, and quickly rose to prominence as the city's wartime propaganda ramped up and is fondly remembered by much of the population. Again, despite some clearly erroneous rumours concerning his conduct in the war that still circulate amongst the surviving noble houses and some other arms of the government. Nid's attempted coup did have the benefit of awakening Salvador to the seriousness of the situation, which shows that his corruption was not complete, and he raised the city's void shields once the lead Zoican forces began bombarding the city from the grasslands beyond. Massive casualties ensued amongst the civilian population, with the ore works and manufactura hit, as well as the transportation depots around Vervia Gate which suffered serious damage, wedging it open, and despite, fort of, and despite attempts to fortify this gateway, it would remain open and be one of the most bloody areas of the conflict, with the Zoikan forces attempting to carry this initial lucky breach of the defences. With the void shields raised, the city's gates ordered closed, the advancing Zoikan forces began to set up masses of artillery, and began a continuous and immense bombardment on both the void shields and sweeping bombardments of the surrounding outer hive, which militarily covered their ground forces advance towards the walls, but also resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of civilians and vervan primary forces trapped outside, cut off from the city, either because of the closing of the defences, or the artillery bombardments, or the advance of the Zoican ground forces. Day 6 The gates to the east and west were left open until the sixth day when the successors to Marshal Need, Marshal Crow, ordered them shut, leaving half a million civilians still trapped outside the hive. The bombardment continued day and night, and the Zoican forces began to surround the hive, and fire began to come in from all sides, turning the outer hive into a fire-ravaged wasteland. The Ferrozoican batteries began to fire over the hive to hit the unprotected docks and habs on both sides of the river Hass. The noble houses argued about the harshness of this decision, leaving so many who had risked everything to travel the circumference of the hive to escape the enemy, and would now still be left to die outside the walls. But the military situation demanded it, and despite votes against, notably from House Chase, the motion was carried by the legislature, and Vervin Hive's gates were closed. Day 8. It took two days for the full armament of Vervin Hive to be raised and armed, Although weaponry on the battlements of the walls and gates had been raised at the start of the crisis, other older and more powerful weapons, housed within the walls themselves, were now manned and unleashed their wrath on the enemy gathering outside. These vast weapons had been dormant since the last trade war, but with their barrels raised, Vervenhive began to exact a toll from the surrounding enemy forces. Day 9 Food, water and energy rationing was instituted on the population, with Commissar Cowell, the people's hero, leading by example, with a speech of his attached to the order stating that he would be not only observing the rationing, but rationing his own rations as well. Astute usage of the Commissar's notoriety had the desired effect on the morale of the population, who wished to be true to the people's hero and his selfless behaviour. Cowell's observations and the last orbital data the Hive had before the siege began led House Command to estimate the Zoican forces numbered 5 million strong, with 80 to 90,000 fighting vehicles and thousands of gun batteries, a staggering force which would have required recruiting almost the entire Ferrozoican population. Day 11. The North Carl Collectives answered the call for aid from Vervin Hive and dispatched the core of its forces, some 20,000 men and 5,000 fighting vehicles, to reinforce Vervenhive, lest Ferrozoica conquer it, cross the river, and attempt to conquer them next. As mentioned, the North Carl forces were some of the most experienced native soldiers on the planet. They began crossing the river using the ferries, or by train and foot, across the Haas Viaduct, 
Civilians were forcibly moved from their path, and it is recorded that 300 were executed by the VPHC to clear their route. The civilian refugees jeered the Northgard troops, who they saw as the reason for this latest horror, with General Zantz of the Second Enforcers stating, This humiliating greeting did more to burn out North Carl morale than a month of bitter resistance on the wall. Day 14. Imperial forces arrived in orbit. Normally, assistance from the wider Imperium to a seemingly civil conflict would take the Imperium months, or perhaps years or decades, to mobilise. But the pleas for assistance to Warmaster Makarov came in time for a troop convoy en route from Monfax to the front line to support the advance into the Cabal systems to be diverted to reinforce Vervenhive. The Imperial reinforcements consisted of the Royal Volpoon 1st, 2nd and 4th under General Notches Sturm, and the 5th and 7th Rowan Deepers under General Nash. Three full regiments of an Armenian armour under General Grismond, and the Tanith first and only under Colonel Commissar Gaunt. It took several days for these forces to be disembarked and moved via the same route as the North Coal forces across the Hass. Morale amongst the population was greatly boosted, and images of these arriving troops and their commanders meeting Vervenhive's leadership and Commissar Cal in particular were spread across the Hive. Day 16 As the last forces of the Imperial troops, the Tanu First, were being ferried across the Hass, the horizon lit up like a newborn sun. Vanikhaev, to the northeast across the Hass, had been silent for days. It was Vervenhive's supplier of Promethean, and the two hives were linked by vast pipelines covered by the Antaba Gate Fortress. It is unknown to this day what occurred here, but it is known that the hive was destroyed by atomic weapons, either purposely to avoid the hive's capture, or simply to remove them as a threat by the Ferrozoican forces. This is the utmost heresy. Atomic weaponry is prescribed and banned by word of the Emperor of Mankind himself since the glory days of the Great Crusade. Marshal Crow ordered their pipeline sealed, and the guilds did, all except one, Amchandus Warlan, who, seeing that Promethean was still flowing from those pipelines under his control, left them open and operational, and succeeded in making vast profits for his guild throughout the siege due to the shortage. This traitor's crimes will be discussed later. Political infighting now appears to have taken place, with tension between the native forces and the off-world commanders on what strategy to take. Commissar Cowell placed himself in between these two factions, taking advantage of his popularity and the resentment of the Vervenhive command to secure his own position in the evolving pecking order of command. This will be a feature of the war and will be explored in this history as we progress, but it underscores the problem of Imperial forces on paper outranking PDF and native forces, despite the practicalities of attempting to impose that kind of authority in reality. Not just Sturm had seniority amongst the Imperial commanders and vetoed the suggestions of General Grismond and Colonel Commissar Gaunt, who advocated for an armoured sally forth to delay and damage the Zoican forces before they could fully encircle and launch a general assault on the city. Day 24. Then, the bombardment stopped. For five days. The tension from the waiting caused psychological and disciplinary problems amongst the Vervan primary and the civilian population, with the VHPC conducting executions on several occasions. Imperial forces deployed to the walls and were spread amongst the Vervan primary to bolster their morale and fighting power. The Tanif forces were deployed to the spoil, the only breach in the Ceramite walls of Vervenhive, but considered nearly impassable due to it being made up of vast piles of industrial and manufacturing waste, and normally defended by a specialist force of the Vervan primary, known as the Spoilers. The fighting here would be intense, and brought the first evidence of the chaotic corruption which had taken over Ferrozoika, when a Tanif sniper, Helene Larkin, unmasked a Zoican trooper, revealing the true horror of the foe. Day 29. The first Zoican assault began, with thousands of enemy troops marching on the gates across the entirety of the walls. With armoured support, as well as dozens of vast siege machines, resembling siege towers, 
which swung upwards to the battlements to disgorge troops directly onto the walls. The horror of the enemy assault nearly broke the green Vervan primary troops, but the presence of veteran Imperial Guard regiments helped steady the line and force the enemy back. Vivergate was the site of some of the heaviest fighting, with the Imperial forces being hard pressed to hold back the enemy. It was held by a large contingent of the Tanif First under Colonel Corbick, as well as the Vervan primary under Colonel Modil, the commanding officer for the gate, with Major Rassin as his second. Colonel Bulwer of the North Col was also deployed with his men, veterans of the Rebellion Wars, in the North Col's lunar colonies. Colonel Modil, being inexperienced, deferred to Colonel Bulwer, who effectively took local command. Colonel Zance of the North Col would later write, You could fire a lasgun on full auto from the wall top and kill dozens, only to see the hole you'd made in their ranks close in the time it took to change power cells. If war is measured by the number of casualties inflicted, then even in that first night, we had won. Sadly, that is not the case. Sundergate nearly fell when one of the siege towers reached the top and deployed flamers, annihilating the Vervan primary, but for the determination of the Royal Volpoon, and particularly the famed Stormtroop of 10th Brigade, who scissored in from neighbouring areas of the wall they were stationed on and cut the Zuiken shock troops to pieces. Major Colchis of the 10th and his second Sergeant Mantis attacked the enemy siege tower with anti-tank mines. Mantis died, but his mines succeeded in destroying the grappling claws, dislodging the foul machine. Colchis lost a hand in the fighting, and the Volpoon would hold back three more assaults and secure Sunder Gate. Hass West Fort was assaulted by several beetle-like siege machines which scaled the walls and then disgorged troops onto the ramparts. They were estimated to be three times the size of a Lehman Rust battle tank and covered in the vile sigils of chaos. Colonel Commissar Gorn took command of the fort when its commander, Colonel Freider, was beheaded by a mortar round and rallied the defenders, who succeeded in holding them back. In one instance, a trooper, Bragg, fired missiles point-blank into the troop deployment opening causing an internal detonation. The most fearsome war machines deployed in this first assault were referred to as the Flat Crabs and Spiders. The Flat Crabs were the size of five Lehman Russ, bolted together, encased in segmented armour and wielding a super-heavy Titan-grade weapon designed to shatter defensive positions. Two, equipped with siege rams, instead of guns, advanced on the gates at Has West and Sonder, leading a veritable ochre-clad horde of Zuiken troops and regular tanks. Second, and more terrifying to the defenders, were the Spiders, the largest war machines in the Zuiken force, excluding the command pyramid deployed later in the war. Five of these 100 meter long eight-wheeler behemoths with cantilever arms allowing them to ascend the walls advanced. As they rumbled forward, rocket and gun batteries across the vehicles fired up at the defenders. Their clawed wheels dug into and dragged them up at the walls. The defenders destroyed two before they reached the walls, but the others scaled them. VPHC Commissar Vokane destroyed one by having his troops roll shells over the lip of the wall onto the ascending war machines, which detonated. Unfortunately, killing the quick-thinking Commissar and 57 of his men in the explosive backwash. Another, which was the war machine which would block Vever Gate when it was destroyed by the North Col and desperate fire from the heavy artillery batches blowing its head off. The final spider reached the top of the walls at Has West Fort and reaped a bloody harvest amongst the defenders until General Grismond had his waiting Arminian tanks arrayed in the House Anko Chem Works elevate their guns and fired as one, smashing the beast backwards off the wall to land on the other side, crushing hundreds of Zoikens assaulting the walls. The Zuiken assault ended at 2am local time into day 30. The remaining flat crabs waddled backwards from the walls into the smoke-reeved and fire-blasted urban landscape surrounding the hive. Every broadcast speaker in the hive played a victory hymn at full volume. Vervin Hive had lost 34,000 troops, 20 missile emplacements, 50 gun posts and 10 heavy artillery silos. The walls were scarred and weak points had emerged, but the enemy's first assault 
had been held. Episode 9, Part 2 The Siege of Vervenhive The first trick a political officer of the Commissariat learns is learn to lie. The second is trust no one. The third, never get involved in local politics. Commissar General Delane Octar. Over the next five days, the Bourbon Hive defenders licked their wounds and reorganized, preparing for the next big push. Artillery fire was continuous, but with the void shields activated, the bulk of the hive was free from damage. Vervea Gate was wedged open by the colossal wreck of the spider tank, which had been brought down by pinpoint artillery fire as it pushed the gates open. Unable to close the gates, the Imperial forces fortified and entrenched around the gate opening, digging trenches, allowing them to create a kill zone around the area. This was a reasonably open stretch of land, as it was formerly the transportation hub, where rail trains from the other hives would come and go with trade resources. Colonel Corbeck and a contingent of ghosts were still stationed here to stiffen the Vervan primary units, and the North Coal forces, which had deployed in full strength along with their artillery. Day 33, the second storm. The Zoikans now concentrated their attack on three vulnerable points, rather than generally across the whole hive. They launched mass artillery bombardments and pushed at these three weakened points in their defences. The defences of Vervea were almost overrun at the start of this attack, and it appears that Colonel Modine, the Vervan primary commander for the area, suffered from a break in morale, unable to cope with the situation, and Colonel Corbeck of the Tenet First and Colonel Bulwar of Northcol enacted a secret arrangement known as Anvil to take command of the sector in the event the Vervan Hive commander failed to do his duty. The assault on Sondair Gate ended with a relatively swift victory for the Imperial defenders, which, after two hours of hard fighting, forced the Zoikins to withdraw. Colonel Grismond, commanding his Narminian armoured forces, lined up in the square of marshals, in a mirror of the Vervan Hive tanks which had done the same before their sally forth and swift annihilation over a month before. Colonel Grismond, who would later achieve the rank of General, redeployed to Vervea before it fell, along with two Vervan primary mechanised regiments and a Volpoon battle group. Unfortunately, the orders from Hive Command were imprecise, and the massed mechanised forces became bogged down in traffic along the roadways of the sector, throttling their movement so that only a trickle of the tanks managed to push in to support the Northgall, Tanith and Vervan primary troops which were being punished by the Zoikans. Grismond, growing furious, ordered his tanks off the main routes and gunned them through the industrial buildings, smashing through factory complexes, chain link fences and following any routes which would allow them to escape the log jam and reach the front. Eventually, VPHC forces interposed themselves between the racing tanks, halting them and demanding they return to the highway. Grisman dismounted his tank, arguing with the VPHC that the route was necessary, whatever damage it may do to the facilities. In the argument that followed, one of the VPHC commissars drew a pistol and was punched by Grisman for the insult. He was arrested along with four of his officers, leaving the battle-hungry Narminians strung out and leaderless, watched by the growing number of VPHC forces surrounding them. This was just one of the terrible events to occur this day due to a lack of discipline and coordination between the off-world guard and the local PDF, and generally pointed to a lack of proper command and control from Hive Command, which showed its faults clearly in the midst of this battle. A friendly fire incident occurred when a Vervan Hive mechanised force with Hydra flat cannons opened fire upon the Volpoon, rushing to Vervea, believing that the Zoikans had broken through the gate and had surrounded them. 13 men died, needlessly. The command structure broke down as the inexperienced Vervan Hivers, whose only experience of war was drills and practice exercises, could not cope with the changing situation. Worse, the Hive's military communication network was modelled on those of the Imperial Guard and, unfortunately, used the same channels as the Guard, meaning that Vox between the different areas was confused 
as Imperial Guard and Vervin High forces spoke over one another, meaning that no one could communicate effectively without interference, except for a close range vox between individual squads nearby. General Nash and his Rowan Deepers stationed at Crowgate was able to re-establish full command of his forces using a wideband transmission his forces had been forced to rely upon during a previous campaign and was a trick his officers were well aware of. The Volpoon had comparable success, but their choice was a band hampered by intense static caused by the Void Shield. At Crowgate, the enemy bombardment of the Adamantine walls was growing so intense that the walls somehow were beginning to dent and glow with the hits from the continuous bombardment of solid shot, rocket and explosive shells. General Nash organised his meagre armoured forces directly inside the gates to counter the 500 strong Zoykin armoured force visible beside the tracks leading to the gate, as well as the mass infantry force which was visible on the outskirts of the ruined house. Nash understood that the gate could not fall with Vervea in such a terrible situation, as two breaks in the wall would strangle the disorganised defenders, allowing the enemy to stream into the hive before troops could be organised and pushed to counter. The fighting at the half-open Vervea gate was intense. Zoykin forces pushed forward, taking horrendous casualties in the process, but attempting to forge a beachhead and secure this point of entry. Wave after wave of Zoykin infantry advanced into the breach, with the defenders on the walls and the defenders inside the breach mowing them down, but it was gradually taking its toll. With reinforcements filtering through slowly, the possibility of a Zoykin victory was still in the balance. As the Zoikans advanced, the Imperial forces were gradually forced back by the mass volleys of firepower from the advancing Zoikin cohorts. However, visibility became limited and street fighting began building to building, enabling the Tanif contingent to utilise squad tactics and the terrain and buildings to best effect. This allowed them to surround advancing units, catching them in crossfires as they advanced further into the hive. The Imperial forces halted the advance and managed to catch the Zoikans in the large open spaces surrounding the Vervea Gate, in the area of the railhead, which was formerly used for trade and rolling stock. The gate itself was still contested by Imperial forces, led by Colonel Corbeck, but Zoikan forces continued to push around their defensive positions and advanced as cited earlier. But with the gate contested still, the Imperium gradually began to check, annihilate and secure a united front line around the gates. The Zoikan forces pushed on relentlessly, hoping that by sheer weight of numbers they could secure the victory. They began to chant, marching in column behind the banners bearing the heraldry of Ferrazoika and other dark runes and glyphs devoted to the Dark Gods. Korm Kolvik prepared to be overwhelmed when mass Lasfire began to cut the Zoikins apart. Nine platoons of Vervan Primary marched upon the gate and turned the tide. Led by the hero of Vervenhive, Commissar Kell, their timely arrival saved the defenders from annihilation and turned the enemy forces, with the few remaining Zoikans forced to flee back through the gate. Kell had left high command at dawn when the attack began, and unable to contact any command channels, he gathered forces as he advanced to Vervea, taking six hours on foot, bypassing the blocked highways and thoroughfares to reach the front. North Karl Armour and men supported the flanks of this rough and ready force, slaughtering the fleeing Zoikans. The Tenif had held the gate alone for an hour, taking terrible casualties due to the mismanagement of the Vervan Hive Command, but it was Commissar Kell who would be known as the hero, quite rightly, for his personal bravery and decisive action, as well as the images of him firing at the enemy and holding the breach with the banner of Vervan Hive in his hand, which would be distributed throughout the Hive, showing the people's hero had once again achieved victory. The gate was soon secured, with additional reinforcements filtering in, along with 50 North Carl tanks, their guns facing the breach. The Zoikans withdrew across the hive with this reversal and the loss of uncountable dead. The Imperial Forces death toll was great, a Vervea gate alone and adjacent spoil sector, which the Zoikans had also struck in force, 500 Vervan hive elite spoilers 3,500 Vervenhive Primary, 900 North Col, and near 100 Tanith had fallen, with many more wounded. Shortly after this victory, Colonel Commissar Gaunt arrived and immediately made for the Vervenhive command position. 
There, he ordered the arrest of the officers present and, summarily executed, Colonel Modil for cowardice. In the aftermath of this victory, many in the Hive began to believe that this was the turning point, and, as the public box system gave the news of the battle, a desperate public began to think the storm had passed, and parties and feasts began in the upper and lower Hives. The worst of these celebrations was broken up by the VPHC. If they thought the Zoikans were defeated, they would be soon rudely awakened from this delusion. Day 35 the Imperial forces licked their wounds and fortified the inner gate of Vervia, and within 12 hours they had raised concrete concentric defensive walls and dug extensive trenches using the many work gangs as labour. Vervea was no longer a weak point, but had become a death trap, with the entrance into the hive a kill zone for any Zoikin forces trying to force it. The Tanif manned the position as well as the elite Blue Blood 10th Brigade of Volpoon Stormtroopers which attempted to work better together, despite previous grievances between the two formations. Political manoeuvring and strife continued amongst the High Command and the Vervan Hive nobility. Commissar Cal, figuring that his great service to the throne in this conflict would lend weight to his requests for a return to active frontline service in the Crusade, manoeuvred to achieve this, using his notoriety as the people's hero for his own purposes. None can doubt his personal bravery or prowess at war, but looking back upon these events, it is clear that even if only subconsciously, Cowell saw this war as an opportunity to restart his career. To that end, he sided with the Vervan Hive Command in its incarceration of General Grismond for disobeying orders when he diverted his armoured column through the property of nobles when rushing to reinforce the breach at Vervea. Also, he supported General Sturm and Marshal Crow who argued against a sally forth by Imperial forces and a continuation of a defensive war, rather than risk their armour outside the Hive's defences. Gaunt was not best pleased by this turn of events and sought to see the release of Grismond, knowing he was a superlative armoured commander and would be needed to lead his Narminians, one of the elite armoured formations in the entire Crusade roster. But having recently executed a high-ranking Vervan primary officer, and being one of the Imperial Guard forces to criticise the shortcomings of the High Command, he had no sway as yet. So for the moment, this clique remained in control of the Imperial forces, and Grismond was held under arrest facing trial. Ever is the way that personal ambition and hubris harm the affairs of man, even when their doom stands before them. At nightfall, the Zoikans resumed their bombardment of the city, and the noise of shells striking the walls and the constant discharge of the voids reverberated throughout the city. The TANIF attached to the Vervan Hive forces defending the spoil deployed scouts and sniper teams into this rough terrain, advancing two kilometres into the spoil, fighting skirmishes with Zoikin infiltrators and snipers along the way. This shadow war would continue throughout the conflict, with snipers on both sides hunting each other. Scout Sergeant McCall would be the first to report the new chant rising from the Zoikin lines. Heritor Asphodel. Heritor Asphodel. The next Zoikin thrust did not come from where it was expected, but from the northeast. The Promethean pipelines from the recently glassed Vanic Hive had been ordered closed and sealed to halt such a situation. But one Gilder, filled with greed and seeing that the Promethean continued to flow, disobeyed this command gaining a massive profit for his house in the cut-off hive. One can blame the hive's authorities for not noticing the situation, or at least not checking that the orders of high command had been followed, but the blame lies with Gilda Amkendurst Wallen. May his name be remembered in infamy. Before Wallen could be brought to justice by Makarov's staff shortly after the siege, he was killed when his other crimes of murder were discovered by a recovering Gaunt after he had attempted to murder and thus silence Medical Officer Dorden and Surgeon Anna Kurth. Using these pipelines, Zoikin sappers infiltrated on Tarby Gate Fortress, or as it was also known, Haz East. Placing mines in the foundations and around this bastion, they detonated in a surprise attack, demolishing a large chunk of the fortress and cracking the defences of Vervenhive. With the foundations of the wall shattered, arch enemy artillery began to pound the remains. The Imperial defenders scattered in confusion as the bombardment and the raging fires 
swept across the walls and the fortress. Haz East had fallen. The guard forces on the scene, including elements of the Tanif First and Rowan Deepers, deployed to bolster the Verve and Primary regiments and reacted commendably quickly, beginning a strong defence of the breach, but against the firepower now firing from directly below the void shields and directed into the hive through the broken defences, there was little they could do but withdraw or die. A fighting retreat began into the urban areas of the hive against the advancing arch enemy infantry and then mass armoured forces moving into the hive through the breach they had carved through with a combination of mines, artillery and heavy energy cutting beams. Ten kilometres south from Haz East, at Crowgate, General Nash spotted an enemy armoured formation of 1,000 vehicles advancing around the hive to the breach at Antarbi Gate. Across the hive's defences, Zoykin forces began to attack. Crowgate was now receiving massive bombardment. Infantry forces were assaulting the spoil and Vervea Gate. Mass heavy armour and infantry formations were assaulting everything from Sondair Gate to Haz West Fort, and everywhere the Vox and throats of the Ferrozoican heretics exclaimed, Herator Asphodel, Herator Asphodel. At Hive Command, Marshal Crow furiously refused the suggestion of General Sturm to evacuate the city and flee across the river, telling him, You were sent here to defend Vervan Hive and that's what you'll do. He ordered the release of General Grismond and the execution of any VPHC official that stood in the way. Sturm, with Grismond, was ordered to Vervea Gate, and Sturm was to take command of that defence. Marshal Crow donned his personal war gear, and with his staff, left to command the defence of Sondair Gate in person, stating, Vervenhive lives or dies tonight. It was at this moment that Salvador Sondair's mind finally broke from the whispers of the traitors of Ferrozoica, playing upon his paranoia and ambition, convincing him to deactivate the shield. The effect was immediate. A subsonic boom washed across the city, blowing windows out across the hive. The temperature dropped by six full degrees instantly as the intense energies of the shield disappeared and the smoke from the fires raging across the defences was sucked into the hive covering it in a dense acrid fog, lit by the great pylon burning itself out with the suddenly disconnected energies, like a vast, furious candle in the centre of the city. Not only this, but there arose a great rumble of noise from the throats of every Ferrozoican throat, a terrifying cry of triumph as they saw victory was at hand and pushed on with ever more fury. Behind the main enemy lines, artillery adjusted their aim. Marshal Crow arrived at Crowgate, armed and armoured in the finest equipment available, just as the shield collapsed, and watched with horror as the true power of the enemy's massed artillery unleashed itself on the city. The walls shuddered, troops, civilians, defences, ramparts, all blown apart by firepower held at bay by the shield for so long. Crow could not leave, knowing that the defenders would lose heart if they saw their commander withdraw at this critical moment. So, raising the sacred blade of Hieronimo Sondair high, he ran to the wall to lead the defence. Suspecting, however, this was no technical fault, he ordered his lead bodyguard to return to the hive on his authority, to deal with the situation. Across the hive, death came. Wave after wave of enemy shells smashed into the central hive slaughtering untold thousands in those first moments. It is estimated that 2.5 million civilians and refugees began to flee north towards the river, hoping to escape the hive and the coming horror. The hive became an inferno as fires raged across it, with the continued boom of shell detonations adding to the chaos. Along the railways leading to the hive, the Ferrozoikans brought up vast rail-bound artillery pieces which launched huge shells into the hive as well as rockets and fire from uncounted Earthshaker barrels. Sergeant Vall, leading a mixed force of guardsmen from Haz East into the Hive's Hab Zones, entered into running battles with Zoykin insurgents who had pushed further into the city via the Promethean pipelines at the same time as the sappers were causing chaos behind the hastily prepared Imperial defences. General Zantz attempted to move up and reinforce the Eastern situation when he and his force of 700 North Coal troops in Chimera APCs were hit with pinpoint artillery 
presumably called in by Zulkin infiltrators, acting as spotters, annihilating the force in a period of minutes, before they could reach the front and help to stem the tide. As the shields collapsed, House Command fell to chaos, and the commanding officer there, and second in command of Vervin Hive's military, Vice Marshal Anko, broke. His mind was unable to comprehend the information flooding the tactical maps and arrays, and the calls for orders and assistance from across the Hive at this critical moment. Stepping away from the tactical display, he smoothed the front of his white dress uniform, adjusted his belt, and drew his auto pistol. He shot the table eight times, and it is reported that he then shot two of the aides nearby, before proceeding to the end of the balcony the command station sat on, overlooking the pack command centre, and began to fire into his own men. It is here that we see the difference between planetary organisations and imperial ones, for instead of executing this mind-broken commander as any righteous true commissar of the progenium would have, a VPHC officer and two servitors try to wrestle him instead, perhaps out of fear of slaying this high-ranking native. Whatever their reason, Anko blew the VPHC officer's head off and, reloading his pistol, continued to fire into his own men. This would be a bad enough situation for House Command, leaving the embattled Imperial forces starved of information and leadership. But then, a vast missile fired directly at Hive Command, smashed through the observation window in a whirlwind of glass, which alone shredded Anko and the majority of the command staff, before detonating, turning Vervin Hive's House Command into a burned out crater in the Hive's surface. Across the Hive, the overwhelming power of the Ferrazulkin artillery was decimating it. The Basilica of the Ecclesiarchy east of the Commercia, which had stood for 2,000 years, through the settlement wars, the colonial uprising, and the pedesto Govandi power struggle, and all the other wars and uprisings of Vervin Hive's history, was demolished by sustained bombardment from a battery of earth shakers, which caused rivers of lead to form from the molten remnants of the mighty church's roof. At Crowgate, General Nash proved his worth when he managed to not only hold off the attacks from outside the gate, but also gathered a force of Rowan Deepers and Vervan Primary to push north to help to stem the tide of heretic forces. As one of the heroes of this terrible moment, he managed to secure the gate and knock out the enemy's thrusts while moving a third of his force, some 1,500 Deepers and 3,500 Primary northwards to push back against the breach at Antarbi Gate. The Deepers, normally considered lazy and too easy going by Crusade Command, showed their prowess in this push, slaying 4,500 Zuykin troops and destroying around 100 armoured units, holding their advance south from the breach dead in its tracks for two and a half hours, before they too were overrun by sheer numbers. The fighting became so intense and brutal in the habs and streets that General Nash would fall in a ruined worker hab before dawn, after being shot 19 times before his last position was overrun and the Zoikans finally moved deeper into the hive. At Sondargate, the situation was a madman's vision of war. As artillery shells flew back and forth and the night was lit by fire, explosions and the constant zap of thousands of LAS rifles firing continuously. Zoikin stormtroopers raised ladders and brought forward siege towers in an anachronistic defiance of the advanced weaponry being unleashed all around them. These siege towers resembling vast mechanical praying mantai used enormous mechanical claws to rip the front of the parapets away and pull down the walls towers before locking their limbs together formed plates or ramps which saw a flood of Zoikins charge directly onto the walls, finally taking them. Marshal Crow died fighting, and would later be found bayoneted through the heart. Sondar Gate had fallen. The defence of Vervea Gate and the spoil was under Colonel Cordray and Major Rowan, and they fought it fiercely for six hours, holding back the Zoikin attack, which came relentlessly, no matter how many they slew. Ammunition was beginning to run down, and they could not contact House Command nor any other unit, so simply continued to hold their position against the Zoikin onslaught. The Tanif snipers and scouts stationed at the spoil reaped a massive toll 
on the Zorkin infiltrators and stormtroopers attempting to break through, but were held in check. And though they kept coming, the outside and gateway of Vervea was a charnel house of dead Zoikins and broken armoured vehicles. Colonel Corbeck's troops and the North Col, under Colonel Bulwer, had been pulled back from the wall for two nights for rest and recuperation, and now advanced back towards the gate. The ghosts heading west and the North Col east, where they could deploy to Crow or Vervea, depending upon the situation. Corbeck eventually made contact with Cordray, informing him that Sunday must have fallen and to prepare for attacks to the rear, as his force of some 300 Tanif were now locked in street fighting with Zulkins, attempting to strike at the gate, exclaiming, This is the one, boys! Do it right or die here! The Tanif forces at their billets were ordered to evacuate to the chem waste ground surrounding their position when the shield fell. Sergeant Bray, in command there, reasoned that the rough terrain would be a better position for the Tanif to dig in and use their skills to the best, rather than remain in a fixed position in a warehouse area which could not be easily defended. This was a canny move by the sergeant, considering he had no orders nor contact with any higher ranking authority, as just as the ghosts began to dig in and entrench themselves, the billets and the entire area they had been stationed in was targeted with heavy bombardment which would have seen the whole force of some 500 Tanif annihilated in one fell swoop. As they could not yet determine what the wider situation was, only that the shield was down and a general attack was taking place, with the fog of war descending upon them, it was the initiative of these veteran officers which enabled the Imperial forces to compose a rough sort of defence in these crucial hours of chaos. Within the VPHC facility, a gunfight had erupted during the attempted execution of General Grismond, with the Volpoon under General Sturm coming to rescue and liberate the Narminians. Commissar Cal was stripped of his rank and placed under arrest by Gaunt for attempted subversion of Imperial law. Grismond would return to his regiment while Gaunt and the Volpoon would ascend to the heights of the Hive to reactivate the shield and remove Salvador Sunder from his position. At the same time, the Lord Chase and Marshal Crow's bodyguard were doing the same thing, and the three forces joined together, fighting through the now clearly corrupted ruler of Vervenhive servitor bodyguards. Salvador Sonda had been broken in body and mind, and fallen utterly to chaos, in his insanity, festering in his insanity within his amniotic tank. He had pledged himself to Herator Asphodel, and as a reward he had been gifted with a chaotically corrupted servitor, a mechanical horror of enormous proportions. Sondaire's fascination with his meat toys was infamous in the noble houses, and many efforts had been made to curtail his surgical whims and clone farming over the years, from a history of Vergast. This thing was truly terrible, more even than the deluded creation of a mad flesh engineer. The insanity of the warp was in it, 1800 kilos of scarred meat and gristle, bigger than a hurricane antelodon. A jigsaw of human parts fused into the carcass of a wild uruk from the grasslands. Limbs twisted and writhed around it, some with grasping hands, some animal, some wet. Glistening pseudopods like muscular feet of giant mollusks. The massive head was an oilless mouth of needle teeth that smacked slackly and gurgled. The donor oruk's vast horns swept outwards from the low skull crest. A multitude of cables, feeder tubes and wires suspended it, but unlike the other meat puppets, this thing moved of its own volition, pouring and stamping the soft carpet, writhing and pulsing. The smell was overwhelming, from a history of the later Imperial Crusades. A terrifying combat ensued as the beast took the punishment of the surviving force. The Volpoon elite racked the beast with hellgun fire and it took this punishment, along with fire from the rest of the force. It was in this moment that Commissar Cal sacrificed himself and regained his honour when he threw himself at the beast with a canvas web of grenades taken from one of the fallen. This is one of the reasons Commissar Cal has not been expunged from Imperial records and in the popular consciousness of the citizens of Vervenhive, he is still remembered as the people's hero, for the muddy details of earlier events have not been divulged to the general populace. Gilbert, given permission by Gaunt as a kind of payment 
for the Vulpoon saving the Commissar in this struggle, was allowed to end Salvador. He fired his Hellgun through the amniotic tank's viewing porthole, leaving the writhing and decrepit ruler in the now fluidless tank before firing a grenade in to finish the job. The mortally wounded Lord Chase was the only one who could reactivate the shield, its systems being locked to any but those with the genetic code of one of the noble born, and he did manage this before he succumbed to his wounds, saying in his last moments, Sic Semper Tyrannis. The Last Ditch With the shield reactivated, the Zoikans were deprived of their advantage, and despite their vast numbers, the defenders now had a chance to counter. Cordre and Rorn extracted their forces and withdrew from Vervea Gate, before they could be encircled, adding to the Imperial Forces' formation of a strong line of defence within the Inner Hive, as the Imperial Forces withdrew from the walls in a vast fighting withdrawal, until they could find firm ground and set up a solid front. Colonel Corbeck's troops holding the warehouse of Guild Gathran Agriculture formed the centre of the line, with retreating units forming up alongside this ramshackle defence. In the northeast, Sergeant Val, with a mixed force of 170 men from Tanith, Primary and Deepers, was holding the northern shore and the now burning docks. Heretic armour had taken the bridge and were pushing forces directly into the hive, with the Promethean depots now ablaze and the few Imperial units in the area withdrawing before the enemy. The end seemed nigh, but relief was coming. Commissar Colonel Gaunt now took command. Major Ott, the senior surviving Vervan primary commander, presented Gaunt with, with the sword of Hieronimo Sunder and handed command of the hive to him. General Sturm had been found attempting to flee with the refugees across the river. He was stripped of command and placed under arrest after treacherously ordering the evacuation of the city and attempting to shoot Gaunt. Many grave events for the Imperium would stem from this moment, but we will cover them later. Although technically General Grismond had higher rank, armour are always subservient to infantry commands. Gaunt took command and began to reorganise and provide leadership to the shattered Imperial forces. This had an immediate effect. Word was also sent to Crusade Command, with Gaunt stating, I will not ask Makarov for aid, but I want him to understand the situation here. If he deems it worthy of his notice, he will assist us. The newly released General Grismond rejoined his Narminiad Armoured and immediately drove this elite regiment towards Antarbi and Crow Gates to counter the incoming Zoikin Armoured forces flowing into the city, stating, Let's give them hell! The North Carl Armoured groups left without direction in the centre of the hive were ordered south to Sondair Gate and to reinforce the Tanith forces under Colonel Corbeck. Imperial units across the hive were contacted and received orders from Gaunt. Known as a strong infantry commander and frontline officer, Gaunt had never been given the opportunity of high command, and this is looked back upon as a defining moment in his career, where Crusade Command noted his skill and ability as he forged a concerted defence and counter-attack against the Zoikin horde. Many reflected that he reminded them of Slado in this moment, showing drive and purpose, being able to handle information and direct forces which would have been viewed as an impossible task by many commanders. This was noted amongst even the highest echelons of the Crusade. It was during this time that the Scratch companies made themselves known. Civilians and workers, as well as Vervan primary troopers who had been separated from their units over the last several weeks, had formed into companies, armed with whatever weaponry they could find, battling it out in the vicious street fighting that erupted since the Zorkins pushed into the city, and before, with many being left stranded outside the walls in occupied territory. Many of these bands have been formed, but still to this day it is unknown how many. As Colonel Bulwer's North Coal divisions were being cut to pieces at crossroads FG-567 in the Eastern Habs by heretic armour and near overrun, he laid about him with his power claw and fired point blank with his auto pistol, believing this was the end. When, 
all of a sudden, a large contingent of these civilian militia came to their aid, led by a spoil worker known as Argon Sorik, a smeltery foreman before the war. Using industrial equipment, such as mining charges looted from the storehouses of their workplaces, they merged with the regular troops, stabilizing the situation somewhat, and pushed back this latest wave of Zulkin attackers, until the Narminian army arrived. General Grismond was fast becoming and would be a legend in the Sabbat Crusade, with his Narminian armoured forces being elite tank killers with an impressive kill count. Here he showed his skill as a master of armoured warfare during the engagements, which are still taught to trainee tank commanders to this day. The Narminian tankers were the elite, with only those capable of moving at pace and being able to fight accurately and repeatedly qualifying for entrance into the regiment. Having been ordered to advance to the east, Grisman marshalled his forces into a solid column, safe from the kind of punishment the North Col armoured forces, with the shield now raised. He dispatched sentinel and foot base spotters ahead, knowing that they could not give him the exact location of the enemy, but would be able to give estimates of their numbers and their direction of advance. He ordered his tank column south, then east, to catch the front of the enemy's armoured push in the flank. His plan was to launch a full tank strike, and enact a personal speciality of theirs, the scissors. Once they had found the front wedge of the Zoikin armour, 40 Narminian heavy tanks gunned forward at full speed, firing into this surprise Zoikin armoured column, smashing through them before turning around on the far side to run through the damaged and confused enemy force. They had already destroyed 72 enemy armoured vehicles, but as they turned, the rest of the Narminian armoured began their assault so that both sides would attack both flanks as one, and showing the superiority of his tankers, they never suffered a single friendly fire casualty nor collision, as they had experience from conducting the scissors nine times in previous campaigns. Using Vox beacons to help distinguish who was friend from foe, the Narminians annihilated the Zoikans' push in the jaws of the scissors. Over the course of the 35th day, the Narminians conducted three more scissor strikes, breaking the Zoikans and forcing them back and back, littering the inner hive with the shattered, burned out hulls of heretic armour. In a few hours, the Narminians had lost two tanks for 200 Zoikans, a fine tally which stabilised the front, but the heretics had an almost endless stream of armour to call upon. Come nightfall, all the units in the east were able to resupply and begin to push forward to support the Narminians' thrust. Towards Sonder and Verveer gates in the south, the situation was not as good. The North Kal armour had not the inspired leadership of Grismond, and Major Clodel, their commander, fell to straight up dueling with the Zoikans in a crash of armour, which although it held the line, saw no gains and a steady loss of Imperial tanks. With that, the 35th day ended. The city was shattered, the population were trapped, killed or fleeing across the river. The battlements had fallen and now the Imperial line was being held with intense city fighting to hold back the Zoikans pushing deeper. Without the Imperial forces, Vervenhive would already be broken, but with their support and example, the primary fought on for every inch of their home. It seemed they had only a few days left before they would be overrun, and even now the Zoikans were pushing hard to reach and destroy the shield pylon, with the Imperials being pushed back slowly towards the only thing giving them the edge in the struggle. That our beloved hive should be conquered or should fall into controlling hands of unwise or unfit masters, I greatly fear and sadly anticipate. For this reason, I entrust this ultimate sanction to you. Use it wisely. Hieronimo Sonder to the Lord Chase. As Gaunt went to the Imperial Chapel at the new command center, he was visited by one Merity Chase, the daughter of the recently deceased Lord Chase, who had sacrificed himself that day to reactivate the shield. She brought with her a relic, left in safekeeping with her family by the late great Hieronimo Sonder, to be used in only the most apocalyptic situations, though it is doubtful he saw this eventuality. No, his fear was that a more regular enemy, or an unfit ruler who would become a tyrant, would gain control of the democratic legislature of Vervenhive. 
Democracy, as all emperor-faring men know, is at minimum borderline heresy. But across the realm of man, all sorts of backward and nonsensical beliefs are allowed to fester. So long as the world in question does its duty and pays its tithe to him on earth. She gave him a system slayer. A potent tech weapon, designed to, if used, fundamentally destroy the electronic and codifier capabilities of the Hive. The idea being that if a tyrant arose and had complete technological mastery of the Hive, by deploying this the citizens would be able to revolt, without the tyrant using the systems and power of the Hive's infrastructure to protect themselves. Everything would shut down and die. That was the idea, anyway. House Chase had long specialised in the creation of codifier systems and sentient cogitators, under the supervision and partnership with the Adeptus Mechanicus, so had built this near doomsday device at the greatest Sundar's request to act as a weapon of last resort to defend the city and its freedom. On another matter, and before we go on, and for the sake of probity, please know that this is worth noting for the record only, and due to how events would later unfold for Colonel Commissar Gaunt that it was on this night that he and the Lady Chase became intimate. The result of this encounter would emerge several years later. Day 36 The Spike Has West Fort was now cut off and surrounded. Of the original 5,000 Vervan primary guardsmen and artillerymen manning the wall's guns, only a remnant of some 600 able men remained. The lower part of the fort was aflame, and broken, most of the guns were destroyed or out of ammunition, leaving this meagre remnant with only their las rifles. So it was a surprise that the fort and its gate still stood. With enemy forces entering the hive from the south, they had encircled the fort, and its acting commander, Captain Cargan, estimated they could hold for another hour, if not reinforced. But reinforcements were coming to relieve them, fighting their way from the centre of the hive, of the Hive's defensive walls. That was until the Spike came into range. The spotters on Has West Fort sighted it approaching from the west, a vast 500 metre high pyramid, moving upon multiple enormous caterpillar units, demolishing all in its path, leaving a half kilometre trail of destruction behind it as it slowly, but with unstoppable momentum, approached the Hive. Painted in the ochre of Ferrazoika, and with vast chaotic glyphs on its sides, it had enormous starship level plasma weaponry based within it. This weapon lit and fired, annihilating Has West Fort in one enormous blast, punching yet another hole in the adamantine walls of the hive. This again shows the horror of the forces of chaos, for though they were in possession of this fearsome weapon, they did not use it until the end, and happily threw their deranged followers into certain death. Another thing that became clear to Gaunt and the Imperials was that this was the den of the heretic leader Heritor Asphodel, as this spike, as it became known, was the source of the Vox signals calling his name, which permeated the Zoikin communications in a constant chant. The Imperials decided that they must strike at the Spike. The Hive may fall anyway, but would certainly if this fell weapon was brought to bear on the main spire. So this offered a chance for survival, to reclaim some small measure of justice for the people of Bourbon Hive, and potentially remove a grave threat to the Crusade by slaying this Heritor and perhaps, perhaps break the Chaos Horde, as had been seen in other campaigns, at the loss of their champions. So it was decided a strike team of the elite forces remaining drawn from the Volpoon and Tanith was gathered along with guides selected from the Scratch Companies. They approached the Spike stealthily, a Tanith speciality, and climbed buildings the Spike was passing by to jump onto the fell machine. Gaunt himself using the power blade of Hieronimo Sundar to cut open hatchway. The strike team first struck at the main gun decks, clearing them of enemy presence, but they were unable to knock out the gun. They then fought their way through the spike, coming up against elite heavy Zoican troopers through the mass of the spike's inner hallways, with enemy ambushes striking from every direction, 
bursting from the ceilings and flanks, using their knowledge of the structure to strike at the Imperials. But they fought through this, eventually reaching the command deck. During the firefight and melee that erupted, Gaunt fought his way, more by accident than design, to the central platform which had upon it an energy shielded dome, and was there met by the shimmering half demonic dark watch bodyguard of the Heritor. With all his skill he fought these heretic elites, using the blade of Sundar to parry the chaos tainted blades of these abominations. He beheaded one of these beasts in the furious sword play that followed, but was wounded in the leg and fell. Trooper Bragg, cradling an auto cannon single handed, saved Gaunt from death when he made the platform and fired his heavy weapon point blank on full auto into one of the beasts. The rest of the strike team, having cleared the command deck of enemy forces, quickly joined him, adding their fire to his. Two more of these fell creatures materialised on the platform, and one, wielding a cruel pike, managed to slay one of the team before its head was blown off from a Hellgun's underslung grenade launcher. The other two were eventually atomised as their corporeal forms could no longer withstand the whirlwind of Laz and Hardrain striking them. Gaunt made for the main cogitator and logic stacks of the spike, attempting to unleash the system slayer of House Chase. The strike team were holding the entrance to the command deck against a horde of Zoikans attempting to fight their way through and retake it. And outside in the city itself, the Imperial forces were being pushed back, despite the heavy casualties they were inflicting upon the enemy. The spike also fired its main gun, the deck having been recruited, and annihilated the shield pylon, removing Vervenhive's protection and allowing the Zoikan artillery to unleash its fury on the hive once more. Gaunt inserted the System Slayer amulet, and with a perverse purr, it went to work. The lights flickered two, three, and four times before cutting out completely, and the vast engine of death came to a sudden halt, all its power cut, leaving nothing but silence and darkness. With the vast machine dead, the shield dome in the centre of the command deck collapsed, revealing its occupant the Heritor Asphodel himself. The Chaos Warlord stood, half demonic, with a cloak of shadow darker than the blackness of the lightless command deck. Gol Collier from the Scratch Company struck the creature with his axe rake, the tool of the labourer, and was thrown across the deck by a swipe of the beast's fist. Scout Sergeant McCall shot it twice, but was also sent through the air with a broken shoulder. Domar's lasgun blew up in his hands as he pulled the trigger. Others of the team were slain by the chaotic creature until Commissar Colonel Ibram Gaunt, bearing the sword of Hieronimo Sundar, thrust it into the beast chest up to the hilt, the blue power field illuminating the scene as the blade pierced the creature's back. For his efforts, and in a last act of malice, Heritor Asphodel fired his bolt pistol into Gaunt's heart. With this act, we have richly denied the darkness and made trophies of its creatures. A dark lord is dead. So, this holy crusade, blessed by the Emperor, is advanced to glory. Warmaster Makarov at Vargas. Day 50 Remembrance Learning via the Astropathicus that Vervenhive faced not an inconsequential rival hive, but a hunted Chaos Commander, Makarov had made best speed for Vargast. Arriving after 27 days of urgent transit through the war, the hazy sky was full of metal and looked like it should fall. The awesome power of the Imperium was there for every Vargasite to see. 10,000 ships, some the size of cities, some bloated like ornate oceanic turtles, some slender and serrated like airborne cathedrals. Makarov unleashed his might upon the planet below. Six million guardsmen, half a million tanks, squads drawn from three chapters of the Adeptus Astartes, two Titan legions. Troop dropships, bulk machine lifters and shuttles dropped in a swarm on the Haz Valley. For a while, the sky did fall. Mass destruction followed, lasting for five days. Though it was brutally one-sided, 
Hieronimo's amulet had done its work and cut the insidious chatter for all time. By the time the Warmaster's immense forces arrived, the Zoikans were already in total rout. Aimless and lost, they broke off the final assault. Many committed suicide or wandered blindly into the defenders' fields of fire to be massacred. Millions of others woke, as if from a dream, and stumbled without purpose or motive back into the grasslands. Under Grisman's command, the battered Imperial forces that had held Verven High for over a month reformed to drive the pitiful, bewildered invaders out. Narminian and Norskarl tank brigades chased down and annihilated Zoikan motorized units, threading back across the grasslands towards their own hive. Colonel Bulwer and Major Ott, utilizing every troop-carrying machine they could raise, hunted out and slaughtered the fleeing troop elements in vast numbers. There was no question of mercy. Ferrozoika's taint had to be expunged. By the time Makarov's armada made orbit, the Zoikans had been driven back 600 kilometers into the plains, leaving vehicles and equipment scattered and abandoned in their wake. In the crippled hive itself, Scratch Company slowly weeded out the last feral pockets of Zoikin resistance. The Warmaster followed up with unstinting vigor. He politely but determinedly requested the assistance of the Iron Snake Space Marine chapter to overtake and neutralize the fleeing enemy. His armored brigades poured down the main highways and decimated everything that lived. Skeletal titans, shrieking like wraiths, stalked at the grassland horizons, incinerating the retreating foe. On the 54th day, Crusade warships torched Ferrozoika High from low orbit. The blinding flame flare filled the southern horizon, but by then, the fight was out of the Zoikans, and had been since the 37th day. Without the hypnotic chatter to unify their cause and drive them on, they had crumbled. Imperial Fist Space Marines ceremonially destroyed the spike, and incinerated the Heritor's corpse. From a history of the later Imperial Crusades. The victory was won, but Vervenhive was dead. The Warmaster himself signed the dissolution warrant, leaving Vervenhive a dead and wrecked ruin. A necropolis. The noble families and people, however, would go on to form two new hives, founded from the refugee population. Each would take generations, and perhaps centuries, to match the productive capacity and size of dead Vervenhive. But they would, eventually, and Vargast would once again be an asset to the Imperium. One would be led by House Chase, which would devote itself to mining and servitor engineering. The other, under House Anko, would move in to exploit the now unoccupied Prometheum Fields, once owned by High Vanek, which was now an irradiated crater. In the years to come, there would be rivalry and blood, as the descendants of these cities grew and the horrors of the past were forgotten. Ambition and greed would once more set into their hearts. But those things are for another history. Additionally, the Warmaster signed the Act of Consolation, whereby any citizen of Vervenhive who felt that they no longer wished to live upon Vargast would be accepted into the ranks of the Imperial Guard, where they could escape their former lives and in the Holy Crusade gain absolution and favour in the God Emperor's eyes by slaying the heretic on other worlds. 40,000 took this offer, and for regiments like the Tanith, it was a boon, as so many ghosts had fallen that it would be fast approaching a troop strength where it would no longer be a sustainable fighting formation without the infusion of fresh recruits. Overnight, the dying Tanith first doubled in strength, taking into their ranks many of the Verban primary and members of the Scratch companies who did not wish to stay on a world with ghosts and sought a new life amongst the stars. Gaunt should have died from the Heritor's bolt, but the Emperor does indeed protect, and the shell was deflected by a metal flower which Merity Chase had gifted to him to wear and remember her by. He dropped the shards that Dr. Dorden had dug from his flesh into the waters of the River Hass, as he boarded the ferry which had originally brought him to the hive, and where he had seen Hive Vanek die at the start of the campaign. A little later, a monument of remembrance was built, called the Chase Memorial, by the artist Thoreau of Northcol. It is a single guardsman, cast in steel 
made from the rendered down weapons of the fallen. It resembles a Tanif ghost, but only vaguely, being a memorial to all who fell. One fist is raised in eternal defiance. The War Master, though content and pleased with the securing of Vargast and the final destruction of one of the greatest enemy warlords arrayed against him, prepared for the next big push in the Crusade. The Kapal systems were the next great struggle and would see the Imperial forces pushed to the limits across multiple fronts for the next two years as Makarov attempted to take free of the notorious fortress worlds. During this struggle, a miracle happened, without which the Crusade may have lost heart and faltered, and we will cover those events next time. The History of the Sabbat World's Crusade, Episode 10 Following the victory at Vervenhive, Makarov did not linger, and immediately redeployed the vast army he had moved there, back to the front line of the Crusade to enact the next stage of the operation to defeat the armies of the Archenemy and liberate the Sabbat Worlds. The forces of the original Imperial Relief Force, of which the Tanif First were a part, was attached once more to the Second Front, and would be ultimately deployed to the planet Hagia to counter the cultist army which had invaded. The Cabal Assault Makarov continued to subdivide his force and push them into the Cabal group, taking advantage of the still disordered and disorganised archenemy forces, which allowed him to capture worlds with small forces swiftly, rather than having to gather vast armies and take them slowly if the enemy were able to mobilise and concentrate their considerable assets. This situation would however change in a short time, with the rise of a new Archon and the leader of the Damned. But for the moment, the Crusade had the initiative and the scope to spread out and gobble up as much territory as it could while the enemy was still in a shambles. The War Master did, however, begin to amass a large concentration of forces to assault the Cabal group, with the aim of smashing into this heavily defended territory and, then as Slado had done during Operation Red Drake, break out in another wave of multi-pronged rapid assault, taking the whole region and pushing back the archenemy to their own home turf, into the sanguinary worlds on the very border of our galaxy and the Halo Zone which had spawned them. Ever wanting to prove himself and outdo his predecessor, Makarov planned an ambitious assault on the Cabal systems. Nineteen worlds would be assaulted, amongst them three of the fortress worlds of the region, including the meat grinder of Moorland. This plan appeared to be working, and by the end of 770, eight worlds had fallen to the Crusade, and the Imperium now held significant footholds deep within the Cabal systems. This, in turn, forced the archenemy to retreat towards the trailing edge of the galaxy and their home region. The monumental Imperial Crusade to liberate the Sabbat World Cluster from the grip of chaos had been raging for over a decade and a half, when War Master Makarov began his daring assaults on the strategically vital Cabal system. This phase of reconquest lasted almost two whole years and featured a bravura, multi-point invasion scheme devised by Makarov himself. Simultaneously, Imperial assaults were launched against 19 key planets, including three of the notorious Fortress Worlds, shaking the dug-in resolve of the numerically superior but less well-orchestrated enemy. From his War Room logs, we know that Makarov fully appreciated the scale of his gamble. If successful, this phase of assault would... It virtually guarantee an overall Imperial victory for the campaign. If it failed, his whole crusade force, an armed host over a billion strong, might well be entirely overrun. For two bloody bitter years, the fate of the Sabbat World's crusade hung in the balance. Serious analysis of this period invariably focuses on the large-scale Fortress World theatres, most particularly on the 19-month war to take the Fortress World of Moorland. But several of the subsidiary crusade assaults conducted during this phase are deserving of close study, especially the liberation of the Shrine World Hagia and the remarkable events that afterwards unfolded there. From a history of the later Imperial Crusades. Hagia As an example of the campaigns going on at this time, once more we will draw heavily upon the regimental archives of the Tanif first and only. 
which is both the most detailed history on an individual unit within the Crusade and a regiment whose activities and members would be and had been so important to the success of the Crusade's efforts. As has so often been the case in this history, the Tanif First, newly enlarged with fresh troops from the volunteers of Vergast, found themselves involved in an initially minor campaign, but one which would prove disproportionately important to this period of the Crusade. The shrine world of Hagia was the birthplace of the Saint Sabbat, whom had been a shepherd girl on this backwards world. After she fell, she and various relics from her life were laid to rest with her, and the planet became an important but minor shrine world, attracting a small but steady stream of pilgrims. It was also the base of operations for the Ecclesiarchy-approved subcult of the Iante, a missionary group which, since her death, travelled and preached the word of the saint and the emperor across the Sabbat cluster. Somehow this world had avoided the attentions of the archenemy, perhaps because of its relative isolation and minor strategic importance as the Sabbat cluster fell to the archenemy prior to the crusade. But in 770 it was invaded by Patas Sin and his cultist army, the Infadi. The word Infadi was the Hegean word for pilgrim and thus was an insult to both the imperial faithful in general and particularly the Aeanti priesthood, which was a, an ecclesiarchy-sanctioned imperial cult which travelled across the Sabbath worlds and beyond, spreading the message of the saint and acting as guardians of the spiritual legacy of Saint Sabbath. Hagia was their base of operations, but they were present throughout the entire region, basing themselves at prominent points of pilgrimage or simply travelling the routes the saint had with other pilgrims. These rabid cultists were reasonably well equipped and garbed in green silk robes covering bodies often tattooed with such heresies as images of the saint engaged in acts with demons and other chaotic imagery. They had not fully conquered the world when the imperial force under General Lugo arrived, but the planetary capital, the Holy Doctinopolis, had fallen to them. And the High King of Hagia, essentially the temporal overlord and designated imperial governor, had been executed publicly. Lugo was one of Makarov's newly minted commanders, brought in with the new war master's ascension as one of his men. Many, such as Urians, would serve with distinction and be an asset. Others would fall short and prove the misgivings of many of Slado's older officers, who looked upon this new generation as upstarts with unearned positions. Lugo had overseen the debacle at Arcilia 9, which should have been a swift victory, but turned into, under Lugo, a bloody 20-month campaign. Lugo's command abilities were already being questioned when his next deployment met similar problems when he was commanded to take the world of Karakarid in the opening of the Cabal assault, which should have fallen quickly but again devolved into a gruelling and costly conquest a board of inquiry was set up to investigate Lugo's actions in these campaigns, the internal politics of high command ensuring that there were those who would gladly seek the scalp of a rival, particularly one that may be dangerously inept at command. Lugo somehow managed to get the command for the Hagia campaign and was desperate to achieve a victory in this spiritually significant theatre, which would aid him in the ongoing investigations and help to clear his name of a solid and significant victory. This explains the rash actions of Lugo during the campaign, where he pushed forward, against the advice of field officers such as Colonel Commissar Gaunt, to take the Shrine City quickly, pushing in infantry forces which activated a booby trap left by the Infadi. It was some kind of heretical curse or ritual conducted on the site of the city's citadel, turning it into a corrupted place. When it activated, it had within it the main strength of the Brevin Regiment, which assaulted what they thought to be the last stand of the Infadi forces. This trap activated, slaying them all and turning the entire citadel into an untouchable area, which could not be approached as troops sent there began suffering nosebleeds and nausea the closer they got. It appears that this heretical manifestation, when activated, fed on the souls of the Brevins and became a psychic beacon which attracted the attention of a large chaos fleet which began moving to Hagia to aid their archenemy brethren in their sacrilege of the Shrine World. General Lugo ordered a withdrawal, but not before dispatching the ghosts, in a last mission, somewhat ill-spiritedly, 
as he seems to have blamed them for this incident, to march on the shrine hold of Hagia and to reclaim the saint's remains before the Infardi got there or the Chaos Fleet arrived. This they almost managed, but were surrounded by the considerably larger Infardi army at the shrine hold. They fought a gruelling battle until one martyr, a trooper Vamberfield, heavily wounded, activated the shrine hold's ancient wards, which laced the shrine, and the ancient defences set to work and appear to have slain most of the Infardi, perhaps attacking those with corrupted souls. It also created a psychic shockwave in the warp, which scattered the Chaos Fleet and saved the world from a heavier invasion. Pater Sin, however, survived and fled the planet with some number of his followers, presumably using hidden transports or with a ship in orbit. The ghosts would meet him again, as he remained active in the region. Vamberfield was honoured by the Iante for his sacrifice, and was entombed near the shrine. The Archon and the Blood Pact In 771, the Crusades' advance faltered, as the strung out, many-pronged assault into the Cabal systems and the Khan group was struck by a concerted and powerful counterattack by the enemy. For the first time in years, the Arch enemy were back on the attack, no longer simply defending and getting pushed back towards the Halo Zone. It became rapidly clear that a new Archon had arisen and had unified and solidified his rule over the disparate Chaos forces. His name was Erlok Gur. To discuss him, we must understand the nature of his forces, the Blood Pact, his personal army, and what would become the most feared element of the Arch Enemy's various hordes of damnation. The Arch Enemy forces at the inception of the Crusade were a mixed force of cult and tribal armies, as well as traitor guard and planetary defence forces which threw their lot in with the enemy. It was a fairly undisciplined force compared to the glorious armies of the Imperium, but it was swift and ferocious, especially when augmented by small forces of Xenos mercenaries, traitor Astartes, and the mass horror of the woe engines of the Heritor, as well as utilising forces of demonic nature. As noted previously, the sanguinary worlds lie beyond the edge of Imperial territory in the Halo Zone, which has the last scattering of worlds from our galaxy before the great interstellar depths of space between galaxies. The chaotic forces which invaded the Sabbat worlds did so from this region, and we can hope to gain further information about the various vile civilizations and cultures which exist in this region once Imperial guns and blades have purged it fully, which Emperor Willing will come soon. The Blood Pact originated on one of these worlds as a priesthood which acted as the personal guard of their ruler, the Gur. They were a warrior elite which was well versed in combat as it was in the twisted beliefs of the fell powers and were responsible for the correct worship of their society's demonic god. Eventually this warrior priesthood evolved into a true bodyguard for the ruling Gur. And as the Gurr's influence and power grew, they became leaders of their armies. The Gurr's armies grew vast, and so did the Blood Pact, until most, if not all, of their warriors were, in fact, Blood Pacted. The name itself comes from the ritual of pacting, which entails a warrior to swear allegiance to the Gurr personally, and to gash their hands on the sharp edges of the Gurr's battle armour. This appears to create a fanatical devotion to the Gurr, and it is quite startling to think that every blood pack soldier encountered by the Imperium has in fact met with and sworn personal allegiance to Erlok Gur. In his discourse upon the vile and hateful servants of ruin, Barbel wrote, The true and natural likeness of the being sworn into the vile blood pact is rarely seen, for they choose to conceal their faces behind snarling iron face masks of a crude and ancient pattern. It is certain, for the most part, that they are human, or human mutants, though unconfirmed rumours speak of other Xenos breed creatures inducted into their ranks. In general terms, the blood-packed warriors encountered by Imperial forces usually resemble a ragged or barbaric regiment of the Imperial Guard. They wear fabric battle dress uniforms, either looted from the corpses of guardsmen or manufactured to resemble a basic Imperial design. 
Over this are worn packs, webbing, and the usual assortment of infantry kit, including heavy field boots and a steel bowl helmet. Because their kit, equipment, and battle dress is essentially a mix of plundered and homemade, no two blood pack troopers are ever identical. Their appearance is rough and ill-kempt, their clothing torn, patched, and dirty, and helmets chipped and grazed. True to their name, the warriors of the pact present themselves in blood red. The bowl helmets are painted an arterial crimson, and the uniforms dyed red. It is common knowledge that the blood of enemies is used for this latter purpose, as one of the pact's sorcerous rituals prior to battle. As a result, the blood pact exude a revolting carnal stink, made even less pleasant by the unguents and oils with which they anoint their bodies, and their own parlous standards of hygiene. The only exposed part of a blood pack warrior's body is his hands. These remain bare and ungloved to display the ghastly ritual scars across the palms and knuckles made at the time of induction to the pact. In cases where blood pack troopers have been captured or when opportunities have arisen to examine their corpses, it has often been found that the ritual scarring covers other parts of the body and face. The ritual iron visors, known as grotesques, worn by the blood pact are variations on a single basic design. The masks portray a howling, screaming, grimacing, some say leering face, often with a great hooked nose or chin, or both, like a carnival mask. For most ranks, this mask is pitch black, though senior commanders may wear silver or even gold grotesques. Such officers also affect uniform styles equivalent to the Imperial Guard, with epaulets, gold frogging and jackpoots, etc. The Blood Pack speak all the languages of corruption, and due to their many origin worlds, a heterodox mix of Imperial dialects and sub-dialects as well. However, Warmaster Makarov's tactical advisers have determined that the Blood Pack use their own unique battle tongue or combat jargon in theatre, this, so far, has proved indecipherable. The Blood Pact, by their very nature, have no homeworld. They recruit from the murky feral worlds of the Chaos Marches beyond Imperial territory, and also from the populations of worlds they conquer and overrun. Every member of the Blood Pact, and tactical estimates suggest there may be as many as three quarters of a million Blood Pact warriors, is personally inducted into service by the Gore himself. To prove his allegiance in blood to both the gore and the blood god, each aspirant ritually gashes his hands on the sharpened edges of the gore's battle armor. Gore's blood pact have been encountered in combat during the early years of the crusade, but never properly identified. However, once he became Archon, the blood pact became a backbone element of the Chaos Host. It is believed many other arch-enemy units and divisions, wishing to prove their loyalty to the new Archon, converted to the Blood Pact. The trained and disciplined nature of the Pact also appealed to the many converted, corrupted or treacherous Imperial Guard units captured during Nadzibar's occupation of the Savage Worlds. Within just a few years, the Crusade forces came to recognise the Blood Pact as the elite infantry of the arch-enemy. The Blood Pact is a martial force of distinction, a fact that often takes its enemies by surprise. The forces of Chaos are often feral, ruthless and zealous, and while savage assets in battle, these qualities often mitigate against effective battlefield operation. Unlike, for example, the Kith, who followed Sholan Skara, the Blood Pact is not an army of poorly equipped fanatics who overrun their enemies by sheer berserk fury. The Blood Pact is drilled and trained in warfare techniques to a standard of competence at least equivalent to the Imperial Guard. They have excellent, often captured, communication systems and an unshakable chain of command, meaning they can be confidently deployed with tactical precision. The Blood Pact can hit specific targets or accomplish specific missions, and individual warriors have the intelligence and field training to operate independently, if necessary, for the pack's interests. This is what makes them so dangerous. They are not mindless fanatics. They are excellent battlefield soldiers in the sworn service of chaos. 
The sheer efficacy of the blood pact operations can be demonstrated by the Battle of Akarite Peninsula on Belshar Binary in 771. A force of 200 blood pack troopers, supported by four stork tanks and two loxital brood groups, cut off, overwhelmed and annihilated a force of 3,000 Imperial Guardsmen. The pack force was commanded by an officer called Vesh Etegor, uh, the second word possibly indicative of rank as a demigor or colonel. Under his strict command, the packed force lay in baking heat for three days without faltering or breaking line until the Imperial units had moved into the cone of their ambush. The resulting slaughter lasted 22 minutes. It is clear that one of the reasons the Imperial force made such headway into the Sabbath worlds and why the Arch Enemy was so disorganised for so long is that they were, to all extents and purposes, fighting a civil war amongst themselves to determine who would lead the forces of ruin following the death of Nadzivar. The Imperial Crusade would not have been able to have made such headway if not for this fact. And the evidence is the strength of the enemy counterattack once they were united and the various instances of the Imperial forces landing on hostile worlds to find them already decimated by recent warfare, pointing to extensive infighting. This was a blessing for the Imperium, but Gore clearly overcame his opponents, and with a disciplined, relatively, force of chaos, which were the match in terms of skill and equipment, and determination, as the blood pact were to the Imperial Guard. He was able to take the fight to the overextended Imperial forces, and so began one of the most dangerous periods of Makarov's command. Counterattack, 771 to 772. The Imperial forces had overstretched themselves, but this was the risk of the War Master's plan, a counter-strike by a unified arch-enemy on the Crusade's exposed flank. It began with a number of lightning strikes against the Crusade's flanks in the Khan group, followed by Imperial forces encountering much stiffer resistance as they advanced into the Cabal systems, and many reports of the Blood Pact operating in large numbers. These first encounters took the Imperium completely by surprise, as up to then, although they had encountered fearsome enemies, none matched them in terms of military tactics nor prowess at war, as they normally confronted bands of frothing lunatics and the various heresies and lunacies of the damned. What they lacked in true training and skill they made up for in fanatical and zealous rage. Now they met an enemy which was a distorted and corrupted image of the Imperial Guard, and they knew their craft. Makarov's drive into the Cabal systems had created a salient, which the Gore, now using his forces and by ordering the other Magistars, began to strike at from three sides, pushing it inwards and attempting to cut the head from the Crusade, so to speak. The fighting at this time was terrible, and if it were not for the abilities of Makarov's generals, often operating on their own initiative, then the Crusade would have been cut in two and decimated. The Arch Enemy drove for the Crusade supply lines, massively extended as they were, with its armies relying on supply from back in the newfound trailing group. So swift had been the advance. These were cut, and Makarov now pushed for the development of closer sources of supply that could be more easily defended, particularly for Prometheum to keep the armies fighting. These so called victory veins would keep the Crusade moving but required the deployment of significant elements of the Spinwood Front to make or break engagements to keep the main thrust into the Cabal systems alive and moving. Late in the 16th year of the Sabbath World's Crusade, Warmaster Makarov's incisive advance on the strategically vital Cabal system, which had been so strong and confident in its initial phase, jutted to a halt. Three quarters of the target planets, including two of the infamous fortress worlds, had been taken by Imperial Crusade forces, and the occupying armies of the Chaos Arch enemy routed or put to flight. But as many Navy commanders had warned, the push had overreached itself, creating as it did a salient vulnerable on three sides. Orlok Gore, one of the Arch enemy's most able warlords, making good use of the vicious Loxetol mercenaries, drove an inspired counter-offensive along the advance's coreward flank, taking in quick succession Anothis, Khan 5, Chaos Eniet, and Belshar Binary, vital supply lanes, especially those providing fuel reserves for the stretched Crusade fleet were cut. 
Makarov's valiant gamble, which he had hoped might win him the campaign outright, now seemed foolhardy. Unless fresh supply lines could be forged and new fuel reserves made available, the hard-won Cabal salient would crumble. At best, the Imperial advance would be forced into retreat. At worst, it would collapse and be overrun. Warmaster Makarov hastily redeployed significant elements of his spinward flank in a make-or-break effort to open up new lines of supply. All those involved knew the outcome of this improvised action would certainly decide the fate of the Cabal salient and perhaps the war itself. The key target worlds were the Promethean-rich planets of Geiger, Aeon Drift Nova, Anaximandia, and Mirrodon. The forge world of Erdesh, Tanzina IV, and Aradine, with their solid fuel reserves. And the vapour mills of Rydol and Fantine. From a history of the later Imperial Crusades. The Loxatol. It was on the planet Fantine that Imperial forces first encountered a major deployment of the Xenos mercenaries, the Loxatol. The Imperial forces were working with the local defence forces of the settlements which had not fallen to the arch-enemy invasion, in efforts to secure, intact, or as near to intact as possible, the vapour mills of the planet. The fighting for these high-altitude vapour mill sites was intense, but only more so when the noble warriors of the Guard encountered these vile creatures. The Loxital would be seen fighting alongside the arch-enemy forces throughout the Crusade, but were most commonly deployed alongside blood-packed forces who collaborated extensively with Xenos races and mercenaries to achieve their heinous goals. The Loxital are sinuous non-humanoid quadrupeds evolved from amphibian forms. Slightly larger than an average human, they are extremely swift and dexterous and use large dew claws to give them purchase on any surface allowing them to run up walls and across ceilings. Out of water, the vision, hearing and smell of these grey-skinned aliens are dull, and they rely on powerful taste and vibration sensing to hunt and corner prey. The Loxatol use a weapon of alien design known as a flechette blaster. They carry these powerful weapons, along with ammunition bandoliers on their torsos, mounted on mechanical armatures that fire the weapons via some unknown mind impulse device. This leaves a Loxital's limbs free for climbing. The blasters fire deadly shot bursts filled with millions of razor-sharp filaments that shred grievous wounds in flesh and armour. Loxatol are believed to operate in small brood groups, units of biological kin, communicating by vibration, subsonic calls and, when in close proximity, iridescent patterning that they're able to flash and move across their skins. Imperial Guardsmen have reported that nearby Loxatol activity can often be detected by a nauseating smell, a mix of rancid milk and crushed mint. Other known Xenos or non-human species known to cooperate with the Blood Pact and other Arcanite forces include the Tath Tarad Hoken, known as the Iconid, and the Reng, as well as the Abhuman breeds, the Scaliid and the Ermut Brutate. Although grueling engagements, the only defeat for the Imperial forces in their efforts to secure these victory veins was at Aradin where a superior blood-packed force denied General Urians. As his victory veins began to open up, the Warmaster tried to renew the momentum of his advance into the Cabal systems, which had been so strong and successful in its initial phase. The fortress world, Moorland, still held out. Indeed, Moorland's local zone was so comprehensively mined that Imperial forces were only just now reaching the planet itself. Evidence suggests that the Archon had withdrawn into the Carcaradon Cluster to mass a full-scale counter-attack, and Makarov was desperate to break past Moorland and confront him. Makarov was also aware that his second priority was to defend the Cabal Salient. And the Gore had left the ongoing Corward flank attack under the command of his most capable magistars, Anakwana Sek, Shebal Redhand, and Enoch Inokenti. With typical instinctive flair, Makarov decided to divide the Crusade force between his most trusted commanders to meet these threats. Many voices were raised in objection. 
The Navy commanders in particular believed that the Warmaster had only survived his gamble at Cabal by the narrowest of margins, and now saw him about to repeat the risk on an even greater scale. Makarov, as usual, dismissed their objections. Moreland Moreland, the oldest and biggest of the Cabal system's fortress worlds, was the thorn in Makarov's side. Devastatingly well defended, it served as a base station for arch-enemy fleet units and was also capable of unleashing crippling long-range bombardments. Approach routes to the Moorland system itself and into the local plain of Moorland were a supreme challenge in and of themselves. The zone was densely seeded with magnetic, reactive mines, spread in shoal patterns that automatically reconfigured and adjusted their speed every two days. Arch-enemy fleet traffic was able to move unmolested through the minefields, provided it possessed the correct cipher engines that would decode the existing shoal pattern and reveal the cleared paths of approach. The Fortress Worlds Theories abound as to the exact origin of the Fortress Worlds. Though occupied and armed by the forces of the Imperium, and latterly by the hosts of the Arch-enemy, the structures themselves predate human activity in the region. Indeed, over eight levels of prior occupation have been identified by Xeno-archaeologists, indicating periodic habitation by several precursor species, dating back over eight million years. Two of these precursor species, the Kinibrak and species K43811D, are known from Imperial records, but the others belong to previously unknown and presumably extinct cultures. The longest periods of occupation appear to have been by the Kinibrak, in M15 to M31, which fits contemporaneously the understood span of the Kinibrak culture, and by an unidentified species, which apparently inhabited the fortress worlds for a stretch of almost three quarters of a million years, ending in minus M4. It is not clear if any of these occupying species, with the exception of the Kinibrak, use the worlds for military and or defensive purposes. The identity of the world's builders themselves is unknown, though other examples of similar planetary constructions have been found in Imperial space. Devodovich, in his Antique Structures and Anomalies, asserts that such formidable sites can only have been wrought for the purposes of defence, and the alignment of the fortress world seems to support this. But to protect what? And from whom? Certainly the deep rampart constructions and massive exterior armour provide an excellent basis for the configuration of both close and long-range weapons, and an extensive network of ducts and channels make it possible for effective power and communication systems to be laced through each of the fortress worlds. Imperial pioneers experienced no difficulty in converting the worlds for use as fortresses. The only obstacle was the sheer quantity of arms and equipment required. When the worlds fell to the arch-enemy forces, this conversion work was capitalised upon and the fortress worlds became among the most monumental bastions in known space. The Brink By 773, the 18th year of the Crusade, the Imperial force was subdivided, hard-pressed and overstretched, fighting simultaneously actions right across the car group and the trailward half of the Cabal systems. There, Moorland refused to buckle under Makarov's assault, and as long as Moorland stood, the spinward impetus of the Crusade would be stalled. Makarov fervently wished to be able to drive forward into a decisive war with the core military strengths of the Archon in the Carcheridon cluster, before the Archon could gain the upper hand by pushing trailwards and taking the fight to the Imperial lines. At no prior moment in the Crusades' history had warfare been spread across such a grievously wide scope. Old Slado, Cyborn wrote in early 773, would be appalled. He would never have broken out so broadly. The tight focus, methodical approach he favoured has vanished entirely in this far-flung pandemonium. If Cyborn considered the situation at that point to be far-flung pandemonium, he had reckoned without the turn of events that was to follow. Since the start of the previous year, the Crusade's coreward flank had been increasingly harried by counter-strike raids conducted by some of the Archon's key warlord lieutenants. If these raids increased in intensity, Makarov's force risked being split in two, 
with the greater portion of it, along with the War Master himself, cut off and surrounded at the Cabal Salient. Annihilation could be the only sequel to such a disaster. Makarov was all too aware of the danger and the imponderable nature of the problem. He could not remain overstretched for fear of a further punishing flank attack, but neither could he spare any forces from the Cabal front line, as a weakening there would leave his vanguard vulnerable to Archon Gur. Either option seemed cursed with failure. Makarov simply had to decide which one to risk. Famously, he showed Cyborn two identical cups of wine and asked the Lord Militant to pick one up, saying, one is elixir and one is poison. How can I tell them apart? Cyborn asked. By taking one up and tasting it, replied the War Master. Makarov eventually decided to remain as he was, risking overstretch and fight on to take Moorland and the Cabal systems with one last effort. May the Emperor bless me, or forget me, he remarked. It seemed that the God Emperor chose the latter. In the third quarter of 773, Gore's Magisters Enoch Inokente and Anakwana Sek launched a murderous, catastrophic flank attack into the Khan group from Corwards and Rimwards. Supported by hosts of warriors, cultists, war machines and air power, the Magistar's counter-strike was designed for one sole purpose, to bisect the crusade force across the Khans and decapitate it. What followed was a time of looming defeat, disaster, brinksmanship and the most desperate warfare of the crusade. And, along with that, came a miracle or two. The Khan Group 773 to 775. Thanks to the implacable rise of Erlok Gur and the sheer ruthlessness of his leading magistars, the crusade stood at a dire point. Many at the time believed the High Lords of Terror would recall Makarov, end the charter of the crusade, and order the Lords Militant to pull back and merely consolidate the territories already retaken for the overwhelming cost in material and manpower was too great, and any hope of continuing and completing the Sabbat world's liberation seemed doomed. Sek and Inokente, magisters both, had all but severed the neck of the Imperial thrust into the Cabal systems. By the end of 773, they had both established their murderous credentials and sliced across the Imperial realm of command bisecting the Khan group in a most extraordinary display of considerable and well-judged leadership. Erlok Gur's savage counter-strike, a response to the Imperial gain of Balhut, was devastatingly effective. The Crusade force was contending on two fronts and massively overstretched. It is still, at this time, impossible to calculate Imperial losses in the Khan group, both military and civilian, with any degree of accuracy. As the wave of predatory attacks swept through the Khan group, panic spread from world to world like a plague. Three worlds were ravaged to the point of extinction, and on another three, the scale of warfare, which crippled the ecosystems there, created nuclear winters. It is also, as yet, impossible to enumerate the quantity of penalty camps and murder centres established by the advancing foe on Khan group worlds, or to even estimate the number of people consumed by those abominable places. Even flight offered poor salvation. Evacuation fleets of refugees fled, threatened or attacked worlds. Many were never heard from again. One, a convoy of eight mass conveyances, bearing some 93,000 citizens from Frengold, ran straight into an enemy picket on the edges of the Euphrates funnel and was obliterated. Another, five great merchant cargo men, was discovered adrift off Rydal. All the crews and the refugees some 7,000 civilians were dead, victims of an airborne pestilence that the forces of the archenemy had brought to the world they had been trying to escape from. A third, 20 ships, mixed class, 140,000 refugees, escaped Khan too and got as far as San Valarbo. There, the fleet stations and the navy lines, fearing the worst and close to panic, mistook them for an enemy formation translating in and fired on them. Six ships had been lost by the time the mistake was realised, and firing halted. Six ships, over 30,000 innocent souls. A similar fate befell many others, and the infamous Edorata incident is a sobering example. 
Crucial to the military effect of the Magistar's attacks was the use of terror as a weapon. Historically, many chaos invasions have been announced by the jamming or blocking of Vox and astropathic transmissions, the sudden cessation of broadcasts from a stricken world. But both Sek and Inokente delighted in leaving such lines open. Indeed, both would often deliberately broadcast chilling transmissions from worlds they had seized. Reports of victories, or of mutilations dispensed. Isolated pockets of Imperial resistance were playfully allowed to transmit their last frantic screams for help. Receiving worlds as yet untouched cowered in fear of the messages and became gripped by panic. Under such conditions, mistakes and miscalculations were only to be expected. It is reckoned at least four of the worlds that fell to the Counter-Strikes did so simply because, having heard the distant fate of other planets, were too terrified to coordinate successful defences. Tacticians agree that Magistar Sek was the orchestrator of this abominable propaganda. Sek, perhaps the most gifted and brilliant of all the Arcanite warlords, specialised in what might be called emotional warfare. It is clear he, if such a thing can be called a he, thoroughly understood the importance of intellectual weakness in battle and owned a particular fascination with the use of words as weapons. Unlike many of the Magistars, Gore included, Sek demonstrated a willful and evil finesse in his strategy, breaking target worlds into submission with a few well-chosen broadcasts of terror, where a fleet bombardment might have taken weeks. It was... Essential the Imperium not underestimate the stealth and guile of the enemy. Imperial holdings expected ferocious physical assault and the calumny of whispering taint. They did not seem prepared for the enemy to exhibit cleverness or subtlety. Sek, and to a lesser extent Inokente, wanted the Imperial worlds to know that devastation was approaching. He wanted to lock his targets in fear and make them ripe for invasion. He wanted the target worlds to know what was coming. More than anything else, he wanted the target worlds in the Khan group to know that the Blood Pact was coming. The Adalorata Incident At the close of 773, Lord Militant Delaney ordered a fast attack flotilla out of San Valabo to alter course for Loden and translate to Adalorata to take up defensive station there. Intelligence had placed an arch-enemy formation less than two weeks away from Adalorata. The flotilla comprised three heavy cruisers, the Tarquin, the Hastor and the Sharko. Two Brandish-class super-heavy destroyers, the Sir Oswald Whitmere and the No Quarter. Five Sabre-class light destroyers and the Dreadnought Intangible. It was commanded by Vice Admiral Albert van der Trak. Track was an experienced and proven fleet officer who had scored several successes during the post-Balhut scouring. Many believed he would rise to high rank in due time, possibly even to Grand Admiral of the Segmentum Pacificus fleet. From the bridge of the Intangible, one of the most magnificent and heavily armed vessels in all the Rimwood fleets, Track ordered his flotilla around in a spectacular sidestep, bearing off the Mandeville Point at 198... 272 Crucius, and translating three times in a brilliantly executed inner run towards Adalorata. His aim was to arrive before the arch enemy. He succeeded by two days. Tragically, the system's defence grid at Adalorata braced to expect enemy intrusion. Kicked off automatically at his arrival. Believing he was already too late and was now under attack, Track ordered his flotilla to return fire. The spontaneous detonation of one of the three orbital starforts defending Adalorata told Track he had made a gross error. By then, the Hastor was lost, and the intangible was on fire and listing badly. Taking heavy fire as he regrouped, Track desperately tried to explain the situation to Adalorata command and control. In the confused circumstances, this took three hours. The sire Oswald Whitmere suffered a critical hit from a starfort battery during this period, and vaporised with the loss of all hands. Track eventually persuaded the Adalorata system defence to cease fire and tried to marshal his flotilla into a planet guard formation. Warp echo traces suggested the arch enemy was not far behind them. By then, the intangible was foundering and close to death. 
Track quit the dreadnought and took up command from the bridge of the No Quarter. But Track had not counted for his second in command. Commodore Weiler Waldish. Gravely hurt during the opening phase of that misbegotten battle, Waldish had been left in command of the stricken intangible to oversee the evacuation and abandonment of the famous vessel. Possibly bewildered by the action, or unhinged by pain, Waldesh ordered the gunners lively and ignited main engines, intent on attacking one of the remaining starforts. It is quite evident from his transmissions that he truly believed the starfort to be an enemy vessel. First Officer Barnard Fulker, posthumously decorated for valour, realised the mistake and attempted to wrest command from the raving Waldesh. Shot eight times for mutiny by Waldish, Falcor survived long enough to kill his erstwhile commander with a bolt pistol. At this stage, the intangible was on a ramming course towards the starfort. Falcor triggered auto-destruct and annihilated the great vessel, with all remaining hands just three AU short of the orbital fortress. Mortified, Track apparently lost his grip on command at this point. When the archenemy fleet of 30 main formation ships translated in, his flotilla was woefully underextended. The battle lasted eight hours, and the no quarter was lost in the first 45 minutes. Track did not live to see the awful calamity that consumed Adalarata. Though given his track record, it is quite likely his flotilla would have denied the enemy before it reached the planet if better circumstances had prevailed. In the closing stages of the void fight, the Tarquin, dying and on fire, began to drop towards the outer atmosphere, and one of the remaining star forts was forced to open fire and obliterate it before a re-entry and impact on the surface. Having already fired upon their would-be saviours by mistake, it is reported that the star fort gunners had tears in their eyes as they put down the Tarquin. It was a futile mercy killing. Whatever damage the impact of the Tarquin might have done, by the next morning, Adolorata was lost, and the star forts above it reduced to smouldering wrecks. Inothis The Khan Group, or Second Front, Corward Assault, portion of the Sabbat Crusade, was especially distinguished by the unilateral actions that saved Imperial interests. Makarov's primary front could not disengage from the fortress worlds and was locked in the struggle for Moorland and its surrounding territories. Even once Makarov was forced to subdivide the Crusade forces into a first and second front, a decision that drew bitter resentment from high command, defence of the Khan worlds was piecemeal at best, as the rapid attacks there had been unexpected. Many worlds in the zone found themselves fighting alone, and it was the happenstance combination of successful actions that finally turned the tide, rather than an overall strategy. Three theatres in particular helped to pivot fortunes around to favour the Imperial armies. Khan Free, Herodor and Enothis. Lord Militant Hummel had command of the Imperial forces on Enothis and found himself facing the full ferocity of Magistar Sex Invasion. Sex's first strike was at the Southern Trinity Hives, which he quickly possessed, and Hummel sought to drive the Magistar out with a full-scale ground war, a land armada. But the offensive toppled disastrously when it reached the gates of the Trinity Hives, and Hummel's brigades were forced into flight northwards across the interior desert. It was a desperate situation. Hummel needed to withdraw and regroup his forces into the Hive cities on the shores of the Zophonian Sea, where they might be resupplied, repaired and rearmed, and with reinforcements from Rough World and from the Northern Commonwealth attempt a counter-offensive. But there was a great likelihood that the fleeing Imperial hosts would be obliterated en masse before they ever reached the Inland Sea. Making brilliant use of air power, working off massive land carriers, Sex armies were close to overtaking the retreat. By day 260-773, there was every chance that the archenemy's air arm would extend past the hapless ground army and begin to decimate the inner hives. Hummel, taking sage advice from the Fantine Admiral Ornoff, switched his entire emphasis to an air war, raising an airborne resistance that flew to deny the enemy approach, and made every effort to protect the toiling land forces fleeing northwards. Under Ornoff's direction, the Imperials lofted every flyer they had. The backbone of the defence was the squadrons of the Imperial Navy, principally Thunderbolt and Lightning Fighters, chasing air superiority, with marauders running seek-and-destroy missions at the advancing enemy ground forces. 
local air force and military reserve flight wings, many of whom were sent aloft in antiquated and outclassed planes, heroically supported the Navy. The aerial fighting became murderously intense. Enemy bomber formations began to penetrate across the southern littoral, and the coast was abandoned. The war came to a head on the 270th day of 773, the so-called Battle of the Zephonian Sea. Flying around the clock from carrier groups and island runways, the Imperial Flyers staged a superhuman defence against the relentless waves of enemy planes. It remains the largest and most elaborate air battle of the entire Sabbat Crusade to date. The archenemy suffered such a scale of losses on that day that its advance faltered. Lord Militant Hummel swiftly capitalised on this hiatus and drove his counter-offensive south. After months of savage fighting, the Trinity Hives finally fell on the 62nd day of 774. By that time, Magister Sec had fled the planet. Hummel had proved that, through sheer valour and determination, the Khan group attack could be repulsed. Khan Free Central to the phase of conflict in the Khan group, the battle for Khan Free lingered on from 773 to 775, and in it we may see the second of the supreme triumphs of imperial might in this period, a warfare perhaps as significant as Inothis or Harador. On Khan Free, the forces of Magistar Shebol Redhand had moved in to support the main strike of Inok Inakente. Magistar Shebel was a notorious monster who had left a tranche of worlds burning in his wake, but he lacked organisation and discipline. On Khan Free, he found himself pitted against Lord General Bulladin, perhaps the most careful and focused of all Makarov's staff. The Magister deployed his forces across the Tantai Valley Basin and the Elshore Uplands in an attempt to break Bulladin's hold of the twin hives Kina and Kinor. Supported, well, by Pardus and Narminian armoured brigades, Bulladin forced an opening along a Fenland pass known as Bales Field, and then sent foot companies of the Rowan Deepers and the Samothrace 9th in behind the angle of defence. Bales Field and the uplands overlooking it became a killing ground, where five arch-enemy troopers were lost for every guardsman. Magistar Shebel then panicked, and drew in his outer guard around the town of Fornes. A heavy tank battle ensued along the edge of Bales Field, but Bulladin pressed in with surgical efficiency and pushed three battalions of the Rowan Deepers in country with Titan support. Foreigners burned, and Magistar Shebel fled to the Highlands, but was blocked by a second Imperial group, which included the Belladon 81st. A ferocious battle took place on what was called the Field of the Last Imagining. Significant losses were taken on both sides, but the Magister had received the worst of the morning. He attempted to withdraw once again, fleeing to Partipal, where he was surrounded by the Silver Guard and Narminian armour, commanded by Bulladin himself. Popular stories say that Bulladin met and slew Shebol on that high ground, in personal combat, although many regard that as hearsay. Historically speaking, all that matters is that Shebol Red Hand died there. Bulladin had won a major victory, even though enemy forces would continue fighting for a further 22 months. The turning point, Herador. The battle for Herador lasted for less than two months and was a comparatively small operation compared to such grand-scale clashes as Anothis. However, its importance cannot be underestimated. Though the Khan group counter-strike continued to rage for a long while afterwards, Herador is agreed by most to be the turning point for Imperial fortunes. Many tantalising and as yet unanswered questions surround the war for Herador. The planet was of no great tactical significance, yet Magister Inokente chose to lead the assault there personally. Some conjecture that he knew by some arcane means what was about to happen and wanted to prevent it. Herador's only claim to significance was that it was one of the Holy Worlds, visited by Saint Sabbat Beatty during her original crusade through the region, thousands of years earlier. A sacred Belnary shrine dedicated to her forms, the religious centre of the principal city, the Civitas Beatty. As the counter-strike tore through the Khan group, an imperial guard force commanded by Lord General Lugo and supported by local militia occupied the Civitas Beatty in order to defend it from attack. 
What exactly happened next is unclear. All that can be said reliably is that during the early stages of the attack, a young woman emerged from the rank-and-file imperial citizenry, claiming to be the reincarnated saint. Some commentators have suggested that this reincarnation was a deceit orchestrated by Lugo and other unknown collaborators. It is claimed the saint was an actress, a young girl selected and carefully rehearsed by Lugo to play the part. If this is true, it was no doubt Lugo's intention to boost imperial morale. He may also have intended to boost his own career. Lugo was well known to be an ambitious man. However, it now appears that the truth is something rather more extraordinary. Whatever her origins and whatever the machinations of Lugo, the girl undeniably took on the mantle of the beauty. Becoming Saint Sabbat to all intents and purposes, she stirred and inflamed imperial resolve. But this was more than good acting. There is evidence she exhibited powers and abilities beyond the scope of normal mortals, to the glory of Terra and the Emperor of Mankind. His most holy Saint Sabbath Beatty was born on Herodor close to the end of 773. Perhaps the foul in Akente had foreseen this. If so, his foresight did him no good. Rallying around the saint, the Imperial forces engaged in Akente's host at the Civitas Beatty. In a ferocious city fight, the saint and her army, which included the Tanef first and only, a guard unit she seems to have deputised as her personal bodyguard, slew Inakente and put his forces to rout. The timing was perfect. War Master Makarov's assault on the fortress world, Moorland, had at last resolved in victory, and Makarov was able to deploy part of his martial force back into the Khan group, in support of the beleaguered Second Front. If Inakente had not been detained by the fight for Herador, it is likely his advance would have pushed on and finished the job of fatally decapitating the Crusade line. Suddenly, the archenemy's counter-strike was on the back foot. For all their gains, for all their bloody victories, for all the carnage they had wrought upon the Khan group, the Magisters had failed where it really mattered. Their spirit and their deadly intent were broken. The calamitous effect of their manoeuvre spoiled. Invigorated by the wildfire news of the return of the saint, Imperial forces buckled down to deny the Gurr's minions. At last, it was possible for the Warmaster to fully reinforce the second front that had opened up so damagingly, and which had dented faith in his overall scheme. Some called for his removal anyway. Many, most notably Cyborn, Blackwood and Sindar, called for an immediate re-evaluation of strategy and priority, insisting that the Crusade could not survive if it was forced to contend with two simultaneous warfronts, both at the head and the flank. The brilliance of the Gore's counter-strike had been in subdivision, using his forces to meet Makarov head-on while dispatching his most able magisters to strike from the side. Though this divided his force, it most certainly divided the Imperial force too, and here a true weakness was revealed. The Crusade host had been, to all intents and purposes, of one body, overseen by the Warmaster. Though various Lords Militant had been given significant duties and battle groups, they were all overseen, as they had been from the very start, by the Warmaster. None had been granted independent command to act as proxy. Gore, evidently, had greater faith in the autonomous function of his forces, particularly in the skills of his lieutenants such as Sek. He trusted them to operate outside his direct control. Indeed, this military autonomy may have been part of the deal he brokered with Anarch Sek in order to obtain his service. To fight the Crusade on two distinct fronts, Orlok Gore was not required to orchestrate both formations at once. For the first time, the composite nature of the Arcanite Alliance, so often seen as a weakness by Imperial observers, became a true asset. In Sek and Gore, the Crusade now contended with two separate and independent enemies that were united only in the same overall goal. Spurred by Cyborn and others, High Command demanded a choice be made, and made quickly. The Crusade could and should not be made to war on two fronts. Makarov, they insisted, had to decide which to focus on and which to disengage with. Sek or Gore? The choice was simple. Regroup, annihilate one, then consolidate and take on the other. Such a course, it was clear, was the only safe option, but it would prolong the war by generations and allow whichever archenemy warlord was spared time to strengthen his forces further. Makarov typically hated this course. He, and perhaps he alone at that time, still had faith in his long-term policy. Though evidence seemed to contradict his instinct, he was determined to continue as before. In order to do so, to the horror of his lords, he decided to do once again the utterly unexpected. 
and learn from the enemy he was trying to obliterate. The Return of the Saint Much has and will be written concerning the miraculous reappearance, so-called, of the Saint Sabbath Beatty, which allegedly took place on Herodor in 773. Many naysayers have claimed that the event was a ruse by the Astra Militarum to boost morale and add some gloss of provenance that the crusade was divinely blessed to the entire war front. While others maintain the woman in question was deluded and mentally incompetent. Opposing those positions are many who firmly trust in the God Emperor's grace and believe the miracle entirely as well as many who prefer charges of blasphemy against all and any who doubt the veracity of the event. Even among those who believe, many questions circulate. Was Sanian, the young Esholi, or pilgrim, born as a reincarnation of the Beatty, living her early life in ignorance of the fact, or was she in some way possessed by the spirit of the saint, becoming a vessel or manifestation of the divine force? The entire matter is perhaps best dealt with in Ayatani Holiman's tract upon the living saint, and also in the Epistles to the Hegeans, in which he weighs the arguments carefully and considers the evidence. But even these scholarly works, written as they were by a priest of the Sabbat order, fail to offer unequivocal truth, as a great deal of the matter has been sequestered and classified by the Inquisition and by Astra Militarum security. What cannot be doubted is the effect of the Beatty's reappearance during the struggle for Herodor and after. News of her rebirth drew the fierce attention of the Arcanite to the world, which was, by most estimations, of little strategic importance. Though this caused an unexpected flashpoint in the war effort, it ultimately drew Magistar Inokente into the open in his efforts to eliminate her, allowing Imperial forces, principally led by Ibram Gaunt, to annihilate his armies. There can also be little doubt of the woman's preternatural prowess in the Herodor conflict, which was witnessed and recorded by many. In more general terms, gainsayers must allow for the Beatty's extraordinary service since that time. Commanding her own small, hand-picked brigade, she served in several theatres across the Sabbat worlds, most notably Erdesh itself, and has performed heroic deeds that have greatly assisted the Imperial effort. By the time of Erdesh in 792, she was considered a true component of the Crusade's high command structure, her insight given full and respectful consideration. She was also personally protected by a vanguard of Adeptus Astartes Iron Snakes, and it seems unlikely that the mighty space marines would lend military aid to a pretender. Most significant of all, of course, is the effect she has had on the Imperial campaign. Even if she is, as some still believe, a fake or an imposter, the very fact of her has raised morale and rallied hundreds of thousands during the bleaker years of the fighting. The crusade as a whole has been fortified by the idea that the saint is walking with it every step of the way, blessing its work, a notion that the great Slado had fervently believed from the very outset of the undertaking. Moreland and after the Corwood Assault Warmaster Makarov's decision surprised and horrified High Command. He decided to copy the archenemy's example and gamble on subdivision, splitting his strengths in two. He would continue to prosecute Sek and Gore simultaneously, saying that he considered neither of the fellows quite harmless. I will not take my eye off either for a moment. It was an unprecedented move, contrary to Astra Militarum doctrine, and it appalled his commanders. But Makarov was furiously insistent. His stubborn assault on the fortress world Moorland had finally succeeded at the close of 773, and he was eager to press his advantage and drive on against Gore. To do so, he had to protect his flank and primary routes of supply. So he formally established a second front, designated the Corwood Assault, assigning Lords Militant to take command of it, requiring them to build their efforts against Sek on the ramshackle and spontaneous defence lines that had sprung up in response to the Khan Group counterstrike. The fate of the Crusade teetered at this point. Many thought failure was looming. Makarov had followed through on Slado's original promise and had cut his way through the fortress worlds into the Carcharodon Cluster, pushing the forces of Gore into the back end of the Sabbat worlds. The saint, reborn, was now with him. 
and Imperial urgency reinvigorated. But Anarch Sec, hounding the flank of the advance, was a threat equal to, or perhaps even greater, than the Gore. Makarov's second front and lines of support were in perilous state from the very start. By the close of 775, as the Crusade entered its third decade, Imperial forces found themselves divided across two lines, warring almost independently of each other. The Warmaster led the front edge, primary assault, towards the Gorite enemy, and sent other senior officers to organise the flank repulse of the Anarch, the Corward assault. The decision was bitterly opposed, and it is notable that perhaps showing evidence of his mercurial spite, Makarov selected many of the dissenters for second front command positions. Cyborn in particular was charged with unifying and strengthening the support and the flank. It was a task that he clearly despised. Sources close to him report that he felt it was an insult to be sent back to mop up the dirt. Kyborn, great lord of battles, felt his place should be at the front line of the advance. Kyborn, perhaps blinded by his own pride, considered Sek a secondary danger at best, and still argued that the Crusade should turn collectively, neutralise the Anarch, and then return to face down Gore in a unified structure. In a communique to the Warmaster, dated 322-775, Kyborn wrote, Have I not killed enough for you, my bloodthirsty lord? Why do you unman me with this dismal janitorial role? Must I be forced to follow your glory pace by pace, cleaning up the debris you leave in your wake, while you grant trust in lesser men to pierce the enemy's hard world? Makarov's answer was blunt. In reply, the following day, the Warmaster simply sent the word. Yes. By lesser men, Kaiborn had made reference to Urians and Lemon Schultz, two of the rising stars in Makarov's command group. Urians especially had distinguished himself in the assault on the Cabal systems. Kyborn resented that greatly. So did Marshal Blackwood, who, like Kyborn, surely had nothing left to prove. Makarov sent Blackwood to the rear, ordering him to secure the Rimwood line. I would, sir, but there's nothing on the Rimwood line, Blackwood famously declared during a formal dinner. Makarov sent him anyway. A war master is a war master. One cannot pretend to understand the inner workings of the mind in such a great person. From the outside, it seemed that Makarov might have been favouring his new generals at the expense of tried and tested war leaders. One can certainly appreciate the resentment felt by Kyborn and Blackwood and their ilk. More significantly, his bisection of the Crusade host risked utter defeat. History would ultimately vindicate Makarov's decision, he had rightly judged that Gore and the Anarch to be two equally pernicious threats, and if he had left either unopposed, Imperial ruination would have followed. War on two fronts proved to be the only viable recourse, but it would take almost 20 years to show proof of that necessity, and Makarov would be obliged to compromise several times to maintain stability. Commentators in this period debate at length as to how much Makarov was gambling and how much was part of his studied long game. Some claim the Warmaster was foolishly bowing to internal politics and sending his elder commanders back to rake room for his new blood. Others more soberly maintained Makarov understood precisely how dangerous and pressing the Second Front would become. The Warmaster had never underestimated the genius of Anakwana Sek. Perhaps he was sending these brightest and best back where they would do most good. It is now a clear fact that, at the turn of 775, the greatest threat to Imperial security in the Sabbat worlds came from the flank and from the forces of Magistar Anarch Sek. The second front of the Crusade, formed to begin with mainly by raw recruits and battered divisions, found itself pushed to the limit by Sek's forces. Kyborn and Blackwood tried to stiffen resolve, but the line generals saw the danger. Barthol von Voitz, one of the other veteran lords militant, redirected to second front duties, wrote in a letter dated 356775, There is a taint here on the second front, a weakness. Men turn, fall away, flee. I have not a single body of troops that has the proper spirit in it. Rumours also emerged of a new threat. It became clear that Sek had raised a fighting force of his own to rival the Gore's blood pact, Called the Sons of Sek, this host clearly represented a challenge as monstrous as the bloody pacted armies. But other philosophies were developing in the embattled imperial commands of the Second Front. 
ideas embraced by Makarov and perhaps already factored into his scheme. The Anarch Sec was ambitious and had been passed over for the title of Archon, deferring to Erlok Gore. His Sons of Sec proved that ambition, showing his desire to both mimic and perhaps outshine the Gorite Warlord. It hinted that Sec might yet desire to contest Orlok Gore's preeminence as Archon. The archenemy had shown it was capable of acting in discreet and independent operations. Imperial Mines, and Ibram Gaunt was one of these, began to consider that, while it was fruitless to try to weaken the enemy host physically by breaking it apart, perhaps it might be broken in spirit. The Arcanite could yet be riven and neutered if a civil war between the Gore and the Anarch could be provoked. It would not be until Balhut, circa 780, that this hope could finally be realised. The Anarch As with so many of the archenemy's warlords, little is known about the background and origin of Magister Sec, known as the Anarch. Indeed, it is impossible to determine, with any degree of certainty, if this creature was human in origin, or some form of demon made manifest in flesh. Sec was notoriously elusive, and rarely appeared in person on the battlefield. It wasn't until Erdesh in 792 that any direct contact was made by Imperial forces, first at Garapan Zone, where his gambit was thwarted by the cohorts of the Living Beatty, and then finally at the island known as Fastness, in the Straits of Eltath. Even then, his true likeness remains a mystery, as reports of his appearance vary depending on the observer. The Anarch was clearly a powerful psyker, and it is known he deployed slaved psychers, known as Ikets, and used them as simplifying choirs to bolster his own power. It seems likely his psionic aura determined the way he was perceived. What is known for certain is the scope of his ability. Though he served as a magister, a lieutenant, to presiding Arcanate overlords, he was without doubt one of the most dangerous warlords faced during the Crusade, perhaps even rivalling or surpassing the likes of Nadzibar or Erlok Gur. Unusually, among the forces of the Ruinous Powers, Sek possessed great degrees of nuance and subtlety, using trickery, manipulation and fear as much as brute military force. He was, by all standards, a brilliant tactical leader, a skill probably enhanced by his Saikana gifts. Believed to be of Shaidemet Kahan clan origins, Anakwana Sek could easily have claimed the Arcanite crown on several occasions. However, his understanding of the overall strategic flow of the Crusade, which Edrico suggests matched that of Makarov himself, was far more finesse than that of Erlok Gore. And post Balhut, it was Sek's decision to side with Gore and serve him rather than fully challenge him for the title of Archon that allowed the archenemy to remain robust and unified. Sek, it is clear, saw that a war of succession would shatter the sanguinary tribes more effectively than the Imperial Crusade could. This long-term perception and willingness to forego personal advance in favour of a greater general victory, a trait perhaps also observed in the similarly intelligent Heritor Asphodel, almost single-handedly preserved and prolonged arch-enemy integrity in the war. The bloody years that followed Balhut and the toll they took on Imperial forces may be directly attributed to him. It seems likely that the Khan group counter-strike that forced the Crusade into an unwelcome Corbid assault second front and even the Noctus assault in 788 were both his handiwork. Though Gore was nominally in command, he ratified sex actions and actual logistic planning and execution were down to sex brilliance. Such strategies were certainly beyond the abilities of Inokente, who was an effective field commander but no grand tactician. It is even possible that Sek authored the entire Khan Group Irene's Group battle plan in 773 and after, presenting it to the Archon to implement for its elegant gambit show no sign of Gore's typical blunt military choices, and certain aspects of the strategy used by Gore in the Irene's War also betray sex fluid and versatile touch. The Anarch's allegiance to Archon Gore certainly preserved the sanguinary threat after Balhut, but it seems clear this alliance was born out of expediency and was perhaps never intended to be more than a temporary union. Whatever rationale had caused Sect to side with Gore, a rivalry always existed. Once this unravelled, the bond that had made the archenemy host an unexpectedly formidable adversary became an anvil on which it could be broken. 
It is hard to discern when the alliance began to break down, or for how long Sec had harboured resentment and ambition. Edrico, in his monographs, postulates that it was Gore's brutal and unstinting attitude of absolute authority, unwilling to acknowledge or credit the vital participation of his magistar Sec, which eventually caused Sec to break. Sec may have become disenchanted by Gore's leadership, or believe that now the crusade was properly engaged, it was time for him to take control. As early as 774, intelligence recovered during a covert mission to occupied Garion revealed that Sek was building his own elite troop force, the Sons of Sek, an army as well drilled as the Blood Pact and designed along similar lines to approximate the rigour of the Astartes Militarum, though this could have easily been a tactical decision or indeed an act of admiring imitation. However, by 780 and 81, Further critical intelligence revealed the possibility of a schism and showed that Sec was operating largely to his own plan, sometimes contradicting or even ignoring Gore's efforts. Sec, the evidence revealed, was power building for his own ends and undertaking the development of weapons and mechanisms that would both overwhelm the Imperial Crusade and remove any rivals from the Arcanite crown. This brewing feud, which had already triggered some flashpoints, was deliberately provoked through a campaign of subversion and lightning raids, most particularly at Salvation's Reach in 781, a mission conducted by Ibran Gaunt, who was a leading proponent of the plan to divide the enemy's commanders. Between 781 and Sek's death in 792, states of open warfare broke out between the divisions of the Archon and the Anarch, or along Gorite and Shedemet Kahan clan lines, fundamentally weakening the efficiency of the ruinous powers in both the Irene zone and along the Khan front. The most notable of these internecine wars was, of course, the two-year conflict in the Van der Pai systems. By 789, having either been brought into line by the Archon and acting out of urgency to demonstrate his loyalty, or driven by a desire to consolidate his own power and resources, Sek made an unprecedented strike against the Corwood front with a special focus on Erdesh Forge World. By his previous standards of genius, the assault was frantic and chaotic, leading many to speculate he was acting out of desperation or had suffered some injury or decline that had impaired his abilities. However, confidential sources suggest the old genius remained intact and that Sek was pursuing, either for his own ends or at the bidding of Erlok Gur, a far more complex and unorthodox goal than the simple acquisition of territory and tactical success. At Erdesh, Sex assault was finally met head-on by the War Master himself, and one of the greatest victories of the Crusade was achieved. The Sons of Sek The backbone of the Anarch's fighting host was the Sons of Sek, raised upon similar principles, which is to say, upon the pattern of formal Astra Militarum models, to the Gore's blood pact, perhaps in admiring imitation. Enjoying a formal structure and high degrees of discipline, the Sekite Paxons were fanatically devoted and well equipped, generally of larger build than the blood pact warriors. They wore uniforms of yellow or ochre, augmented by body armour and field kit, plundered from guard units. A surprisingly high number of them, more even than the blood pacted themselves, were turncoats from other forces, including imperial deserters and disaffected members of the Gore's Pact. Their command and rank structure, as far as can be determined, was the equivalent of the Blood Pact, and indeed most formalised Arcanite armies. High-ranking commanders, Eta Gores, roughly analogous to colonels or generals, presided over demi officers, roughly approximating the rank of major, below which served Sidere commanders or High Sidere's captains and Sidere's sergeants or squad leaders. Veteran Paxons acting as weapons masters, tribunes and standard bearers, and overall discipline was maintained by uh, the quasi-demonic exubitors. Significant rivalry existed between the Sekites and the Blood Pact, though stringent enforcement of command allowed them to often function alongside each other on the battlefield, vying to outdo each other in acts of barbarity. Like the Blood Pact, no true Sekite troop was alike, but they did have similarities. Each of them carried a ritual knife. The Sons of Sek bore these blades, which were used for both hand-to-hand fighting and for ceremonial occult practices. Again, 
although they each carried one, none was the same, as they were not mass-produced, it seemed, and bore special spiritual significance to the wielder. Leibov and other key theatres. The Crusades' controversial Second Front, formed primarily around the 5th, 8th and 9th armies, faced ferocious opposition from the host commanded by the Anarch throughout the Khan group. Even after the archenemy defeats on Khan Free and Anothis, and the eradication of Magistar Inokente at Herodor, Sek's savage counterstrike had been partially repulsed, but his forces dug in well and held ground, guided by his tenacious tactical skill, and forced the Corwood Imperials to open battle. Several of Makarov's most senior commanders had been sent back to oversee the prosecution of the Second Front, including General von Voitz, Kelso, Bulladin, and Lushim. Lords Militant Kyborn and Hummel, and Marshal Blackwood. For the most part, their task was to block and defend against the continuing counterattack, but this often meant they had to retake strongly held enemy worlds that Makarov had bypassed on his way to glory. Left unmolested, these worlds could form powerful beachheads and staging posts for the counterattacking foe. Some of the bloodiest and most vital wars of the entire crusade took place in this period and the theatres of that campaign read as a roll call of imperial heroism and endeavour, the hives of Orestes, the glass beaches of Corazon, the black glaciers of Lysander, the high Sierra forests of Car Nobilis, and the steppe cities of Ancreon Sextus. Most massive of all, perhaps, was the momentous invasion of Leibov, now regarded as an exemplary textbook illustration of imperial tactics, though, at the time, the performance of the theatre commander, Carnhide, was tragically unappreciated. Lotan and Tarnuga Having emphatically blocked and crushed part of the Arcanate counterstrike at Lotan at the very start of 774, the Crusade Fifth Army under General Losham moved rapidly spinward to confront Anarch sex forces on the agri-world of Tarnuga. Rudi Lushum was one of Makarov's favourite few, a rare instance of the war master appointing one of his promising new blood commanders to the second line. The fighting on Tarnuga was brief but utterly ferocious, and Lushum was killed in a rocket attack by Hagmatan sect troops. His replacement, Colonel, later Lord Militant, Andred Call, led the fifth to victory, but was overlooked for permanent army command by the war master who instead passed the fifth group to Barthel von Voitz. Kohl was dispatched to the primary front and eventually achieved appropriate, if belated, recognition and promotion during the Irene's assault. Van Thal. In retreat from Herador, Enoch Enochente's forces, leaderless and in disarray, fell upon Van Thal and Lysander in late 774. In pursuit, and assuming they were broken, Marshal Gantz launched an attack at Van Thal that resulted in the deaths of three million Astra Militarum guardsmen, the heaviest losses recorded on any one day during that phase of the crusade. Gantz took Van Thal in the course of the next month, but was publicly chastised and later executed by Makarov. He was replaced by General, later Marshal, Rand Hoopert. Lysander and Corazon Eager to prove her new position, Rand Hubert achieved two critical victories in rapid succession. She purged the remainder of Inacante's horde from the glacial region of Lysander, where they had gone to ground, then mobilised rapidly to Corazon, where she executed a superb coastal assault against the capital Corhel, breaking a vast, wasist cult fraternity. Like Call, she might have expected greater recognition for these successes, but she had been one of Slado's chosen and her force was charged instead with the occupation of Khan Nobilis after Cyborn had retaken the world in 776. There, her division saw no action, and were finally retired to Balhut, and then sent to Prince Obermid in 778 during the suppression. Rand Hupert's career idled for several years, though she returned to the primary front after 780 and saw action in the Carcheridon Cluster. Tunusk Occupying a position close to a vital mendival point in warp space, Tunusk saw serious and continuous action between 775 and 778. By the end of the fighting, the world was virtually burned out. The campaign there came to an end with Marshal Blackwood's famous eight-day offensive against the Blood Pact and allied Skelsid coalitions. Leibov 
although not appreciated at the time. The actions of General Karnhide on Leibov have now become legendary and are regularly taught to officer recruits and neophytes across the Imperium as part of the Tactica Imperialis, from which this account is now drawn. Leibov. The Sabbat Worlds. 778M41. By its 23rd year, the monumental Sabbat Worlds Crusade was entering a defining phase. Under the mercurial command of the War Master Makarov, the main armies of the Crusade had successfully advanced into the savagely disputed territories of the Cabal Systems, a densely fortified and defended region, and was beginning to make significant gains in the Carcaradon Cluster, a tract generally regarded as the heartland holdings of the archenemy. Many believe that an overall Imperial victory was in sight, perhaps no more than five years off. However, others feared that a number of factors could unsettle the Imperial confidence, possibly with disastrous effect, more than once. The fortunes of the Crusade had switched drastically against the Imperial side. There were two key considerations. Firstly, the fighting in the Cabal and Kerkeridon regions were on such a scale previously unseen, even in a long crusade that had witnessed massive set-piece battles. Secondly, and more insidiously, there was unfinished business in Makarov's wake. The Khan group, trailward of the Cabal systems, was still beset by enemy forces, many of them attempting to effect a counter-attack. In his effort to race ahead, Makarov had left many unresolved conflicts to be dealt with by his second front. Conflicts that, if mishandled or lost, would allow significant arch-enemy forces to drive at the crusading forces from behind. From a history of the later Imperial Crusades, the account of the Leibov War is taken from operational reports made during and after the action, a body of material later formalised and annotated by General Galan Galt in his book, A Strategic Assessment of the Khan Group Conflict 799M41, which was later approved for inclusion in its charter list of recommended works by the Tactica Imperium. The Leibov section has often been republished separately for academic study, Galt, at the time a junior officer, served under Karnhide at Leibov and later saw command at Sarniasia and Xerxes III. The editorial perspective is Galt's and is reproduced here with minor amendments requested by Imperial Guard High Command. Began in 755 M41, the Sabbat World's Crusade was a massive endeavour to liberate over 100 inhabited systems along the edge of the Segmentum Pacificus from the forces of chaos. An ancient and feudally held region, the Sabbat Worlds has an imperial history dating back many thousands of years, and in that time has been severely threatened and invaded by the enemies of mankind, most especially the feral chaos forces known to occupy the so-called sanguinary worlds, spinward of the inhabited sectors. Liberated early in their formal existence during the crusade led by Saint Sabbat, from whom the stars take their name, the worlds were extensively retaken by the enemy during the Sabbat incursions that began a century and a half prior to the Crusade. Though many worlds held out during this troubled and dangerous period, by 740 M41, it was clear the region no longer retained any semblance of central imperial control, and a Crusade-scale mobilisation was prepared to retake them. Initially generated and led by the inspired command of War Master Slado, the Crusade enjoyed vigorously early successes, despite savage opposition, and the first phase culminated in the critical battle at Balhut, considered a turning point in the opening decade of the endeavour. However, the great Slado perished in the Balhut conflict, his named successor as War Master was the young, unproven but brilliant Makarov, who galvanised imperial interests with his positive, some might say impetuous, leadership. 
For the second ten years of the crusade, Makarov drove his forces on through a remarkable series of engagements, eventually puncturing the monumental enemy defences of the Cabal system, which opened up the vital Carcheridon cluster and paved the way for the crusade's third principal phase, when the Imperial armies confronted the arch-enemy forces in their own heartland. However, in the years immediately following 773M41, the arch-enemy attempted a considerable counter-attack, pincering behind the advancing Imperial front at Makarov's overstretched lines of supply and communication. The focus of this counter-attack was the Khan Stars, a knot of old Imperial worlds and colonies adjacent to the Cabal systems, where Imperial governance of the region had once been situated. Action on this second front raged for many years, and many times Imperial forces hung in the balance. It was feared that Makarov's muscular gains to Spinward would be for nothing if the counterattack succeeded in its objectives and bisected his advance at the Khan Stars. Tactical scholars believe that if Makarov's main force was decapitated in this way, nothing could prevent it from being surrounded, overwhelmed and obliterated. Several of Makarov's senior commanders were charged with the prosecution of the Second Front, including Generals Van Voits, Kelso, Bulladin and Lushem, Lords Militant Cyborn and Hummel, and Marshal Blackwood. For the most part, their task was to block and defend against the counterattack, but this often meant they had to retake strongly held enemy worlds that Makarov had bypassed in his way to glory. Left unmolested, these worlds could form powerful beachheads and staging posts for counterattacking foe. One of these worlds was Leibov. First settled in the early historical period of the region, circa M36, Leibov had grown to be a hive world of considerable power and manufacturing capacity. With a large population and significant guard and PDF garrisons, it had been one of the last to fall to the arch enemy during the Sabbat incursions. Effectively conquered in 750 M41, Leibov had suffered under arch enemy occupation for two and a half decades, though several hive cities had remained under imperial control for good portions of that time, and major land wars had been waged as a result. As strategically useful due to its location on one of the main jump routes, Leibov was also believed to be a source of fuel, munitions, and other consumables for the arch enemy forces in the Khan group. Late in 777 M41, Lord Militant Kyborn ordered it to be retaken, and gave command responsibility to General Carnhide. General Andreas Carnhide was a veteran guard commander with a long and respectable military career that predated the start of the crusade. He had served under Slado during the Kulan Wars in 752 to 754, and had thus become one of the War Master's chosen command echelon at the start of hostilities. Prior to Leibov, however, his service in the Crusade had been unspectacular, as circumstances found him most often in command of deployment garrisons or transit forces. After Balhut and Slado's death, Carnhide suffered the same fate as many of his contemporaries when he found himself out of favour with the new War Master. Makarov, with characteristic petulance, took it upon himself to give operational preferment to those he felt were his own, which is to say the new blood, the younger, often untested officers who had risen with him on the skirts of Slado's command. Uh, many esteemable veteran commanders, with nothing to prove in terms of loyalty and ability, were relegated unceremoniously to secondary roles. As a result, a great number of them were saddled with the onerous chores of Second Front Command. Carnhide, born on Gudrun in 711, was consequently a capable officer who had never been given the opportunity to truly shine. He was well liked by the rank and file, and had an easy nature that seemed relaxed and could often be mistaken by detractors for timidity and indecisiveness. It must be said that his selection for the theatre command of Leibov was not made on merit. Overstretched and beset by three significant conflicts in the immediate Khan group, Lord Militant Kyborn had tasked the job of liberating Leibov to the only senior officer he felt he could spare. 
Similarly, Carnhide was not blessed with control of a well-formulated, well-ordered mission force. Though of decent size, his Liberation Army was thrown together at the last minute from disparate units, most of whom had not served alongside one another operationally, and many of which had been on frontline service for excessive duration and urgently required retirement and restating. It may be that Kaiborn considered Carnhide and his force expendable, or Leibov to be less of a threat than it actually proved to be. Most likely, he regarded Carnhide's task force to be a stopgap, a competent but unexceptional commander with a tired, unstructured army, who would keep Leibov busy until such time as Kaiborn was clear of his immediate problems and could come to claim victory for himself. Significant enemy forces awaited Carnhide on Leibov, especially in the so-called transcontinental nexus, where the bulk of the planet's most viable hives and manufacturing centres lay. Cult armies and levies of prodigious size occupied the zones, many of them drawn from the indigenous population, polluted by the caustic touch of the warp. Those imperial citizens who had not succumbed to the taint of chaos were cruelly employed as slave labour in the industrial belt. The arch-enemy forces were further supplemented by war machines, armour, aircraft and battlefield titans, as well as some considerable numbers of traitor marines. Usually, such arch-enemy forces were stratified and uncoordinated, united by a common cause but unharmonised in terms of command and control. Cohesion in arch-enemy armies is often weak or flawed, and rivalry feuds and internecine power struggles often erupt. What had begun to make the enemy so dangerous in the Sabbath worlds was a new unity of command. Though still clan and cult-centric in nature, the enemy forces recognised one senior overlord, or Archon, who was the equivalent of the Imperial War Master. The Archon, named Erlok Gur, had evidently claimed, by right of combat or ritual, the overlordship of the innumerable feral clans and factions. Other clan leaders, many monstrous potentates in their own rights, had become his lieutenants or magistars. For the first time, the archenemy was operating with one unified purpose, as much as any army of the ruinous powers can be said to do so. Central to Gower's harmonising efforts was the Blood Pact. Realising that true, methodical soldiering would win more for chaos than the rampant zealotry of berserk cultists, Gower had initiated the development of a personal clan army called the Blood Pact, which he modelled, sardonically, on the Imperial Guard. Indeed, many of those who took the Blood Pact with Gower found themselves equipped with weapons, kit and uniform procured from dead or captured Imperial Guardsmen. This bastardised, almost parodic reflection of the Imperium's army proved to be highly successful once it had mastered the principles of proper disciplined warfare and tactics. The Blood Pact and a comparable institution named the Sons of Sek after one of Gower's most notorious magistars, was able to compete with the guard on equal terms, to understand its methodology and turn it against the Imperial ground troops. The archenemy forces on Leibov were commanded by a being known as Arak Etiger, a capable and charismatic leader. Imperial scholars believe that Etiger is an honorific rank, meaning sub or demigur, a donating perhaps a colonel or general analog. Arik Ettinger had forged the disparate parts of the archenemy occupation force into one coherent structure. This new breed of chaos army awaited Karnhide's forces. Any successful liberation of Leibov had to focus on the transcontinental nexus. The vast and balkanized heartland of hives and industrial regions that occupied the southern half of the main landmass. Nineteen separate fronts for mass drop assault were considered and rejected by Carnhide and his planners, including Sredi Bay, Zinc Hill and Kazenberg. Principal assault of Leibov Hive was deemed infeasible, uh, so long as the other hives of the Nexus remained active and defensible. From the eyewitness account, Pilot Officer Gregor Helks, 33rd Kalyan Air Wing. When we came up on Leibov, 
We were dropping in from 30,000 meters in a flat diamond formation of 25 machines. We had the main sun right behind us. Visibility was good, and we got a decent impression of the sheer scale of the main hive. The enemy was up and in force. I counted about 600 machines, mostly in dogfights with 29 and 672 squadrons. It was a massive air duel. Planes from 451 Squadron, Colonel Xerxes, piled in right past us on a steep dive, moving much faster and steeper than us. So, we turned in, and stood in our wings, and peeled out to attack. The blessing of the Emperor was upon us. I had my guns on two before I had to turn up out of the dive, and crossed with a third that I'm pretty certain I sent to hell. It was deadly work. Every curve and turn, every banking move or roll risked a collision with another craft, friend or foe. It was like shoals of fish racing and lapping around one another. The G was intense on every turn, and five times as many on as the digits on my right hand. I evaded a fatal clash by a hair's breadth. I made two more good kills, both confirmed on my way out, then struck to a trio of enemy fighter bombers, turning low and west, and sent one of them down. Then I found myself in a knife fight with an arch-enemy machine, a devil of a pilot, who rolled around the sky until most of my munition load was gone. I was low on fuel, and I didn't fix him. I lost him over the western transits. I think by then he may have bounced some of the thunderbolts of 29, but I didn't see it. Then I turned back for the carrier on the last dregs of my reserves. Most objections to the various drop-point plans were made by Carnhide's infantry commanders. Intelligencers had procured a great deal of useful data, suggesting the Nexus Zone enjoyed considerable air cover from the arch-enemy interceptor squadrons, based for the most part on mobile land carriers. These hunter-killer squadrons were hard to track and kill from orbit. Infantry force commanders reasoned that the fighter screen would render any troop drop practically suicidal, while the dense formations of enemy stoop bombers would swiftly annihilate any forces that made it to the surface intact. This was especially true of the Strade Bay landing zones that were Carnhide's particular preference. Carnhide bounced the problem to his Navy officers, initially with requests to bring the landing fleet into a much tighter lower orbit, from which the carrier machines could be more accurately targeted. Unwilling to risk their line ships and troop conveyances against the range of the arch enemy's huge anti-orbital batteries, the Navy officers devised a scheme of their own. Realizing that a flat refusal to Carnide might result in them being ordered into close orbit anyway, Flight Marshal Carol Hyden presented an attack plan to General Carnide, whereby the Navy fighter squadrons would be deployed into the atmosphere in advance of the troop drop to engage the enemy aircraft head-to-head -head for air superiority. Such a bold tactic was ordinarily disliked by most commanders of the fleet, who resented wasting fighter craft by sending them in without orbital barrage support. However, the individual pilot officers, whose views were often overlooked, relished the notion of such a challenge, and in this theatre, the commanders of the major vessels preferred to gamble their fighters rather than their main ships. The plan was agreed. Eight masked waves of Imperial fighters, predominantly thunderbolts but also some wings of lightnings, began the assault at zero hour on day one. Almost 30,000 machines were sent in, and were matched at the height of the engagement by almost 45,000 enemy warplanes. Overall, 63,000 Imperial warplanes were committed to the campaign. The total number of arch-enemy machines is not known, but is estimated to be around 140,000. The principal attack zones were the Shredé Bay Area, Bulk Cliff Hive and the Zinc Hills region. The most intense of these initial air battles were fought at Shredé Bay on the first and third days of operation, and at Zinc Hill on day four. As the air war entered its second week, a massive engagement lasting nine hours engulfed the coastal zone of Bulk Cliff Hive. Later in the second week, more air battles cut across the coast at Shredé Bay North. And then, at the start of the third week, which was day 15, a final mass engagement took place southwest of Leibov Hive itself. And by that stage, arch-enemy air power had been reduced to about a third of its starting strength. 
Its wings clipped, Leibov could no longer protect itself comprehensively from the air. It was now vulnerable to full-scale land assault. But after over two weeks of air combat, the archenemy knew what was coming. In the opening segment of the campaign, Karnhide had been required to mediate between the interests of the Imperial Guard and the Imperial Navy. Many of his command elites saw these difficulties as symptomatic of the unalloyed, unfocused nature of the task force Kyborn had bequeathed to Karnhide, and furthermore regarded their commander's handling of the problems as weak. However, we may see in hindsight that Karnhide was a skillful manipulator, who concealed his guile well behind a veneer of gentle conviviality. A warrior of the old school, Karnhide had enough experience to know that the Guard and the Navy were august and rival schools of warfare, and that lack of cooperation between them was as traditional as it was endemic. He orchestrated the air war simply by showing both parties what they didn't want to do, and then standing back and allowing them to conjure their own solution. Now, the land war had to commence. Though the skies were clear enough for a full-scale drop, the guard were once again resistant. The air war had given the enemy plenty of time to make ready for an inevitable orbital invasion. Karnhide understood the reservations. A weaker, or perhaps less flexible, commander might well have ordered the guard in anyway, damning the consequences. But Karnhide believed that the answer lay with the Mechanicus. Another thorny web of negotiations faced him. If the Guard and the Navy could be famously uncooperative, the Mechanicus was another thing entirely. The Mechanicus priesthood had entered into the Crusade through cooperative packs carefully formed by Slado in the early years, and their war machines had proven invaluable, not to say decisive, in a great number of cases. But they were still an autonomous body, no more willingly subject to the command of a regular crusade general than the Adeptus Astartes, and it was widely understood that the priests of Mars were growing increasingly dissatisfied with the progress of the crusade. It had endured longer than they had been led to expect by Slado, and they were being required to provide ever greater quantities of battlefield vehicles. Makarov had done little to placate them, and those sections of the Mechanicus that had been assigned to the Second Front greatly resented not being used for the glory of the primary campaign. If they were to be used at all, they declared, then, in the Emperor's name, they would be used where the true glory lay. Karnheit had a reserve of over 130 Titans in his task force, the majority of them Warhound variants. He believed that the Titans had the power and fortitude to break open the ground defences and open a way for the Guard and its armour. Karnhai had spent hours in patient, respectful talks with the priests of the Mechanicus. Eventually, he reduced his argument to a very simple piece of persuasive logic. He reasoned that War Master Makarov, boldly seeking triumph and glory, would most likely summon to the front line those units that had shown the greatest zeal and appetite for war the very hunger for victory that he himself exhibited and which he looked for in others. If the Mechanicus wished to quit the second front and be realigned at the front, then an active display of military ambition would be needed. He promised that if the Mechanicus led the ground attack on Leibov, he would personally see to it that the reports of that action were sent directly to the War Master's attention. It is important to note that Karnhide made no other promises, nor any claim that he could bring to bear influence that was not in his remit. He simply seeded the idea in the minds of the priests that they could get what they wanted by demonstrating their desire to meet the enemy. The titans of the Mechanicus led the assault the next day. Three key target zones were selected, Shredé Bay, Bulk Cliff Hive and Zinc Hill. The titan landings were achieved with the support of long-range orbital bombardment and carpet bombing. At each location, the Mechanicus tactic was to land and then radiate its forces out from the landing zone, rather than to drop and then advance on a target. Large areas of territory were cleared at Zinc Hill and Shredé Hive in this fashion. 23 hours after the Titan operational deployment, with all signs from the surface good, the Imperial Guard at last mobilised in a mass drop of troops and armour, 2.6 2.6 million troops went in with the first wave, targeting the free main zones where the Titans were already opening the defences. However, a fourth drop force directly targeted Kazenberg. 
the drop troopers, predominantly carnelian and light foot, stormed the inner towers of the hive and wrested control of the hive's automatic defenses from the arch enemy. Though the second largest hive on the planet, Kazenberg fell by far the fastest and most easily, with the minimum of collateral damage. Later, during restoration work, the manufacturing and generating plants of the generally intact Kazenberg were swiftly brought back into use by the Imperial Occupation Force, which greatly aided early recovery. Zinc Hill, a tertiary-sized industrial hive in the heart of the southern nexus, proved the toughest of all the subsidiary hives to conquer. It had been the most resistant to the Mechanicus' assault and still retained some air cover, which it used to devastating effect. Additionally, second-wave Imperial Guard elements were dropped close to it and advanced under armor support. A vast battle then erupted along the western wall of the main hive structure as the Imperial forces attempted to storm the hive. The archenemy deployed many bizarre engines of destruction, including mobile wall-top hardpoints and mechanized heavy mortars, which spat, by means unknown to the Imperial tech priests, geezers of high-velocity razor chaff. These latter weapons were able to shred both men and body armor, even at comparatively long range. However, their mechanisms were delicate, and heavy bombardment from Imperial Guard field batteries eventually broke their line. After three days of constant warfare, the Western War was breached. The Imperial Guard elements successfully penetrated the outer ring of the hive. In the broad agroponic zones inside the wall, the Imperial forces found themselves facing an enemy concealed in a ditch work of trenches and foxholes. Vicious trench warfare persisted for a further two days until the titan Vainglory Tumultus was brought in to clear the way. Ground troop losses were high. Once the inner hive had been breached, the Imperial Guard was harried by a host of poorly armed cult zealots who attacked down the hive streets and stacks with suicidal disregard for their own safety. Carnhide rendered field command to the discretion of his officers on the ground at Zinc Hill, allowing them to deal with the fluctuating and chaotic street fighting on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, rather than issue blanket commands from a distance. Wisely, he recognized that by the time he had made any command decisions based on the data flow, the situation would have already changed. Later investigation revealed why Zinc Hill had been so hard a target. Arik Etagor had made his base at Zinc Hill rather than, as many would have presumed, at the Major Hive. Zinc Hill had evidently become a site of keen ritual or sacred importance for the archenemy forces, and was therefore defended with special vigour. It is also entirely possible that Arik Etagor was in residence at Zinc Hill at the time of the invasion, and the staunch defence was in part a cover to allow him to escape and flee to Leibov Hive. Observers and comrades describe General Carnhide's demeanour during the campaign as calm and affable, and as unflustered, almost relaxed, and this reputation did him no favours later. However, as is evidenced by his campaign journal, he was more than cognizant of the demands placed upon him and the difficulties presented by Leibov as a target. He wrote, Grateful as I am for the chance to take an active command, I could have wished for better than this hive place. The land is tough and uncompromising, and the foe bedded in. There is no time for thorough work to be done for intelligences. Such is the pressure set upon my shoulders by the Lord Militant, and I am given an army to use that, while large, is far from codified and honed. I have not had time to get the wear of it, or to understand its particular traits. Review, review, review all day and all night just to scan and learn the merits of the men I have at my disposal. Once, the hour of attack was imminent. His tone became darker. I fret for this now, in the Emperor's name. May he protect us. The Navy and the Guard are bickering at staff level, and the fleet will not move as I dispose them. As for the hallowed priests of the Mechanicus, I have not even contemplated their sour visages yet. I am shown daily scans of the surface. Perhaps thunderbolts will open this for us. I have not seen such entrenched fortifications since Balhut. Men will burn and die, that I can see. Men will burn and die here, as much as on any field of war. Following his success in convincing the Adeptus Mechanicus to deploy, Carnhide's tone was lifted, so contemporary accounts run. But again, his journals show the lie of it. 
the Titans are in this morning. Good work to be seen, coming back by Overwatch. Picked after picked, clear transmission. I've seen walls fall and fortresses begin to burn, such as the Wrath of Mars, but I have stood in the cargo bays at the foot of a giant Titan and gazed up at it as if it was a god. Now they seem like specks on my magnifier scope, just specks amidst the blooms of fire. There are walls down there that nothing may shake apart, not even a god. Perhaps more tellingly, he wrote, I have been given an army of pieces and I am expected to make a hole out of it. Better pieces that work rather than a hole that does not. The southern fortresses of the transcontinental nexus were cleared or in the process of being pacified. Karnhide's attention turned to the main hive, the gigantic sprawl of Libov hive to which the majority of all extant enemy forces had retreated. As a tactical objective, Libov represented four major discrete strategic problems. First and foremost was the main hive itself. As Karnhide wrote, any force commander, unless he is insane, takes a deep breath before commencing assault on a major hive. In many cases, even the insane ones do too. In their years of occupation, the enemy forces had turned Libov into a veritable fortress, armouring the hive's outer structure and festooning it with gun emplacements and malicious anti-personnel devices. But there were secondary problems. To the west of Libov Hive lay the ancillary hives Zenik and Zivan, both of which were still in enemy hands. Via these two hives, primary power reserves were fed into Libov from the power farms on the western seaboard. To the south and southwest of the main hive, an overlapping system of defensive trenches, dikes and armour traps had been constructed in a wide crescent many hundreds of kilometres long. Parts of this area had also been mined. It would be a battle just getting to the main hive. Karnhide's officers offered many conflicting schemes of how best to take Libov Hive. Some recommended a frontal assault, others an encircling movement to the east, others still a cross-country drive to smash and cut off the ancillary hives before turning on the main hive itself. Karnhide, showing remarkable fluidity of thinking, though it was seen as woolly indecision by his peers, elected to try all of the plans simultaneously. In his journal, he reasoned, Two concepts strike me with equal merit. One is that no single ploy will bring Libov Hive to its knees. The other is that an officer usually strives the hardest to accomplish a plan, if it is his plan. He hates to be proved wrong. Karnhide divided his considerable forces into six armies. The first under Major General Arkol, who had recommended a slow siege to wait the enemy out, was to maintain the solid and firm occupation of the areas already taken, standing in reserve if necessary. The second under Colonel Khajak, who had supported Arkol's plans, was to be kept in reserve and support position outside Shredé Hive, ready for fast deployment. Jack's army was mostly motorised light infantry. The third army, which Khan Hyde would command himself, was the largest and would commence the frontal assault on Libov Hive, cutting the path through the defensive system. The fourth army, under General Dushin, was to encircle Libov Hive around the east fringe and attack from the northeast sector. Dushan had recommended such a plan. The 5th and 6th armies, both smaller and motorised with extensive armour, would be commanded by Colonel Pequin and Colonel Vernsetter, respectively. They would drive at the ancillary hives with the 5th army severing the communication links with Libov Hive, while the 6th struck at Zivan and Zenik themselves. As a final touch, Karnhide brought in the Navia Mechanicus again, Privately praising their actions thus far, he told them that the war was almost won and that he would hate to see either of them robbed of their share of the climactic glory by the Imperial Guard. The Mechanicus immediately lent its war machines and titans to the 3rd and 4th Army strengths, while the Navy agreed to conduct precision airstrikes on the coastal power farms and then move in to provide air cover to the 5th and 6th Armies. After two weeks of preparation... Rearmament and deployment. The main assault began. The fast mobile armies of Pequin and Vernsetter struck deep at the southern side of the ancillary hives. Pequin's forces succeeded in destroying all the mass transit and cable links with the main hive in the space of about a single day, and then turned west on the approaches of Zenik. 
By then, ferocious Navy airstrikes had reduced the power farms to a molten crater, lifting a 20-kilometre-wide pall of black smoke into the atmosphere. Vern Setter's Sixth Army broke into the southern side of Zevin, and then ground to a halt as it encountered formidable resistance. For the first time since the start of the invasion, the Imperial Guard was to come face to face with significant numbers of blood packed. Doshan's large fourth army had been on the move for the better part of three days and swung around to assault the northeastern periphery of the main hive. Before they were within shelling range of the hive itself, they were met by enemy armor in huge numbers. Again, these forces were principally units of the notorious Blood Pact, armed with captured and customized Imperial battle tanks. An enormous armor battle began on the northeastern plains. Meanwhile, the Third Army, the largest force, was digging a path for itself up through the crude but lethal defensive system erected by the archenemy southwest of the Hive. They had been under fire and shelling for the moment they began, but the strengths of the Mechanicus Titans served them well. The giant machines would destroy and clear the kind of defences that would stop a tank or an armoured carrier. Two Titans were lost in this phase during the huge set-piece onslaught, but by the end of the first day, Khan Hyde had the outer walls of the main hive in sight. Then he heard that, in Zevin, Vernsetta's men were being fought to a standstill by the merciless blood pact. Worse was to come. Northeast of the main hive, Doshan's fourth army was being pushed back and slaughtered. Both commanders pleaded with Karnhide for support from the reserves. He refused. Much has been made of Karnhide's cold and heartless refusal of aid, but the matter has been over-egged. He clearly wanted to support the efforts of his beleaguered officers, but it was a matter of commitment. Karnhide knew well that the reserves represented by the first and more particularly the second army groups would be vital to reinforce the main assault within a day or two. He could not spare them, or redirect them from this role, or risk losing the entire war. Karnhide also still had faith in the notion that an officer usually strives the hardest to accomplish a plan if it is his plan. He had confidence in both Doshan and Vernsetta. They had claimed to be capable of accomplishing their individual objectives. He had to trust them at their word. In less than 24 hours, his confidence was rewarded. Vernsetta managed to manoeuvre the large part of his 6th army into an attacking lunge that drove the blood pack back about three kilometres into Zevin. Paquin, skimming the hive at Zevin, had moved with admirable speed to support the 6th in a counter-strike and brought the 5th army in to close like a pincer on the blood pack's left flank. The 5th and 6th armies were then heavily supported by the navy wings, which attacked both the blood pack in Zevin and strategic targets in Zemek Hive. It would be a further nine days before the fierce warfare in the ancillary hives resulted in a conclusive imperial victory, and losses were high including Vernsetta himself, but the word was out. Fueled by the news that the Blood Pact was not as invincible as their reputation and demeanour suggested, Doshan redoubled his efforts on the northeast front and ran their heavy armour and titans in his command in a long, tight angle of attack across the hydroelectric valleys of the East Lyob River. Simultaneously, he redirected battalions of light support and anti-tank units around the north in a circling manoeuvre. A second hellish tank battle developed, blotting out the sunlight with its smoke and dust. But Doshan's gambit was successful. Battered by the advancing barrage of the armour and mechanicus machines, the formidable host of blood-packed war machines recoiled north of the hydroelectric valleys and attempted to reform in squadron strength. Many became easy targets for the advancing anti-tank units and were destroyed before they could reassemble. The blood-packed armour broke into two distinct elements, both forced to retreat towards the flanks of the main hive. Outside the main east gate, one element was overtaken by a rapidly advancing force of warhounds and tank destroyers and systematically annihilated. The other element attempted to push out against the encircling light support battalions, which punished it severely and broke its cohesion. As Doshan's main force advanced to assault the outer defences of Leibov Hive proper, this light support and tank destroyer force prowled the charred hinterland, picking off the last of the blood pack's struggling machines, cut off and rogue like wild animals. By that time, 
As word that Doshan's first proper assault on the main hive had begun in earnest reached him, Karnhide had broken the Third Army past the defence systems and crossed the outer road networks into the shadow of the hive itself. The trooper Emric Garsh, a Colstec infantryman with the Third Army, recorded this chilling and articulate account of what confronted them there. The hive itself, Vibov Hive as it is named, appeared to us like a black cliff rising from the cracked grey ground. It was plated in giant sections like a beetle, like the lustrous wing cases of a great beetle, and stacks and spires rose like spines above that towering plating high into the sky, where the smoke and cloud fogged them. The wind was cold and sharp, and there were all sorts of scents on that wind, blood and dirt and oil and ash. We were ascending along the road network that once had led into the base of the vast hive. Many of these were great rock creep bridges and spans supported on stilts and pylons of stone. All the while we were under fire from the emplacements and hard points, studying the hive's black plating. Cannon fire, batteries, las, flamers. They used the flamers closest to where the range of fire burnt men off the roadways and blistered the surface of the bridges until they bubbled and blistered. The barrage filled the air with sparks and darts of fire, dense as sleet. We were told to advance, but we dared not, as to advance was to advance into death, and even our commissars balked at the option. But to stay put was death also, as the myriad shots and shells dropped in amongst us and blew us bone from bone. So we charged the hive, and it was not death. It was very like it, and it was death for many, but it was not death for me, for I am here writing of it. It was just like death. Very like it. General Karnhide's Third Army penetrated the southwestern perimeter of Leibov Hive in the early hours of the campaign's 17th day. Intense block warfare began as the Imperial invaders poured in and up through the hive shelf stacks. Well orchestrated resistance met them every step of the way, and Karnhide was quickly forced to call in the secondary army to support him, as he had anticipated. The fighting continued unabated for 80 hours. 46 hours into that period, news came that Doshan's force had also breached the main hive perimeter in the northeast and was also driving in towards the hive's core. Karnhide's spirits lifted, but were quickly dashed again, as other force commanders had discovered before him, and as many again afterwards. Karnhide found in the blood pact a serious and respectable foe, that understands with curiously human insight the scalding game that is city fighting. I find I could not section and rout the foe as I would against a confederacy of mindless cultists. The Blood Pact, how I am coming to loathe that name, lay traps, said ambushes, mine tenements and even entire stacks as they retreat. They fight cleverly and with stealth and guile, employing snipers and booby traps and even suicide attacks. A chamber is cleared, then the guardsmen within are slain by blood pact lurking in wait on the other side of the wall. I've lost too many good men. Too many. And too many of them I would have shaken by the hand and thanked before death claimed them. After 80 hours, Karnhide called a halt and allowed the front line to retire and be replaced. Fighting dulled for a while, though all at the main assault line could hear the distant thump of Doshan's northeastern attack. At hour 85, Karnhide pressed on again, with a sudden furious lunge through the multiple levels of the wounded hive, causing a sudden stung withdrawal on the part of the enemy. They were encountering fewer blood pact at this stage, and more and more levies and cultists. A great fire, possibly the result of stray munitions, but most probably due to enemy sabotage, broke out in the main hive's northern sectors and burned unchecked. It would later claim and destroy approximately one-fifth of the hive. Karnhide's mind was now focused on one goal, to locate and destroy Arak Etagur, the charismatic focus of Leibov's resistance. On several occasions, rumours had circulated that Etagur had been found and slain, but each one was false. Karnhide drove his forces into the heart of the hive, relentlessly, realising that victory, however painful, was now in his grasp. Late on the 73rd day of the Leibov campaign, three fire teams of specialists from the 82nd Carnelian Light Foot, commanded by Lieutenant Victor Gonfell, finally ran the Etigore to the ground. 
The fire teams comprised 18 infantrymen with two crews of light support and specialised in city block clearance. Gonfell was a veteran officer, driving ahead of the main advance through the now burning habs of northern Leibov. Gonfell's men encountered unexpected resistance from a squad of blood-packed warriors. The firefight was inconclusive, though it drove the enemy back down a stackway into a vandalised sensorium and left three of the foe dead on the causeway outside. Checking the bodies for life signs, Carnhide's men had learned to their cost that wounded blood packed often played dead whilst palming grenades. Gonfell's medic noticed that the corpses wore black garlands and had gold leaf rubbed upon their masks. Gonfell was at once alert to the notion that these troopers were somehow special or raised up. He sent signals to General Command for support. Before any support could arrive, Gonfell's squads found themselves under renewed fire from the precincts of the old sensorium. Gonfell elected to move and ordered his mortar teams to shell the façade and the inner yards. After 20 minutes of sustained bombing, which expended most of the group's shell munitions, Gonfell ran his troops forward through the shelled-out ruins of the sensorium front. They met fierce resistance. Blood-packed troopers came out of cover, Ammo spent using their bayonets, trench axes and hands to repel the attackers. Gonfell killed six of them personally and, in his memoirs, suggests that many of his men accomplished a similar feat. The Imperials had charged Laz rifles at their disposal and made slaughter of the feral brethren of the Pact. Fighting continued deep into the Sensorium Quad and beyond into the Holy Sepulchre which Gonfell relates as being heinously spoiled and smeared about in all treason. By this time, a squad of Kazakhin specialists had closed on the area to support Gonfell. However, Gonfell himself had sighted an enemy he believed to be the rogue Etagor. With two of his men, he pursued him through the lower quad and out towards the west door of the sensorium. Turning as if cornered, the enemy drew a barbed chainsword and snarled into the attack. Both of Gonfell's men died in terrible ways. Gonfell himself fired twice and missed. He had one last charge left in his power pack and he expended it into the enemy's snarling face. Akea Etagor was dead. It later transpired that Gonfell had missed and the headshot was claimed by one of the Kazakhin marksmen in an adjacent building. But in spirit, the work was done. Though sporadic fighting continued for weeks afterwards, Leibov was taken and Karnhide was victorious. Karnhide expected glory for his achievement. He did not get it. Doubts were cast on his strength of character and even his ability to command. Deeply wounded by criticism, he published his account of the action at Leibov and retired from the crusade. Eighteen months later, he was dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Karnheid's actions on Leibov and the nature of his disgrace and death is an object lesson to all scholars of imperial tactics. Though he achieved his goals, Karnheid was accused of wavering and indecision and of muddling his focus. Kaiborn himself berated Karnhide for allowing the parts of your command to do as they will. Only history and the persuasive voice of the Tactica Imperialis can amend that slight. Andreas Karnhide understood his duty and his function. Poorly supplied and equipped, he accomplished what his seniors did not believe to be feasible. They accused him of ill focus against a focused foe but he understood the true nature of the crusade animal and all its various parts and allowed them to function at their best in concert rather than cohesion. Ironic then, that against mankind's newest and most united foe, Karnheide chose to play to the strengths of the Imperial Guard, Navy and Mechanicus at its most divided and make that an asset. Even with his officers, with their disparate plans and schemes, he sought triumph, allowing each one his head. Though driven to suicide in disgrace by his contemporaries, Karnhide remains an example to all commanders who find the divided wings of the Aquila at his or her disposal. Karnhide saw strength and success in disunity, just as the archenemy realised the opposite. His example should be followed wisely. Gerion. In 774, Colonel Commissar Gaunt led a small infiltration unit of 12 to the occupied world of Garion to find and eliminate the traitor Lord General Notchus Stern, 
before he could reveal classified Astra Militarum secrets to the Arcanite handlers. In the course of this hazardous mission, which was ultimately successful, Gorn's team uncovered the first solid proof of the Anarch's lingering disaffection with the Gore's rule. Information that would form the germ of the policy, formally initiated in 781, to incubate dissent between the two enemy leaders. Though Gaunt had been unable to ease the general suffering of Garion during his target-specific infiltration mission, the Tanif First was among the large crusade force that returned to finally liberate Garion from the arch-enemy control in 777. In order to undertake the covert Garion mission, Gaunt had himself removed from command of the Tanif First. During his absence, the regiment, lacking an officer dedicated to its interests, found itself amalgamated with a distinguished Belladon regiment, the Belladon 81st. This kind of amalgamation, referred to by Blackwood as make do and mend, was uh, extremely common during the desperate early years of the Corwood assault, as units scattered or depleted by loss were forced into new makeshift command groups to make the best use of manpower. The fit was not, at first, easy, and for a while it seemed the Tanif Regiment would vanish from the Imperial records as a regiment with its own identity. However, Gaunt returned from the Garion mission in time to rejoin his regiment at Ancron Sextus in 776, following the death in action of Colonel Wilder, nominally the commander of the amalgamated unit. During the prosecution of the steppe cities of Ancron Sextus, Gaunt resumed command and restored the original regimental title, Tane First. However, many of Wilder's Belladon troops, excellent line troopers in their own right, though more used to conventional battlefield war than scout operations, remained within the Tane ranks. For the second time, the dwindling Tane force was replenished with new intake. The first had been Vergastite troops following the siege of Vervenhive. The Ancron Sextus campaign, focusing on the monolithic steppe cities, was particularly punishing. The steppe cities, the largest of which was Sparshed Mons, were ancient and semi-ruined edifices, believed to have dated from M30 or even earlier. Certain construction details were similar to elements found in the antique, perhaps pre-human fabrications of the so-called fortress worlds of the Cabal systems, and though Ancron Sextus was an outlier to that group, it is classified as part of the fortress world zone. After the initial phase of the liberation effort, the cult armies of the Arcanite, driven out of the imperial settlements and townships, took refuge in the steppe cities. Compartmentalised and multicursal in design, they were hard to penetrate, and scouring the archenemy components out of them was costly. Some theories had suggested the ancient steppe monuments had been raised in veneration of the god emperor, but during the campaign, the notion they were holy sites was rejected. Evidence emerged that the structures especially Sparshed Mons, were ether adjacent, acting as gateways to the war. If worship of the God Emperor had been their original purpose, they had been polluted long since by the ruinous powers. On discovery of the blasphemous nature of the site, orbital bombardment was employed. Weakened by problems of morale and logistics, and the fact that the bulk of its manpower came from new and recently founded regiments, the majority of experienced veteran guard units had been routed to the main front line. The second front had begun to stagnate by the start of 777. To compound the problem, armies of the Corwood assault often found themselves outclassed by the highly proficient ground forces fielded by SEC. It is likely many of the second front commanders would have incurred Makarov's severe displeasure had the Warmaster not been so singularly occupied with his own objectives. However, Lord General von Voitz of the Fifth made particular strenuous efforts to rally the Second Front, in particular by promoting a series of uncompromising actions to liberate certain worlds previously regarded as lost causes. Van Voitz dubbed his strategy Crush and Burn, and its purpose was to restore pride to the Second Front through the final domination of contested fortress worlds in the Cabal systems, and the systematic purging of worlds that had, until then, seemed incontrovertibly the possession of the archenemy, such as Gerion. Crush and burn had the desired effect, though the vast expenditure of resources necessitated by the policy was later questioned by the Munitorum. Van Voigt persisted, reclaiming or purging several of the fortress worlds in rapid succession, in 778, an especially bloody banishment campaign took place on the ruinous world of Jago. Among the Imperial units sent to hold and relieve Jago was the Tanif First. 
Jago was eventually secured after a series of significant battles, but the Tenif Regiment, ordered to hold an isolated and outlying position, took serious losses. Gaunt himself, severely injured in the action, had considered Van Voigt something of a sponsor and mentor during earlier phases of the Crusade, and took issue with Van Voigt's over the relentless and costly nature of this crush-and-burn policy, specifically objecting to the Lord General's use of the Tanif Regiment, which Van Voigt's wastefully utilised as standard field infantry, a role for which they were undersupported and not suited, rather than exploiting their specialism as scout and infiltrator units which Gaunt felt could have been employed with greater effect elsewhere in the theatre. Relations between Gaunt and Van Voigt soured, and a resentment persisted despite later efforts by Van Voigt to mollify and favour his former protégé. Gaunt's feelings towards the Lord General's callous misuse of militarum specialists endured until Van Voigt's death in action on Erdesh in 792. Fringe Actions, 774-780 Though the most intense areas of the war in this period were at the primary front and the secondary Corward assault line, other operations were triggered across the whole region by the crusade effort. The Lord Governor of the neighbouring Kulan sector was obliged to deploy armies to suppress uprisings on Kulan, San Grial and Antrosa. When local populations rose up in protest against deprivation and austerity caused by the tithes levied to maintain supply of the crusade effort, the Kulam Wars had only ended 20 years previously, Slado's last military undertaking before the Sabbat Crusade, and unrest had continued to simmer in many quarters. All of these rebellions were suspected to be the work of Arcanite insurgents, fomenting unrest to weaken the Crusade process, but only at Antrosa was any evidence found of arch-enemy involvement. The San Grail revolt was the most severe, with the ruling nobility issuing a writ of defamation against the Lord Sector Governor and refusing to recognise his authority. Seneschal Grian Galat, of the powerful House Galat, was named Acting Sector Governor, and Sangrael declared itself the true Sector Capital World. The Lord Governor Kulan was quick to quash this affront to his authority, which had no backing from the High Lords or any Imperial process of law, and brutal war was raged to put down the rebellion. In the aftermath, it was clear that the revolt had been driven by genuine public discontent at the enforced privation and draining of material supplies, coupled with the opportunistic ambition of House Galette. Prince Obermid The far-trailing Corwood province world Prince Obermid, liberated during Newfound in 756, also rose up in spontaneous revolt in 778, and the unrest spread to four other worlds in the immediate zone. Pacification efforts under General Rand Hubert were directed from Balhut, pulling several preparing regiments earmarked for frontline advance. It took only a show of force and some minor skirmishes to draw the worlds back into line, but on Prince Obermid itself, a three-year covert operation by agents of military intelligence was able to uncover and eradicate a conspiracy of Umbra Baal faction, fifth columnists, who had infiltrated the government and Munitorum at high levels and generated the unrest. Similar, though less serious, conspiracies were identified on Albrecht, Difnea and Withold, and eradicated before they could cause serious harm. But it was clear that the Arcanate forces, probably at the instigation of the malevolently cunning Anarch, were actively resorting to non-military means to destabilise backline worlds and weaken the Crusade fronts by strangling or breaking their lines of supply. Orestes Open military action was also tried in this regard, with arch-enemy Vahaduk Reavers harassing shipping in the Antioch and Orestes zones. Most notably, the Arcanite tried to cut crusade supplies by military effort at Orestes, another vital forge world asset. Orestes was spared by chance in 780, in an action that became the only significant engine war of the Corwood assault period to rival Leibov. Orestes Forge World lay on the trailward hem of the Sabbat region, technically outside the territory itself, but was a vital source of munitions for the crusade effort and, like Prince Obermid, a key link in the victory veins. Famously, the sibling world of Orestes Nightworld in the Ultima Segmentum. The venerable Legio Tempestus uses both as base outposts. It was targeted by Arcanite forces to cut off crucial supply lines to the crusade. By chance, the Legio Invicta 
En route from the Beltran cluster to join the primary crusade line at the request of Warmaster Makarov, had put into Orestes for restock and was persuaded to walk in defence of the world. In doing so, they effectively broke Makarov's injunction to join him without delay. The Princeps Maximus of the Legio Invicta believed that the protection of the supply lines and the defence of a Mechanicus world took priority. The resulting engine war was significant, coming close to the scale of Carnhide's Leibov assault, and Legio Invicta was triumphant. Legio Invicta then moved spinwards to join the Crusade host and participated in several key actions along the primary front, including the liberation of Erdesh. The Primary Front, 775 to 785. As war continued to rage along the Corwood assault, the Primary Crusade advanced spinward, fresh from its major victory at Moorland, pressed on into the Carcaradon cluster, and began driving the Archon's principal host back. This, said Makarov, is the true measure of it, the true test, the true battle. He dubbed his frontal assault operation Araxen, perhaps suggesting he knew he was charging like a bull. Makarov had almost two-thirds of the total crusade host with him and advanced with typical speed, apparently heedless of the necessity to stabilise his route, a tactic privately questioned by many primary front commanders. The war master evidently expected the Lord's Militant of the Corwood Assault to maintain his rearguard and reinforce the world secured in his wake. This aggressive and uncompromising and confrontational approach, which even the likes of Cyborn and Blackwood seemed reluctant even to undertake, is perhaps the defining quality of Makarov's leadership. He had applied the same approach upon assuming the mantle of war master, with the initial few years of outthrust from Balhut. Matched with his infinite cunning and deep long-term planning and anticipation, belligerent speed of advance seemed his default. Makarov seldom loitered or bided his time in securement. The Carcaradon assaults typify his eagerness to contend with the foe. The Gore had struck back hard, and surprisingly rapidly after Balhut, so Makarov hit back in turn and kept hitting, his intention to keep driving the Archon back in recoil without time to dig in or recover, even if it meant risking overstretch of his own forces. Uriance famously compared this to the slugging, swarming, pressuring style of an infighting boxer. Holton remarks the war master did not want to give the arch enemy any sense that it was winning or gaining ground, and then give it no opportunity for measured retreat or reorder. Makarov's attack style is relentless, forcing the enemy to keep moving and keep responding while constantly stinging from strikes, never leaving him time to draw breath. Makarov would not let the gore out of the fight, not for a second. This rapid pursuit assault tactic proved immensely successful until the early 780s, with significant victories against gore-eyed forces at Zadok, Hydema, Percival and Pice along with successful battle fleet operations along the cluster's edge between 776 and 780. Makarov's intention was to hammer the Gore's forces back into the Irene's group, severing all coordinated connection between the Archon and his Magisters on the second front. In the Irene's group itself, he intended to splinter the Gore's forces and either annihilate them outright or drive them out of the Sabbat region and back into the sanguinary worlds from which they had sprung. To Makarov's mounting frustration, the pace of the operation began to flag, as the battle fleet and auxiliary elements struggled to keep up with his demands for swift mobility and resupply. In 779, warp storms in the Agadeus region forced the bulk of his forces into safe refuge for six months, leaving only Marshal Aldo's battle group, operating to Rimward, capable of fluid movement. Aldo's group, attempting to maintain the pressure tactics of Operation Oroxen to the letter, approached Anxisus Bone in late 780 and met a superior Arcanite force led by Helvik Etigur. After an initial class, Aldo wisely saw he would do nothing except get overwhelmed and slaughtered if he maintained his position. Though he attempted to hold his line for six weeks in the hope that primary front elements would arrive to reinforce him. He was eventually obliged to withdraw to Pice. No longer grounded by storms, the primary main armies finally joined him there in 781, 
with Makarov eager to renew his rapid advance and make back squandered time. Anxissus Bone, 781 to 783. Anxissus Bone, denied to Aldo in 780, became the natural first objective of the waylaid operation. Makarov sent Urians and Lord General Elric in as principals, dispatching Lugo to guard the advance's flank at Tigris and directed Aldo to trailing to investigate reports of mass cult army musters on Logo and Aurelius, and take action as necessary. Anxissa's bone proved to be a nightmarish and long-winded enterprise. Helvik Etigor's forces, which included brigades of the Ermat Brutate, made great use of the vast sub-hive levels, resistant to orbital attack, and frustrated Imperial attempts to flush them out. Long before the world was won in 783, General Lugo, by then supported by militant Marshal Tazara's Kaisan host, was facing a new wave of Gorite assault at Tigris and Gilbaratus. True to his scheme, Makarov had driven through the Carcharodon cluster, but at the fringe of the Irene's group, his advance had genuinely stalled. Irene's group assaults. 781 to 785. Orlok Gore and his host Magistars had capitalised on the warp storms of 779 to refocus their lines and prepare themselves to meet Makarov's headlong attack. The storm activity had gifted them several months of respite from the unstinting Imperial pursuit, and some commentators suggest the storm had been, by some arcane means, summoned by the Gore to hold back the War Master's relentless drive. Whether it was by design or ill fortune, the consequences were inevitable. By 781, after such a promising period of advance, Warmaster Makarov's main battle groups had been brought to an unexpected and complete standstill at the frontiers of the Irene's group, and the Archon was no longer forced into a reactive stance. The archenemy overlord had managed to withdraw the bulk of his forces from the Carcharodon cluster with sufficient alacrity, ahead of the Imperial push, to construct a robust position of resistance along the Irene's border. Makarov's forces were deadlocked at Tigris, Gilbatus, Visor and Sangre. A Bondio and the Anxessus Bone War was still raging. In his heart, Makarov must have known that he needed significant reinforcement, but he knew no help was to be had from the Crusade's secondary front. Comprising as it did now the 5th, 7th, 9th and 12th armies, the Corbett assault was operating far trailwards of Makarov's principal strengths and seemed to remain unable to dislodge the legions of Anarch Sec. Between them, the Archon and his vile Magister had created a situation of defiance that was entirely frustrating both prongs of Makarov's crusade. An attempt to break the deadlock through the establishment of a third front ended in miserable disaster, with the loss of the Second Army, under Marshal Aldo, to Sekite forces at Hellas in 782. Senior advisers urged Makarov to break off from this bull-headed prosecution of the Irene's line and concentrate on squashing Sek in the Cabal systems. With the threat of Sek removed, they cancelled. The Crusade could safely resume its assault of the Archon's position. But Makarov rejected the notion, claiming it would give the Archon enough time, perhaps two or three years, to rebuild and retrench to such an extent that the Irene's line would become unassailable. He also knew that the fierce planet wars raging simultaneously on those worlds could not simply be broken free of without suffering vast losses. Split between these two concentrations of resistance, Makarov's crusade was hemorrhaging momentum and materiel. The crusade had become two crusades, and even Makarov's vast war tithes and massive support from adjacent sector lords could not sustain his ambitions. Furthermore, there was a general and growing fear that if properly coordinated, the forces of Sek and Gore might combine with such effect, the Sabbat World's crusade force would actually be annihilated. Tigris finally fell to Urians in early 784, and he immediately pressed on to assault Kilgrave. His spirits somewhat lifted by this sense of a breakthrough coming, Makarov doubled down on his determination not to break off the primary assault. He insisted that his original plan was delivering results, and that his critics had merely needed to exhibit some patience. However, there is no disguising the immense toll taken on the Astra Militarum along the Irene's line before this period. Perhaps the most concentrated, gruelling, costly and unrelenting assault phase of the Crusade to date. 
Makarov's stubborn position that his grand scheme was achieving its intended goals may simply have been vanity, and a desire not to lose face or seem weak in the eyes of high command. Confidential reports now make it clear that Makarov's determination was secretly fueled by the hope of another line of attack that very few in high command had knowledge of. This program, an audacious and covert gambit designed to destabilize and sunder the Arcanite hosts, was a massive gamble even by Makarov's standards and offered absolutely no guarantee of success. The germ of the idea originated far from the front lines at the Irene's frontier and even the embattled holdings of the Corwood assault. The strategy that might yet win the crusade was first formed on Balhut in 780. A plan of salvation. After the beating they had taken on the fortress world of Jago in 778, the Tanif first under Gaunt had finally been retired from the line after 12 years of unrelieved active combat service. The retirement was long overdue and was expected to last for at least a year. Gaunt hoped for resupply and reinforcement and perhaps posting to the primary front, having served for most of the previous years in the thankless turmoil of the second front zones. It was during this period of retirement that he was brought into contact with an Arcanite prisoner, a captured Etagore, who had been sent to Balhut for interrogation. The Etagore, named Mabon, was a Sekite deserter, and some sources say he had previously served with the Blood Pact, and before that had been an Astra Militarum officer. There was clearly little reason to trust the word of a creature who could change sides with such frequency. But the Etika refused to talk to anyone except Gaunt, whom he had encountered on Garion during the classified mission of 774. Details of the proceedings on Balhut are scant, but it is clear that during the interviews, Gaunt first hit upon the notion of dividing the enemy through a sustained campaign of sabotage and misdirection in an attempt to provoke Sek and the Gore into an internecine war that would weaken them both. This essential idea was not original to Gaunt. Variations on just such a program had been discussed, formulated and even brought to blue paper level in the years immediately after Balhut. But at that time, a violent division between the Arcanite leaders had been expected as a consequence of the power vacuum after Nadzibar's death. That had, to all intents and purposes, never come. The Anarch and the Archon had formed a collaborative bond that had lasted for over a decade, and whatever grievances they held against each other had been sublimited in favour of the general war effort. Gaunt's proposal, which he took first to the Officio Prefectus, was simple, to artificially aggravate the natural enmity between the two through a systematic campaign of raids against Sekite and Gorite forces that would appear to credit each faction with the assault upon the other. This could only hope to be successful in any way if the Imperials were privy to specialist data concerning arch-enemy targets, habits and dispositions, data that the captive Etagor promised to deliver for reasons that are not entirely understood. After careful study, the plan was ratified, and supported by Cyborn and then rapidly by the Warmaster himself. Ironically, attempts by Arcanite insurgents to eliminate the captive Etagor on Balhut only added weight to the idea that the data he carried was of substantive value. Lord Militant Kyborn was later to downplay the Warmaster's involvement and even awareness of the project. Writing in 789, he recalled feeling that if the mission went well, it would be of significance. For the cause, of course, but also for everyone who supported the effort. In that regard, success would lend some gloss to the War Master. But I believe he had precious little familiarity with the scheme. He was a great distance to Spinward at the primary front, hammering at the doors of the Irene's group. And it doesn't take a TAC officer to appreciate how many missions, submissions, requisitions and blue papers he was required to scrutinise and approve every day. The Salvation's Reach expedition was one raid, part of a sequence of minor operations, in a corner of the Sabbat worlds, not seen as directly strategic. If it failed, it would be forgotten, dismissed as irrelevant. But if it succeeded, this sequence of minor operations 
comprised 28 raids, which in no way represented any significant commitment of men and materiel. They were nothing so grand the Warmaster had to approve resourcing. Makarov's own commentary at the time shows a much keener interest in the project than Kyburn suggests, and a more direct oversight. But Kyburn was an old hand, and evidently eager to play a political game in an effort to magnify his role in the endeavour. He still seethed with resentment of the way he and others had been disfavoured by appointment to the Corwood assault. Kyburn wanted to prove his worth and secure, in the eyes of history, great personal credit for the project, as if he and he alone championed it. To this end, he even played down Gaunt's involvement, seeming to suggest the entire thing had been his brainchild, rather than Gaunt's or Makarov's. However, Kyburn had always been one of the most politically astute Lord Militants. Edreco suggests that while acknowledging Kyburn's clear desire to take the Carnadon's share of the credit, if the venture prospered, credit that would reignite his reputation and career and make him a more credible alternative to Makarov. Kyburn was quietly but staunchly protecting both Gaunt and the Wallmaster. He underplayed it as a munitorum commitment, evading any potential charges that vital resources had been wasted on a doomed and unjustifiable programme, and took responsibility for shepherding the plan so that, should it have failed, both Gaunt, if he survived, and the Warmaster, would be absolved of any charges of recklessness in the affair. As proof of Kyborn's nuanced selflessness, Adreco cites that, during negotiations with Adeptus Astartes, whose participation in the mission was essential, the Lord Militant allowed himself to be personally humiliated in favour of Gaunt over matters of protocol. Kyborn understood the game, Adreco writes, citing Gaunt's personal record of the encounter. He was playing a part. He knew the Adeptus Astartes would want to make the bond personally with Gaunt. But the chapter master wouldn't have looked at a petition if it hadn't come with the explicit backing of Crusade High Echelon and a Lord Militant or two. Kyborn was an enabler. He had to be present, for form's sake, even if it was just so they could belittle him. Under Kyburn's stewardship, the operation was authorised for action in 781. The Rimwood Marginals. The programme began under utmost secrecy. Though Gaunt's Salvation's Reach mission was the most famous, it was not the first action to take place. The first attack was made four weeks before Gaunt embarked, and seven more were executed before Gaunt reached the Marginals' target zone. In the space of these six months, side reel, 28 raids took place at selected and classified locations across the trailing portion of Newfound and Cabal regions. All of them worked according to the philosophy devised by Gaunt, Kyborn and their ally at the Officio Prefectus, Commissariat Intelligence Director, Isaiah Mercure. Gaunt and Mercure had specified the tactics and the manner of the clues and evidence to be left behind, including Arcanite-coded information to be broadcast on arch-enemy Vox substrates. These transmissions were, as McCure recollected, as authentic as we could make them. The most critical mission and the one upon which all the others depended was, of course, Gaunt's undertaking at Salvation's Reach in the remote Rimward Marginals. The Marginal Zone lies on the rim of the Sabbat territories, and extends beyond the formal imperial boundary into the dead gulf territories and feral world expanse. The currents of real space and the vagaries of the warp have condensed a vast cloud of material in the gravity pit of this region, a monumental agglomeration of debris almost 200,000 kilometres deep at its thickest. Part of it is planetary debris, rocks, dust and other mineral affluent, forming solid masses like gallstones or basors. Some of it, however, is artificial in origin. Many theories circulate as to the origin of this material, most of them unreliable. During the Beatty's original crusade of liberation across the Sabbat worlds, the marginals were alleged to have been the site of a significant fleet action, a turning point in the fortunes of the Imperium that had put the interests of the sanguinary worlds and their Archon into retreat. Legend said that Salvation's Reach had been the name of the Imperial flagship, a flagship that had stood its ground under astonishing enemy fire, 
and had died with all hands, holding the line long enough for the saint's victory to be achieved. It is reported in many old chronicles that the debris accumulated in the junk belt as the wreckage of that titanic fleet action, the battlefield litter of one of the Rim's greatest real space engagements. Other stories insist that Salvation's Reach was the name of a planet destroyed during that void fight, or the name of the archenemy supermassive that had finally been scuppered just minutes before it target locked the Saint's cruiser. Imperial survey missions suggest these legends are no better than half-truths. The debris field includes a great deal of military junk, but it is the accumulated residue of thousands of fights accidentally clustered there, not the devastation left by one fight at this location. Besides, there are too many tech types and too many species variants. Cogitation analysis reveals vast differences in the ages and decay of debris samples. Some pieces of scrap were just a few hundred years old. Some were a few hundred thousand. Current thinking is that this graveyard of wrecks has been formed by the natural gravitational perturbations of real space. Craft lost and foundered down through the ages, washed up at Salvation's Reach. And there they had gathered, collected, mangled each other, and, through the actions of decay and gravetic pressure, fused into a great knot of material, accumulating like a metal reef. Not all of the material is imperial in origin. Some ancient scraps, the carcasses of lost imperial vessels, are relics of Terran tech that had not been seen for so long. They were no longer recognisable to the Adeptus Mechanicus. Old template patterns, unrecoverably deformed, lurked in the silent residue. Some of it is so old, so worn, so alien, it is impossible to discern the source or original function. Mechanicus expeditions have been mounted down the years, along with inquisitorial probe missions and countless endeavours of salvage and scavenging, but the marginals are unstable, inhospitable and remote, and the secrets cast away there were too demanding to recover. The core target sought by Gaunt's mission was a hulk habitat of considerable size, converted for use as a weapons development facility and manufactory. This facility had originally been set up by the Magister Herator Asphodel, under the instruction of the then Archon Nadzibar. It was extremely remote, inconspicuous and allowed for the enhancement and testing of weapon systems, be they systems developed by the mad genius Asphodel, recovered Xenos artifacts or gifts from the demented Chaos Gods. Nadzibar had fallen on Balhut, and Asphodel had perished by Gorn's hand on Vergast, but the facility remained, falling into the control of the Anarch Sec. He was using it to strengthen his hand and develop weapon support for his sons. It was an arsenal, a stockpile, and a laboratory. According to the asset, the Sekai prisoner Mabon, Sek still felt strongly he should have taken on the mantle of Archon after Nadzibar. The Anarch resented Gore's rise to eminence and, though obliged by martial politics of the Soanguinary worlds to pact with him, had little respect for Gore's command of the campaign since Balhut. Sek envied Gore's authority, and he envied Gore's revolutionarily disciplined personal army, the Blood Pact. He press-ganged Blood Pact warriors like Mabon to help him create his own force, the Sons of Sek, and set out to prove that he deserved the mantle of Archon. It was a compelling claim. The previous decade had shown Erlok Gore to be a savage chieftain, capable of extreme brutality, even by the standards of the ruinous powers. His blood pact was certainly supremely effective, but he was also sloppy and lacked strategic insight. His blunt and ferocious style of war making him lose as much as he gained. In contrast, the Anarch Sek, a far more ingenious and mercurial tactician, had performed superbly along the Crusade's second front in the face of the Imperium's most determined efforts. It was entirely reasonable to expect that if, by means of facilities such as Salvation's Reach, Sek could show he was a better leader than Gore, more able, better served and better equipped, the tribes of the sanguinary worlds might oust Gore and look to Sek to take the crown of the Arcanite and begin a new period of effective aggression. What better results could the Imperium hope for than to have the fragile partnership of Archon and Anarch fracture, and for Gore and Sek to turn upon each other. The asset, Mabon, 
had told Korn that the Weaponrights were a fraternity of technical adepts who operated the Reach manufactories and had served the malign Herator Asphodel, but would now be serving a new Herator, enabling him to function as Sek's principal arms provider. Their prowess was likened to the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus, though they relied far less on augmented body modifications and far more on esoteric and forbidden law. He called the institution a college of heritants. Gaunt's mission, at the head of the Tanif First, and with the cooperative action of the Adeptus Astartes, was to infiltrate the college facility, remove vital and valuable materials, and then destroy it, thus depriving Sek of precious technologies and stealing them for the Imperial cause. Moreover, he was to make this raid appear to be the work of Gorite's blood pact. The Highness, Sir Armaduke. The ship selected for the Rimward Marginals mission was the Highness Sir Armaduke, an Imperial Tempest class frigate. The Highness Sir Armaduke was an old ship that had seen centuries of service in previous campaigns and had been withdrawn from primary battle fleet operations and reserved for auxiliary and support roles. It is alleged the ship was deemed by many to be reaching the end of its viable service life and was scheduled for decommission. And though this is denied by fleet sources, given the highly hazardous nature of the expedition, it seems likely that Kyborn secured a disposable asset in case of loss. Certainly, he would have found it much more difficult to procure an active line ship. The Armaduke measured a kilometre and a half from prow to stern and a third of that dimension a beam across the fins. Its real space displacement was 6.2 megatons, commanded by Shipmaster Spiker. The vessel carried for the purpose of the mission 32,407 lives, including the entire Tanif First and its regimental retinue. The Armour Duke was built for close war. Its hull armour was pitted and scorched, and triple thickness along the flanks and the prow. The prow cone was rutted with deep scars and healed damage. The Armour Duke was of a dogged breed of ancient Imperial ships that liked to get in tight with its foe, and was prepared to get hurt in order to kill an enemy. The Reach Objective Though sorely tested, and suffering considerable losses, the Tanif First eventually achieved their mission, though the true nature of that success was not fully understood until 791. Gorn's force had destroyed the arch-enemy weapons manufactory, crippling several critical programs that would have brought great harm to the Imperial cause, and had secretly recovered items and artefacts of great significance to the war effort. Furthermore, and most particularly, the mission, in conjunction with the other raids executed during that time period, had created a rift between the arch-enemy forces, leading both the Anarch and the Archon to believe, eventually, that their forces were turning on each other. This hostility was slow to brew at first, but gradually increased in intensity. From 785 until the liberation of Erdesh in 792, multiplying states of brutal fighting erupted along Gorite and Shedemekan clan lines, effectively hobbling the efforts of the Archon in the Irene zone and the operations of the Anarch along the Khan front. The true extent of this Arcanite civil war is not fully understood, for very little of it was witnessed by Imperial observers. Some outlying worlds were found scarred or dead, and several Imperial holdings liberated by Makarov's primary front revealed evidence of fierce infighting between Sekite and Pacted forces and their allies. Most notably, a ferocious two-year conflict took place around 787 in the Van der Pie systems, both Astra Militarum intelligence and astropathic reports also suggest several conflicts taking place outside Imperial territory to the outward world regions of the Sanguinary tribes. This was a pivotal period for Crusade fortunes, with the enemy divided and great gains to be made. But Gaunt knew none of this, although, as it later emerged, his force had successfully extricated from the Rimworld's target site. The Highness Sir Armaduke suffered a drive failure during its return journey and was lost in the Immaterium. All souls aboard were presumed dead. By 784, the success of the Salvation's Reach mission was properly recognised and it was formally entered on the honour roll of Crusade actions. Citations and decorations were awarded in honour of the lives lost 
and Ibram Gaunt was posthumously promoted to the rank of Lord Militant Commander in respect of his deeds and selfless contribution. The Primary Front, 786 to 791. The artificially provoked conflict between the Arcanite host became increasingly apparent from 783 onwards. As Sekite's actions along the Corwood assault slackened, so too did the Archon's formidable resistance along the Irene's line. Imperial efforts were redoubled. Urians led a punishing assault on Kilgrave, while Eric and Rand Hoopert campaigned on Nibble and Doseed, stemming archenemy efforts to flank the Crusade line to Rimwood. Visor continued to resist Makarov's attacks, and several fleet actions denied him the opportunity to race on to Harkolan. Emboldened by the sense that a tide was turning, and that his foe was divided, Makarov was hungry to capitalise and extended the bulk of his huge Imperial Guard force across a midline front to prosecute both the Irene's group and the last elements of resistance in the Karkaradon cluster, while maintaining the Corwood assault. Once again, and despite the gains, he faced increasing dissent from his own generals and lords militant. For over a decade, they had been urging that lasting success in the Crusade could only be achieved through decisive focus on the warlord Archon, and that, simultaneously campaigning against Sek, spread the Imperial battle groups too thinly. Many, including Cyborn, Van Voigt's and Blackwood, believed that enemy metal had been shattered by infighting, and that Sek's threat was waning rapidly. Kyborn urged the Warmaster to collapse the Corwood assault forces into a holding formation and advance bulk elements to the front line. Presumably, he fervently wished to lead those elements to the front in person, desiring at last to see action at the leading edge of the Crusade. Makarov rejected this approach again and again, insisting that focusing on Gore would allow Sek time to rebuild his strength, and that this would ultimately lead to an Imperial rout. Once again, he was stubbornly steadfast in his policy. He would not allow the enemy to make gains or consolidate anywhere. His strategy was wise, in that the Archon and the Anarch were far from defeated, despite the wounds they had inflicted upon each other. This became quickly apparent at Noctus Primaris and Irene's Secondus. Noctus Primaris the Gore surprised Imperial planners with a full-throated attack on Noctus Primaris in 788, during a phase when his host was expected to do little more than resist in established positions or fall back, due to overstretch and weakness. Adraco suggests that Gore's forces had been supplemented by new strengths raised in the sanguinary worlds, a theory supported by Emony and Hermenes. Both Noctus Primaris and Fika were swept up in this counterpunch, though the worst of the fighting took place on Noctus. A combination of both surface assault and fleet Vahaduk actions took place in the middle months of the year, clearly intended to both break and then circle behind the Crusade's primary front, possibly with the intention of retaking Sangre Adondio and smashing the Deadlock Advisor. The Archon was unquestionably determined to relieve the relentless pressure on his own front line at Irene's by executing a pincer to assault and break Makarov's wide but vulnerable midline front. The archenemy had moved from several years of defensive fallback to renewed open offensive. The attack shocked high command, but Makarov seemed sanguine. He had made great gains, but he, and perhaps he alone, had not been so foolish as to presume the enemy corps was lost. His placement in 785 of the so-called Kulan fleet at Pice suggested he was braced for such a counterpunch, anticipating that the Gore, violent and aggressive in his tactics, would not endure being on the back foot for long, even if it meant a wildly reckless assault. Certainly, without the Kulan fleet able to meet the assault, Noctus Primaris and Faker would have been lost in a matter of weeks. As an aside, it is interesting to consider the archenemy's strategy here. Though the Noctus assault, as it became known, bore the trademarks of Erlok Gore's typical ferocity and aggression, and some might say Makarov's own approach, it was not without nuance. The daring plan swept in trailwards along a core parallel route that seemed unsupported and lacking in obvious backlines. 
Those lines of supply and munition support clearly existed, however, or the assault would have swiftly foundered. Which suggests careful work had been made, both preparing and disguising the progress of advance. Many see this handiwork as far more characteristic of the Anarch, well established as a far more subtle and coordinated commander than the Archon. Strong cases have been made that the Noctus assault, while carried out by Gore's blood-packed host, was devised and orchestrated by Sek. Perhaps this evidence reveals that the rift between the two enemy leaders was nothing like as fundamental as originally believed, but it is more likely, as argued by Teleshar, Ekros and others, that by 788, terms had been reached between the two archenemy warlords in a desperate effort to reunify and avoid annihilation, an idea strongly supported by Eric and Urians. Certainly, circa 786 and 787, the archenemy military was close to collapse on both fronts, and efforts had to be made to maintain their integrity. It is also possible that by that stage, the Arcanite leaders had discovered how fully and completely they had been tricked into fighting each other. The Noctus assault plan may have been devised by Sek for the Gore's use by way of a peace offering, though Sek himself would of course benefit from its success. Undoubtedly, as actions along the Corwood assault soon revealed, Sek was redoubling his efforts, almost to the point of recklessness, as if in an effort to prove his loyalty to the Gore, even at the risk of his own life. Makarov countered the Noctus assault with the swift deployment of the Kulan fleet and dispatched Eric at the head of the 14th Army from Nibal. The Kulan fleet, under Grand Admiral Sorovad, numbering some 190 ships, was not technically part of the Crusades' fighting lists, but was the backbone of the Kulan sector battle fleet. These resources had been loaned to Makarov by the Kulan sector Lord Governor after the Corwood Front had opened up in 773. Though the Kulan sector had many interests of its own to protect, the Lord Governor, whose worlds were being tithed heavily to support Makarov's crusade, recognised the imperative of reinforcing the War Master, for the loss of the Sabbat world's territory would put his own sector frontiers in immediate danger. Edraco suggests the Kulan fleet had been loaned in part to secure a reduction in crippling tithe levels. The Kulan fleet had, thus far, been held in reserve and seen little action. Now it faced fighting on a grand scale, clashing with arch-enemy fleet units in the Noctus Primaris system over a period of 20 weeks, culminating in the engagement of Noctus Primaris' second moon, Thalad, during which the Arcanite forces were broken. This fierce system campaign added several great and illustrious feats to the Crusade honour lists, most spectacularly the defeat by the Kuglan battleship Niard Antita of six arch-enemy capital ships, by Angier, Eric's Astra Militarum forces had arrived in system, and they began the ground war that would see Noctus Primaris liberated by 789 and Fika relieved in 790, a command that established Eric's ability beyond doubt. Irene's Secondus Also in 788, a major Arcanite force under Gorgona Etiger struck at Dosiad raiding heavily before concentrating its fury at Irene Secondus. This assault had been seen as a second pincer designed to mirror the Noctus assault to Rimward and close the circle on the midline front. However, though brutal, it lacked the finesse of the Noctus assault and is presumed neither to be the handiwork of Sek nor part of his gift to the gore of a countermeasure plan. Indeed, its sheer savagery displayed the touch of the gore's hand and it seems it may have been the Archon's own attempt to supplement and mimic Sek's battle plan. Gorgona's host was vast, and Irene's secondus was essentially raised before Imperial relief could arrive. But the archenemy group was not well supplied, and its advance had been impromptu and overhasty, further evidence of the Gore's ill-considered aggression. Indeed, it is possible that the Gore reserved for Gorgana large army strengths that Sek had earmarked for the Noctus assault, if that is true, and the Anarch's plan had been implemented fully, Eric's efforts would probably have been overwhelmed. Lord Militant Call led the assault to Irene Secondus, later supported by army groups commanded by Rand Hoopert and General Casimir. Gorgana was killed, though quickly replaced by Mata Hagaral, a Washist cult leader, 
and the arch-enemy forces driven back to Septa Beta in 790, where the war to eradicate them still rages at the time of writing. The Corward Assault, 786 to 791. His operation significantly restricted by Imperial effort and the lingering conflict with the Archon's forces, Sex dominance of the Second Front decayed rapidly. He was able to maintain only harrying raids and attacks on shipping, and withdrew considerable Sekite reserves from the Cabal systems. Kaiborn and his fellow commanders on the Second Front began to trust that enemy operations in their zone had been broken, and that the Corward assault would soon be wound up so that the Crusade could reunite and press against the primary targets together. But Makarov refused to fold Corward line, a decision vindicated first by the surprise attacks at Noctus Primaris and Irene Secundus, and then by a savage return to form by the Anarch in 789. Perhaps coordinating with the Gaul's efforts, the Anarch returned to the field and struck at Herbutus, Ursa Lycon and Bashun, inflicting broad and wounding effects on the Imperial positions. In his journals, Kaiban later reflected on this period. We use sex, ambition and power against him. After the Salvation's Reach mission, there were others, all framed with the same intent, to ignite the rivalry between Sek and Gore, so they could no longer move in unity. There was conflict and considerable fighting between the sanguinary tribes. Sek, damn his name, was finally broken down, pushed out of the Khan and Cabal systems just as Archon Gore was hounded back to the stalwart line of the Irene's group. We thought victory was close then. We could smell it. But Makarov kept us where we were. He suspected it was not done. I admire his instincts for that, though I still argue that his schemes of prosecution, as I have done since the second damn front was ever a thing. Sek came back at us in 89, after three or maybe four years of hit and run. He struck at Habutus, then Ursa, then Bashun. It was bloody. Cost us a lot. Either the Anarch had been brought into line again by Gore and was making a conspicuous effort to display his renewed loyalty, or he was beginning a last-ditch effort to consolidate his own power and resources. What is definitely clear is that the Anarch of this phase was very different from the one encountered before. Indeed, many claimed he had been wounded or had in some other way lost his wits. In his appraisal notes, tactician Antony de Biota wrote, At the best of times, the ruinous powers are unpredictable and their tactics impenetrable, but now they seem outright incomprehensible. They seem to have come to take back the cabal systems, and yet even by their inhuman standards, they are behaving like maniacs. There is a theory that Anarch Sec has gone insane. It has become impossible to discern any tactical logic to his campaign, not in comparison to some of his actions which have often displayed extraordinary cunning. Many in tactica and intelligence have concluded that he has suffered a psychic break. Perhaps he has been psychologically damaged by the need to show obeisance to the Archon. Gore has humbled him and brought him into line, and that may have been too much for an ego like sex. Or perhaps he is ill, or damaged, or corrupted beyond any measure we can understand. In practical terms, the Anarch launched a counter-strike against a clutch of systems equal to the Gore's Noctus assault, and by late 789 it became obvious that its particular focus was Erdesh Forgeworld, because of its productive assets. I doubt any other world in the Sabbath Zone has changed hands so often in the last 100 years. The Anarch's assault on Erdesh began in full in 790. No one could doubt the strategic importance of Erdesh. Its weapons and munition output were vital to the Crusade and the archenemy alike. Blackwood wrote, Erdesh was the keystone. All stood or fell without it for both sides. Tithed to the very hilt, the Kulan worlds could no longer support the Crusade alone and it was imperative that we had a functioning, mass-productive forge world in our local chain. Without it, the primary front would disintegrate, but the four needed it too. With Erdesh in his pocket again, the Gore could fortify sufficiently 
to stimulate a renewed offensive across the Carcharodon cluster, and years again would be gone up in smoke. Without Erdesh, he would be obliged to sliver back into the feral worlds from whence he came and lick his wounds for a few decades. For that bastard, the Anarch, Erdesh was the ultimate prize. Back in its reserves, his forces were facing obliteration within months. I'd say by 792. If he could take it, and he so wanted to, his hosts would be reborn, and we'd be broken all the way back to the newfound trailing. It would be done for us, and Sek would have proved his worth to the goal, or perhaps empowered himself to such an extent a new Archon would arise in rapid fashion. Warmaster Makarov suddenly saw this extreme jeopardy, a possibility he had feared for many years. To maintain both fronts, he was obliged to act. Some thought he would at last change his strategy and unify the Crusade forces, as so many of his commanders had been arguing for years. But Makarov, stubborn as ever, would not be seen to change his mind or admit weakness in his overall scheme. He decided to simply change focus. By 773, his primary attention had been Irene's and Gore, with Sek as a profound but secondary threat, to be countered by his corps with generals. Now, he declared the Anarch had become the primary and immediate threat. Overruling objections, he tasked Lord Militant Eric with the continued prosecution of Archon Gore and the Irene's group, and removed himself and almost all of his principal commanders to the Corewood front to drive the attack on Sek himself. There was an implied, though unstated, feeling that Makarov believed his Corewood commanders had underperformed and thoroughly failed in their efforts to keep the Anarch suppressed. Makarov, underplaying how vital Erdesh was to his own operations, intended to use the Forge world as bait. He would lure the Anarch into open confrontation and destroy him there, in one blow, securing the lifelines of the Crusade and effectively reducing the enemy threat by 50%. But the Anarch, cunning to the very end, had a scheme of his own in mind, and his objectives, though as brutally direct as Makarov's, were far more mysterious, and would turn the war for Erdesh into the most crucial theatre of the Crusade since Balhut. Makarov had reckoned without two things, the manner of the archenemy's defence of Erdesh, and the magnitude of a new threat revealed by the very operations designed to effect the schism between Gore and Sek. Erdesh, 789-792 The resilience of Erdesh Forge World during the long and contested years of struggle against the sanguinary tribes is remarkable and a testament to the courage of that world's peoples and to the true spirit of mankind. It has been compared, oft times, to the fortitude of Cadia, and I believe that is not an overestimation. Lord Militant General Lugo, Erdesh, 794. The savage campaign to achieve control of Erdesh Forge World lasted four long years. Initial raids had begun prior to 789 and continued throughout the turn of the decade as harassing attacks turned into cover for infiltration and insurgent operations. Sad to relate, Many of the august institutions and dynastic claves fell prey to archenemy infiltration very swiftly. One may wonder how that happened, but it is important to remember Erdesh's long and complex history. Erdesh has stood between the imperial and Arcanate territories since its foundation, and its identity, intrinsically connected to the priesthood of Mars, has always placed it outside of typical imperial holdings. Down the troubled centuries since its founding, the world has been occupied at different times and for long periods by both the Imperium and the Arcanate culture. Further, Erdesh is home to many dynastic claves, lay tech orders that exist alongside the control of the Adeptus Mechanicus. These have regularly prospered and grown in power during periods when they were free from Imperial or Mechanicus supervision often, as now seems clear, promoted and supported by the Arcanate Heritors, or Tech Magi. Under Arcanate occupation, these dynastic claves were allowed the freedom to develop ingenious technologies, but the Adeptus Mechanicus controlled their activities far more strictly and relied less and less on the output of their machine shops. 
Many were reduced to very basic levels of industry, manufacturing such items as bayonets, buckles and weapon focus rings. And resentment was high, as Clave seniors felt their ingenuity and brilliance was clipped and constrained. Claves were always loyal to themselves before all other considerations. Since the earliest days of the dynasts, clave wars had been fought in all manner of ways, but open violence was the rarest form. Trade wars, espionage, assassination, these were the arsenals of the Erdeshi claves. Clave loyalty, survival, wealth and knowledge were the touchstones. It is shameful to relate that secretly, many felt their fortunes would be more prosperous under Arcanite rule. During interview, one clave ordinate, suspected of collaboration with the archenemy, declared, Our house has stood like many of the dynastic claves since the earliest times of settlement. We consider ourselves independent, an ally with those who f- will benefit us most. You know well that the mastery of Erdeshi lands has changed many times over the centuries. The throne, the Rimwood tribes, and back and forth. We have worked with and for the sanguinary brood as often as we have distant terror. Indeed, in some golden eras, past gores have favoured us more than the throne of the forge priests of Mars has ever done. By 790, the Anarch's pernicious hold on Erdeshi and its geothermically powered forge sites was considerable, and fierce wars had broken out between Imperial forces and Sekite invaders, who were bolstered by pro arcanite local strengths. As Makarov brought his main crusade strength to bear, leading the liberation in person and commanding an operation on the Corewood line for the first time since the start of his war mastery, his hands were tied. Battlefleet action could easily unseat the Anarch's host and eliminate him to boot, but that course would also result in the loss of principal forge assets that would render Erdesh worthless for Imperial purposes. Makarov could not sacrifice Erdesh simply to annihilate Sek. He was obliged to opt for surface war. Furthermore, and through until 791, Sek's tactics were impenetrable. There seemed to be little or no cohesion, with Sekite forces attacking at random, often ignoring viable or significant strategic targets in favour of random assaults. This pattern, or rather lack of logical pattern, gave rise to the theory that he had become deranged. Warfare was widespread in several major and simultaneous theatres across the planet, including a struggle to secure the Garapan heartlands, an imperial initiative led by the Beatty in person. Serious land war in the southern regions and in increasing focus on the great city of Eltath, where Makarov and High Command had made their station. In 791, at the very height of the fighting, insight came from an unexpected source. High Command was still dealing with the obvious challenge of overcoming the Anarch's military threat and struggling with its lack of understanding of his tactics. Makarov's focus was to draw Sek out. Erdesh was already strong bait for the Anarch, and it is not unreasonable to suggest that the Warmaster had brought the Beatty to Erdesh to present an even more inviting target for the archenemy warlord. However, experienced insight was able to show that the Anarch was following a very deliberate scheme of his own, and one which virtually matched Makarov's. Sek knew his own value as a target, and he knew how badly Makarov wished to see him destroyed. He had presented himself as bait, and disguised this bare and bold step with an apparently random and nonsensical scheme of attack designed to confound and confuse his enemy. The Anarch's strategy on Erdesh was a mirror of our own, to wit, the enticement, containment and elimination of the opposing leaders, the obliteration of the Warmaster and his high command. As remarked, this revelation came from an entirely unexpected source, from Ibram Gaunt. The Return of the Dead Gaunt's mission force had survived the warp translation and arrived at Erdesh at the height of the fighting. Such are the vagaries of the Immaterium. Gaunt and his regiment had experienced the passage of just a few months, but in adjusted time, they had been missing and listed as dead for the better part of a decade. Gaunt's return was celebrated and his posthumous election to the rank of Lord Militant honoured, allowing him to participate at high command level. This elevation afforded him access to restricted tactical data that allowed him the opportunity for insight, revealing the nature of the Anarch's intentions. Sek intended to draw in Makarov, the Beatty, and the majority of the Crusade's command staff, 
and decapitate the crusade by eliminating its high command. Already with the enemy assault on Altaf increasing in severity, the lords of crusade high command were pressing for a shift in approach, and a significant body of them, including many of the most senior, had come to believe that the crusade might now only continue under fresh blood. Formal proceedings began to have Makarov removed from office, according to protocol, and a replacement warmaster found. Gaunt, against his will, was drawn into this process, and his name was proposed as an ideal replacement, a suggestion backed by Kyburn, Van Voigts and others. Though Gaunt was technically junior in station, his war record spoke for itself. He had achieved considerable victories against the enemy, and played a significant role in dividing and weakening the Arcanite host. Further, because he had been absent for nearly ten years, he was untainted by the unworthy intrigue and factional squabbles that had riddled High Command since the inception of the Corwood assault. He was a man that almost all the Lord's militant, no matter where their loyalties lay, could back. Gorn's response to this was typically idiosyncratic and resolute. Along with Urians, he could see that the removal of their war master, no matter how unpopular he might be, would cause chaos and upheaval, a crisis that the enemy would capitalise on. At the heart of an active war, it was vital to maintain stability. It is also clear that Gaunt respected and appreciated Makarov's long-proven tactical ability, no matter how difficult and unpredictable Makarov might be to deal with in person. Acknowledging the strenuous objections made by the Lord's militant eager to have Makarov removed from office, most particularly their complaint that Makarov was withdrawn and reclusive and was no longer taking the counsel of his war chiefs, Gorn decided to side with Neva. He refused to co-sign the formal document of removal, a declaration of confidence, supported by the beleaguered sector Lord Governor of Kulan, the Masters of the Fleet and the High Lords of Terror. Nor did he align with those lords militant who opposed such a move. He went directly to the sequestered Warmaster and presented the facts to him, suggesting the Warmaster address the nature of his relationship with High Command. Makarov, impressed with the simple and bold nature of Gorn's actions, took heed. Though reluctant, he resumed a more visible role in the operation of command. This much-needed resumption of authority coincided with the Beatty's triumphant victory at Garapan, which was believed for a while to have resulted in the death of the Anarch. But the Anarch had gone to ground. Open military contests were not his aim. His operations on proud Erdesh had reached their clandestine culmination. Under cover of open war, he had placed insurgent cells and covert weapons, some of them woe machines, designed long before by the now dead Heritor Asphodel, within imperial positions including Elteth. The Anarch moved to finish his work and eliminate Makarov, the Saint and the High Command staff. But the timing of these measures was infinitely delicate, for he had a second objective, beyond the destruction of the Crusade's command structure. This timing also hinged on Gaunt's unexpected return from the dead. Gaunt had brought with him valuable artefacts recovered from the Salvation's Reach facility ten years before. Artefacts whose purpose was not yet identified by Imperial investigators, but which were evidently of great cultural or military significance. Gaunt had inadvertently delivered them directly to the target world, bringing them from the Archon's possession and into Sek's eager grasp. The Anarch Sek wished to eradicate his eternal enemies, but he also wished to recover those priceless relics intact. The Eagle Stones Mystery still surrounds the artifacts known as the Eagle Stones, also referred to by various sources as the Glyph Tothek. The objects were recovered from a college of heritance at the Arcanite, or Sekite, weapons research facility, Salvation's Reach by Gaunt's raid mission in 781, where they were being held for study by the Majer Heptica, or weapon rites, serving the Anarch's host. Roughly translated as a library in stone, the name Glyptothek refers to eight damaged stone tablets of ancient design, constructed from a type of heavy, gleaming red rock that metallurgical assays cannot identify. All of the tablets were chipped and one had a significant piece missing. They were covered with inscribed markings that defied translation. According to Gaunt's 
Sekite asset, Mabon. They were said to be Xenos items of significance, recovered from one of the Khan worlds some years earlier and considered very important. The asset reportedly believed that the Anar considered them a discovery of singular value. Undoubtedly Xenos, the Glyphdothek objects have been studied by Imperial scientists and Mechanicus Versen engineers who have suggested that they match artifacts and cultural relics of the Kinibrak, a species known to have existed in the Khan group until about 10,000 years ago, roughly the era of the Great Crusade. Xeno-archaeologists believe the Kinibrak persisted for a short while beyond that, into the Age of Heresy, but they no longer exist. Evidence indicates they became extinct during that period, possibly as a result of the Great Heresy. The Kinibrak species has been proposed as the original architects of the fortress worlds found in the Cabal Zone and the Khan worlds. Current thinking is they were not the original builders of those sites, though they may have occupied and used them. The purpose of the Eagle Stones has not been discovered. They may be of ritual or sacred significance, or a record of some data or chronicle, or may even be Xenotech devices, whose function, use and operation has yet to be established. It is also not understood why the Arch Enemy considered them to be so valuable, but it is quite apparent they were held in high esteem by the Arcanate, or at least Sekite parties. The Lord Executor In the opening months of 792M41, the 37th year of the Sabbat World's Crusade, Warmaster Makarov's prosecution of the Anarch Sek, focused on the contested forge world of Erdesh, reached a critical pass. The Imperial victory of Garapan, led by Saint Sabbat, had broken the Arch Enemy's main strength and also exposed the callow ruthlessness of his intended strategy to behead the Imperial High Command, even if it meant sacrificing the precious Forge World. Sek's decapitation strike at Altath had been repulsed, and many tacticians believed that a tide had turned. The Anarch was spent, and the Crusade force would deliver the Erdeshi Theatre in a matter of months, if not weeks. After that, the archenemy Archon Gore would be alone. At last, a credible endpoint to the Crusade seemed within reach. Made aware of his own shortcomings, or perhaps, as it is better phrased, his lack of sympathetic coordination with High Command, Warmaster Makarov had assumed a more high-profile role in the leadership of the Crusade effort. It is clear from many sources that while some question Makarov's intractable command style and his unwavering pursuit of some strategic decisions, a dogmatic quality that had come to be seen as bloody-minded, very few in the upper echelon faulted Makarov's overall tactical ability. His grasp of the whole Sabbath theatre was second to none, and he had often initiated long-term strategic ploys that bemused his officers, only to be vindicated when they bore fruit. The High Lords of Terror may consider themselves blessed to have their Sabbath World campaign squarely in the hands of one of the most naturally gifted commanders in Imperial history. As noted by Adraco, Selian, Vorseed and numerous others, Makarov was a tactician of genius, possessing greater strategic skills, if significantly less popularity, than his predecessor, the mighty and venerated Slado. Makarov's flaw had always been his dealings with personnel, most specifically the officers who depended upon him and upon whom his control relied. Makarov made a singular effort to be less withdrawn, to consult and to discuss, and to be more accessible. Further to this end, he restored an old office, that of Lord Executor, which had not been in common use for some time. The role of the Lord Executor was to be the Warmaster's right hand, his spokesman, his second, his interface. The Lord Executor was expected to triage the concerns of High Command, to communicate the wishes of the Warmaster to command level, and to enact or execute the Warmaster's will. The Lord Executor was also considered the Warmaster elect. For this role, Makarov chose Gaunt. It is reported that Gaunt was surprised by this promotion. It can be seen that the title was a reward for Gaunt's service and for his loyalty in the face of the effort to unseat the Warmaster. But it was also an astute and cunning move on Makarov's part, for Gaunt came without the baggage of years of high command rivalry and intrigue. He was both a strong and safe choice, acceptable to all. In his new role, 
Gaunt began working feverishly to consolidate the apparent victory on Erdesh and organise the pursuit and capture of the wounded Anarch, while also initiating the tactical and logistical efforts that would be required to support the Lord Militant Eric at the Irene's front and bring the whole force of the Crusade to bear against the Gore. But the war on Erdesh was not done, nor was the Anarch as disarmed as many supposed. There then began the bloodiest and most astonishing period of the campaign thus far, a sequence of events that many history texts have reported with the utmost credulity. Whatever the truth of it, it is no exaggeration to say that the fate of the entire sector hung in the balance, to be determined by just a handful of the Imperial Guard. The Anarch's cunning feint became apparent, Deploying infiltration units, he took advantage of what many saw as the Imperials' hour of victory on Erdesh, and launched a two-pronged assault on Alteth, under cover and confusion of widespread insurgency raids. His secondary target was the Adeptus Mechanicus facility, where the Glyptothek were being housed. He struck at that to recover the so-called Eagle Stones from Imperial hands. His primary and simultaneous target was the elimination of the Erdeshic Palace at Alteth which served as headquarters for Crusade High Command. His intention was to eliminate Makarov, the Beatty, and the entire command cadre in one fell swoop. To this end, he activated woe machines gifted to him years before by the Arcanate Heritors. The Woe Machines The destructive capabilities of the so-called woe machines, especially those constructed by the Heritor called Asphodel, were well known, and well documented by such military scholars as Tenguel and Gwelt. They had been a blight since the very earliest months of the Crusade, nearly four decades before. Most had taken the form of gross-scale war engines, and the range and idiosyncrasies of these lethal devices had been a constant horror. However, Imperial tech adepts had seriously underestimated the full variety and degree of sophistication. The war machines that struck at Altath were unlike any witnessed or recorded before. Though ultimately mechanical, they were hideously ingenious amalgams of machine and human organics, whereby the human components were used to mask or cloak the killing devices within. This degree of technical sophistication and applied scientific methods has required a fundamental reappraisal of the Arcanate technologies by Imperial science. It is estimated by many that, in this regard, the technological abilities of the Heritors exceed by some measure the upper limits of Imperial capacity. Some argue that these devices were rare aberrations, costly to manufacture and held back for very specific use. Others insist they were the rogue and demented works of Asphodel, now long dead, who was clearly an exceptional talent and thus cannot ever be replicated or repeated. What is clear is that the woe machines unleashed at the Erdeshik Palace employed, more than any other of their kind, the transmutational powers of the war, which was harnessed both as a weapon and a means of disguise, veiling the alloy of machines and human organic parts from detection. Battle reports suggest that at least one, if not both, of the two woe machines deployed was capable of rearranging reality around itself, altering the physical nature of its immediate locality by allowing the transformative energies of the Empyrean to bleed into our domain. The devices were almost unstoppable, and the death toll extensive. Lord Militant General Barthel von Voigts heroically laid down his life in an attack on one of the constructs, Perhaps inspired by the significance of his new role as Lord Executor, Gaunt played a key role in the elimination of both machines. He stood in support of the Beatty when she, at great personal cost, slew the first of them and assisted a senior agent of the Holy Ordos in the ultimate elimination of the second. During the hours of this atrocity, with high command on the verge of destruction, Gaunt's regiment, the Tanif First, was able to resist the infiltration efforts to recover the Glyptothek and deny the enemy troops sent to obtain them. We may see, once again, how Makarov's decisions are vindicated. He chose Gaunt to be his Lord Executor, and, in the most dire hour of need, Gaunt did not fail him. 
We may also see how Ibram Gaunt and his Tanith ghosts achieve the feats that have them now regarded, without question, as the true heroes and champions of the Sabbat Crusade. Their names and deeds will live forever in the honour citations of Erdesh Forgeworld. The Victory In order to best oversee his villainous acts at Elteth, the Anarch Sec had secluded himself at an offshore location within range of the main city. Makarov was, by diverse means, able to pinpoint this location, despite the fact that the Anarch's position had eluded all sensor and detection systems until that point. The site was annihilated from orbit. The official, or at least popular, record is that Sec perished there. Indeed, many commemorative paintings show this taking place, and it is repeated in many primers and public accounts published at the time. However, while a great and popular legend, it is inaccurate, as is the claim that Gaunt was present, a twisting of facts that was said to outrage him. The Anarch managed one last effort to evade his doom, escaping his bolt hole by means of some teleportational mechanism. The Anarch was, however, tracked. An official statement issued by the Munitorum in the days after the fight for Altath reads... Just before noon today, the Astra Militarum Intelligence Service confirmed a report received yesterday from an Aeronautica Imperialis patrol in the Southern Oceanic Zone. The report, which has been verified, declared that seven days ago, on an island called Orcadel, in the Farapan Archipelago, the archenemy Anarch, known as Sec, was apprehended and terminated by Imperial Guard troops. The destruction of Sec and his efforts on the field of Erdesh marked a turning point in the Crusade. The elimination of the Anarch and the relentless threat he posed was a triumph as significant as Balhut. The way now lay open for the War Master to recompose his crusading forces and unify them in the prosecution of the singular foe, Erlok Gur. The Next Objectives A dream long cherished, a recurring dream, one that has sat upon me within my mind since my earliest days, and one which I intend to give my life in fulfilment. It pains my heart to know that others must give their lives too, for this is a dream that cannot easily be made corporeal. But terror is with us, and duty informs our every human soul, and the God Emperor fortifies us with his light. It is a dream that will be born real unto the stars. Warmaster Slado, on the proposed liberation of the Sabbat Worlds, Kulan 764. Under the coordination of his Lord Executor, Makarov has made ready to move the main Crusade battle groups from the Erdesh zone to relieve Lord Militant Eric and begin mass assault of the Irene's line. The hated Gore has been driven to the brink, cornered at the barbarian Spinwood frontier. Makarov will hound him out and leave him for the carrion birds. This final phase must not be underestimated. Twice before, the crusade has been repelled at the Irene's line, and though he now stands alone, the gore is amply supplied with military forces. News comes to us of significant prosecutions against his strengths now underway at Kilgrave, Harkelon and Nostus. The signs of arch-enemy counter-strikes building at Loris and Carnival. These worlds most agree, will be the significant theatres of Makarov's endgame. We may only wonder what great feats and acts of courage may be witnessed on those far-off fields, and what inspired histories are yet to be set down, recording the final battles of our age. Trailward of that fierce front line, many other matters remain that must be dealt with, with all urgency. Many worlds across the inner systems are racked and reeling from the campaigns thus far and require vital support to rebuild infrastructures and to combat wretched famine and miserable disease left in the wake of the war. Furthermore, pockets of arch-enemy resistance persist. Tribal groups loyal to the Arcanate remain widespread, engaged in acts of resistance and insurgency on worlds as far to trailwards as Miriand and Lodius. Though the Anarch is dead and his forces shattered, fleeing remnants survive, 
Unable to rejoin Gore's host in the Irene's group, choose to burn out their lives by raiding and spreading terror. The recent uprising on Zadok shows us that the influence of the archenemy is like a splinter in our flesh, hard to dig out and be rid of. In this way, Makarov has shown insight. Though his main force drives across the Irene's line to subjugate and finally annihilate the foe, he has reserved many units and fleet groups for consolidation work, moving across the inner systems to provide support and, where necessary, suppression. Makarov's Sabbat victory will not be in name alone. He intends not merely to put the fire out, but to hunt down and grind down any embers or sparks so that evil may never reignite in the region. The Warmaster has codenamed his final offensive Operation Carnadon, and Departmento Tactica sources confirm his principal objectives are Harkolan and Nostus, along with the relief of Eric's battle group at Kilgrave. We may conjecture that the Warmaster means to draw the gore out, breaking his line of reinforcements through Nostos, and perhaps trapping him in an annihilating action at Harkolan or Loras. It is felt he favours Harkolan, for he, like his successor Slado, understands the significance of legacy. Harkolan was the world where St. Sabbath's original Great Crusade ended with her martyrdom after 105 years of conflict around 625M35. Harkolan is a holy world, sacred to our heritage, which Makarov has sworn to retake, and it would be just and fitting if the vile gore met his end there. A key concern among Imperial observers is the consequence of Anarch Sek's death. Although the loss of the Gore's chief lieutenant warlord and the dissipation of his host is a considerable weakening blow to the Arcanate, leaving as it does the Gore alone and the war reduced to one front, many fear the Gore's stubborn and aggressive mentality. It is simply unknown what military reserves he may be able to draw from the sanguinary tribal regions or how other tribal and cult factions may respond to the turn of the tide. Sek's death is a crippling blow to the Arcanate. The obvious sequel to that is the destruction of the Gore and thus the toppling of the Arcanate entire. Tribal factions that have been so far unwilling to side with Gore because of their rivalry with Sek's Shadametakian loyalties may now feel empowered to join with the Gore's ranks. Other tribal groupings with historical enmity towards the Gore Eight clans may put aside their old differences and stand with the Gore, simply to maintain the integrity of the Arcanate. Imperial Xeno Savants express particular fears of the Harrow Kin, Hagmata and Duradata in the former regard, and the Weish and Lepida Bale in the latter. The Arcanate has been grievously weakened by the Erdesh victory, but like a wounded animal, it may react with unexpected and frenzied venom in an effort to preserve itself now that it is cornered. Aquilus, an operation conducted as part of the consolidation efforts, seeks to identify and target these potential sub-targets before they can swing their support to the Archon's cause. Weishist sympathizers have been suppressed and annihilated in the Khan group, and Hagmata insurgents driven from their strongholds on two cabal systems. Three further Sabatine tribal unions, the Sharath, the Lankramata and the Ainting, have pledged allegiance to the Imperial cause after decades of neutrality and have joined the primary front groups as troop auxiliaries. The petition of a fourth, the Haltine Locus, are being considered subject to investigation by the Holy Ordos. Though the Haltine, a subclan quite common to the Corwood portions of the Sabbat worlds, have never taken up arms during the Crusade or indeed at any recorded point before that, they are known to hold certain belief systems in common with Bashribi and Weish tribe structures and may yet be ruled heretically. In addition to the far spinward rim of the region, at Zoa, rumours spread of a militarised build-up by the Arnos Chasmata, though commentators believe this is an effort by the tribal group to defend its ancestral territory against retreating Gorite forces rather than to contest imperial pacification. At this time, Crusade Aquilus divisions are waging anti-insurgency campaigns on nine inner worlds, including Zamir, Armadrona, and Moorland. It is clear that, between ferocious open war at the front line and insurgency actions within the home systems, the great populace of the Sabbat worlds faces still more years of privation and bloodshed before peace can prevail. But the finality 
is upon us, and the end game of the Sabbath World's Crusade has assuredly begun. We must trust in the providence of the God Emperor and the fortitude of the War Master, his Lord's Militant, and his Lord Executor Gaunt, champion of our great Erdesh, to deliver us. The Emperor protects. In the name of terror, let us remain resolute to the last, and let the Sabbath worlds be freed.